It's Sunday here, day two for the 2023 Champions Chess Tour finale. Beautiful Toronto, Canada, the lovely CN Tower. She welcomes all, she welcomes everyone to this amazing city north of the border if you're in the States, a capital of chess in Canada in many ways. It's day two and it's coming at you right now. You've heard the sayings, the road less traveled, rubber meets the road, I'm on the road to nowhere. That need to get up and go, to just shut up and drive to parts of unknown. It's in our DNA. But this road has an end. And the beginning, well, let's throw that in reverse. It's over. We have a winner, Magnus Carlsen. What has this kid got in store? He might be Checkmate. There's been curves, hills, corners, and even a breakdown or two. The game is over. That's a wrap. We see a reaction. Magnus oh! mouse oh! Magnus mouse slipped. Oh my gosh. Off. Look at Jordan's face. Some have pulled over, but some. Oh, oh what? What? what is he doing? Slammed that foot to the floor and just kept going. Any second? Nikai Nakamura is the winner. Not a bag of the central. Maxim Vajilagram, the Frenchman. He wins the AI Cup. After six stops along the way, it's time for the greatest proving ground in online chess to drop that final pin in the GPS. Destination, Toronto, Canada. Eight players from all four corners of the globe descend on the Queen City with one goal to prove who the one true king of online chess really is. I think this is the strongest final there's ever been. I know that it will not be easy. It's nice to play in the top tournament. Magnus will want revenge. It's my last tournament of the year. I'm a bit desperate to end it well. It's having the opportunity to play against the best players in the world. It's always a challenge and I enjoy it. It's going to be a very close fight. It's going to be very exciting. Live from Toronto, Canada, this is the 2023 Champions Chess Tour Finals and it starts now. I don't think there is a cooler voice to help open a chess show than Wood Harris. No cooler pictures I think we've ever had of the world's top players than that hype video. And no cooler place to be alongside James Candy. It is Danny Wrench here. We are in the playing hall in Toronto. We're getting set for day two. But Canty, before we focus on today, biggest takeaway you had from day one. Yeah, Hikaru being my guy. You know, I just like love Hikaru. That's my guy. Everybody loves Hikaru, right? So he lost yesterday, man, on his yeah. birthday, Danny. Oh, my birthday, man. <laughs> Dude, 0-2 is not how you want to spend your birthday. I think some players struggle on their birthday, but yeah, we're yeah. all hoping Hikaru can turn it around, although he does he does have two very tough matchups. So, all right, we're here in Toronto, but as you know, we have a third member with us every single day. She is Kaya, and she is ready to take it away. Yep, Danny, and I have to tell you, my heart is just warm from day one in the CCT finals. The players were so good to me, to the fans. They stopped for interviews, even after losses, even before Arma get on drama, they would come for an interview to share their thoughts with the fans, to share their genius minds, their feelings, and I'm hoping for more of that today. The only player that I didn't get to talk to, that I really wanted to talk to yesterday, was Hikaru Nakamura, you mentioned it, on his birthday, Lucy two matches so my biggest hope today is that we get to talk to Hikaru Nakamura but first you guys let's go back to day one in the CCT finals the champions chess tour finals are off to a blistering start with brilliancies upsets and of course Armageddon in the first round of the round robin Magnus Carlsen took down Denis Lazovic Ali Reza Feruja defeated Noderbek Abdusitarov and Fabiano Caruana scored a win against Maxime Bashielagrav which required Armageddon in the Armageddon game, Fabiano showed incredible attacking chess with the black pieces, winning with three brilliancies. And uh, here we go, the black pawns are just marching two pawns up still. And uh, if he can remove white's remaining pawns on the king side, even at the cost of his material advantage, that guarantees the draw and Maxim Vashlegrav actually resigns. Wow! The most shocking result of the day came from Wesley So and birthday boy Hikaru Nakamura. Wesley secured an impressive win in the first game with the black pieces. At the end, he had a bishop against Hikaru's rook, but also a passed pawn that was unstoppable. He's oh, going for more. He's wow. going for more in this position. He's threatening mate again, checkmate, but Wesley just gets his king out. And Black's winning. 
Hikaru. He gambled, he bluffed, and the bluff was called. Wesley's pawn is simply going to march down the board. Oh Check. There's no meat. The bishop slides back, and you see Hikaru resign. Wesley so. The magic continues in Toronto. In the second game of the match, Wesley had yet another winning position, but agreed to a draw to safely win the round. The excitement continued in round two, with three of the four matches going to Armageddon. In fact, in the Armageddon game between Hikaru and MDL, they bid the exact same time. That's Hikaru submitting his bid, and he bursts out laughing as they realize that they submitted the exact same bid. Have we ever seen anything like this in the chess world? MDL ended up winning that game with the white pieces to win the match. Carlson also won his Armageddon game against Abdus Satorov, and Caruana repeated moves to draw with Black in his Armageddon game against Faruja. Wesley So was the only player to not require any Armageddon games to win his matches, and as a result, he has the sole lead of the round robin stage going into day two. You know, Robert said the magic continues for So here in Toronto. He is the chess.com global champion, the defending and he sits there atop the standings. I agree with Robert. Something about Toronto seems to suit Wesley so well. If it ended right now, Magnus and Wesley would get immediate buys into the semifinals, and those middle six players would still be here. Hikaru and Dennis would be going home. How will things look at the end of day two? We're gonna we're gonna find that out as we get set for the matchups. But uh, yeah, you've uh, you've got a lot of people already feeling the nerves, Canty. Karwana mm -hmm. Carlson, Vashe the Graf So, Lazovic Abdusaturov, and Faruja Nakamura. The matchup that sticks out to you real quick before we start pre on one by one. Yeah, I mean, it's always Karwana Carlson. I mean, that one yeah. right there, of course, since the 2018 World Championship, 12 draws going to a rapid game. I mean, it was crazy there. Fabi was right with him in the classical, but in the rapid, he is having some trouble, but he wants to try to make up for that today. It will be interesting to see what happens with Caruana Carlson, of course. But before we start previewing that, we're going to start with the guy that, as we said, just seems to love Toronto. It feels Ooh. magical to Wesley to be here. We know from talking to him that he loves the hotel, he loves the vibe, he loves the city, and it is reflected with chess, whether it's on a computer or over the board. He may not have known that it was over the board if you <laughs> paid attention to what we talked about yesterday, but it doesn't seem to make a difference. Will his hot streaks continue? As we look at Wesley, one of the most interesting things about him is that throughout the entire tour, this is not just from day one, throughout the entire tour, Wesley So played the most accurate brand of chess of anyone in the entire championship field. Canty, your thoughts on that? That's ridiculous. I mean, that's like point twenty, the point a little bit more. What is that? 21 more, 24 more than, than Magnus? Like, you playing better than Magnus? I mean, when do you ever say that? He's like, no, I'm not playing better than Magnus. I'm just trying to play. I just like playing chess and having a good time. But he's playing better than Magnus, Danny. We're doing fair play, right? Because he we're, like... We're doing fair play on Wesley. We're doing fair play on him. We're doing fair play on everyone. It doesn't matter whether you're in a facility with what I think is the tightest fair play restrictions in the world. Players have even been kind of ruffled by what we've been been doing here. It doesn't yeah. matter what you're doing to Wesley. The dude just plays an accurate, mistake-free brand of chess. And continuing to talk about Wesley, so right now we're going to throw it over to Kaya because she has more. Wesley is so, he is uh, so kind, such a good guy. I did sit down with all the players before the tournament started and I got a chance to ask everyone their thoughts on Wesley So. And uh, what's your thoughts on uh, Wesley So? Hyper solid player, <laughs> you know. A very solid player. Wesley is solid. <laughs> I think that if he had more uh, maybe self confidence or belief in himself, then he could have even achieved more than he did. But what he achieved in his career so far has already been quite enormous. And I've always found him one of the most difficult players to get even an advantage against. If he can regain some of the form that he had last year and the global championship here in Toronto, then. Then he has a chance. Wesley is a formidable opponent, very rarely loses, always ready to pounce uh, when you make a mistake, but otherwise it's also very difficult to beat him, so that's a, a great combo. And when he feels the blood, he's, uh, he's always there. Normally I would say that uh, the match format is very well suited to, to his style, but it feels that he's been it's been considerably less solid maybe the last year and a half. Doesn't really look for <laughs> winning sometimes, but he really hates losing, so it's really difficult to beat him. He's a very good person, his character is really good, so um, I have a lot of respect. 
so good to hear just the massive respect all the other top players have for Wesley. So, so solid, almost unbeatable. So the question today, Danny, can anyone beat Wesley So? It's not going to be easy, but MBL, Maxime Vachet Grob would like to answer that question with a yes. People are going to beat Wesley So, although you see not as many draws historically as Hikaru Nakamura has against Wesley So, but Canty, 30 draws is still a lot. I'm still, I'm getting bored. Like, hey, man, I'm tired of playing you. Maybe that's just a strategy from Wesley. Play very solid, and you get annoyed, and then you just crack under the pressure somewhere trying to make something happen. You heard the words from the players, words like solid, words like difficult, <laughs> words like doesn't beat himself. We know it, <laughs> but MBL, one of the hottest players on the planet. Let's remember, he beat Magnus twice to get here. He, he is streaky by nature, though. Absolutely. So I think even more than Wesley wanting to be slowed down if you're the rest of the field, MVL needs to right his ship right now. Right, of course. I mean, as tactical as he is, but he is very predictable, too, as well. as you can, able, We can prepare for his Grunfels, the Night Orbs. We know this, as uh, Fabi was able to do that in the candidates. Took a whole year to prep. Still played Night Orb. Lost with this crazy peace sack. We just know what you're going to play usually. So maybe he might have to make some changes, but then again, he's not playing to his style, so we'll yeah. see. Well, let's remember, he he already has won one match. He beat Hikaru Nakamura in Armageddon, so he's not in the bottom rungs. Maybe he finds the right mindset against Wesley So, but either way, it's going to be Eka, epic. Yeah. My first my first live slip up there. Let's bring up what we also have to take a look forward to the next matchup that we're going to preview. We start by seeing the next matchup. The two players in it, Magnus Carlsen and Fabiano Caruana, are right at the top. The odds makers had Magnus at 50% before the event, now at 51%. What's funny is, as crazy as that seems, Canty, when we talked to a lot of the players before the event, a lot of them said that that might have actually been too low for Magnus. Yeah, that was actually scary to say. I'm like, you know you guys are really good too, right? You guys are forgetting how good you guys actually are. But it says a lot to the testimony of how strong Magnus really is, especially in these rabbit formats. And maybe what you said there, maybe it also says a lot to how much the players Respect fear him. Right? Fear. I mean, Magnus, <laughs> Magnus has uh, dominated his generation, and that can pay off. But, of course, Fabiano Caruana, the second highest yeah. predicted player to make it to the final and perhaps win it all. We know that Fabi played incredibly well yesterday Yesterday, but a different type of, of well, I guess you could say. Magnus was dominant in his games against the two youngest players. Fabi had to go to Armageddon twice, but he won twice with Black, can't he? Oh, I think he's, his confidence is through the roof. Winning with Black like that, too, as well. Now I get, you know, white pieces here. It's a new day. It's fresh. I'm at the top of the leaderboard. I'm feeling good. Now I just want to make things a little bit easier for me today, if I can. His pedigree also is a, a strong one. He won the Air Things Division Two. Division Two is almost as hard to win in this tour as Division One. He's a Grand Chess Tour winner, won the Singfield Cup and the Rapid and Blitz this year, among many other things. But how will he play today against Magnus, who no one will ever let him forget that he lost a world championship <laughs> title in, in rapid. rapid time control. He never yeah. lost a classical chess game to Magnus Carlsen. Don't forget that from 2018. But he lost in Rapid. Is that in his mind today? Honestly, it's, it's hard to get out of that, of course, because you are playing Magnus, you know, World Championship Rapid, but you just kind of have to do it. You know, you just got to really, you know, do it. Hey, I have to get out of my own head here and yep. say, hey, look, it's Rapid. It's a new day. It's only two games. So we see what happens, especially if I can get a good start, use my white correctly, maybe draw with black. I can win this match. It's only two games here in day two, but he played a lot of games this year in the Champions Chess Tour to get here. And earlier this week, actually, Kaya caught up with him, and here's her thoughts on that interview. We are in Toronto for the CCT Finals here with Fabiano Caruana on fire these days. And you had a great run in the CCT 2023 as well. How will you describe your journey through the season, Fabi? Uh, I was really motivated from the beginning, so I played all the events. I think I was one of the few players to play all the qualifying events. And it was a bit up and down for me, some disappointments, but overall, a lot of really close ones. I think they were all close. I don't know if there were any, um, any uh, you know, washovers one way or the other. And, and some disappointing ones because uh, when you lose and it's really close, that also is, is a bit uh, painful. Now we are here with the top eight players in Toronto. What makes you excited about being here now? Oh, I'm excited for the format. It's going to be really, um, I think, unusual. I don't think I've played in a format like this. And also, I think it's going to be a very close fight. Yeah, it's going to be very exciting. What are the fans in for this week? It's, it's going to be exciting, that's all I can say. Um, they're gonna, there will be a lot of tough fights and I hope that I'll be able to um, to keep the form that I've I've been having recently. But uh, I'm yeah I'm a bit nervous. It's going to be really tough and also exciting. Can we get you to describe your playing style? I don't know if I'm the right person to do that. I think probably someone else would be better. I was sort of known at some point for my calculation, 
Um, so I, I've uh, generally been good at very good at calculating, like because I, I'm I'm sort of a perfectionist in some way that I, I always want to to calculate to the end. And sometimes after that, my um, I used, I veer away from my initial assumption about the position, which was more correct. So I've noticed that at times that uh, my instinct is actually better than what I achieve after I start to calculate things. What would it mean to you, Fabi, to win the Champions Chess Tour 2023? Yeah, actually, I, that, that would be amazing. I mean, it would really crown off the year for me. Yeah, for me, this is like a, a rapid and blitz world championship. I know that we'll, we'll have that later this month as well, but uh, this has really all the all the best players, or nearly all the best players in the world, including Magnus and Hikaru and yeah, Maxime and Ali Reza. And so it's it's such a high level event that winning it is, is such a prestige. Awesome. Well, we hope you have a great time in Toronto. Best of luck, Fabi. Thank you. I thought it was super self-reflective the way Fabi broke down his style, talked about historically really yeah. relying on his calculation, calculation yeah. his perfectionist mentality to see yeah. it to the end. Right. Now even talking about the fact that he wants to trust his intuition more. Maybe his intuition is better than he thought right away. Yeah. And I'm talking about him as he's behind me because I've been giving him that advice for a long time. Just kidding, Fabi. Remember yeah, how you were going to make me your second and then you didn't? <laughs> Never mind. Okay. Crickets. <coughs> All right. Excuse crickets. Me. All right. <coughs> oh, There's yeah. Fabi. All right. The players are starting to fill in. We still got two more matchups to preview, though, so we're going to roll right into the next one we haven't taken a look at yet. That is Ferruja versus Nakamura. Here we have a couple of guys who played each other a lot online. I think fans are really used to some epic, epic throwdowns. They both had four D1 appearances this year. Kenny, your thoughts on what speaks to you in this Man, matchup? This is very nice. Versatility in both. Of course, they can always mix up openings. I mean, looking to strike back is Hikaru here. Feruza trying to, you know, uh, get it more of a lead, win another match here. So that's going to be a clash of Titans, as we always see, as we see in the Blitz and the Bullet that they play online. Yep. Now we have the OTB here. So it is going to be one for the year. Well, I can't wait to see what Feruza is thinking after his day one. Played really well, even though he's only one and one. Kaya caught up with him just a minute ago before day two begins. I'm here with Ali Reza Ferruja, ready for day two, day one ending. I know, with an Armageddon loss, but overall, how would you sum up the start to the finals? Yeah, I think I'm playing decent chess. The second game against Fabiano was a bit unfortunate, but I'm happy with my play, but the result should improve, of course. And I bet ready and eager to bounce back then today after losing that last match yesterday. Yeah, of course. Uh, I think it's a very important match today. Hikaru also lost too, so... Um, there is more pressure on him than me, so but it's a uh, everybody is trying to play their best. So. And you and Icar are both known as speed demons. So what can we expect from the match with the two of you? Yeah, I think it will be a very interesting match. Um, always we, when we play, a lot of people like to watch it. So it's uh, cool, always cool to play Icaro, and uh, it's very exciting always. Definitely. And finally, beautiful outfit today. I have to say, what was the plan behind your outfit today, Ali Reza? I wanted to mix it up. <laughs> I didn't care so much how it will look. I just wanted to mix it up, everything. So let's see how it will go. Looking very good. Looking very good. Looking confident. So best of luck today, Ali Reza. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. He's looking good today, Ali Reza. Ruja, back to you guys. He is looking good today. There he is in the yellow shirt. Mixing up the style. I get him. You know, it's funny. In, Magnus said, Magnus even mentioned Ali Reza in his post-game interview that despite losing that Armageddon battle to Fabi, he felt like Ali Reza might have played some of the best chess in day one. So we'll see if he can continue that. With the, He's all smiles right now. Get looking it. good in that shirt, yeah, right? Yeah, if you look good, you feel good. Hey, you feel you know, good, maybe yeah, you play good. You know what I'm saying? Maybe feeling good, you're going to play good. Right? You got the drip right, drip master, Gucci Reza, whatever you want to call him. Of course, the man is fly today, and he's going to try to do the same thing on the board today. All right, we got one more matchup to get set before our predictions. Let's remember the two youngest players in the field are battling it out. And even though these faces will continue to get to be more known by fans for the next many years to come, they want to get the fans' attention today because if they beat each other, that might be their best chance to maybe stay out of the bottom rungs. Who wins this matchup might still be here in a few days, can't he? Absolutely, 100%. I mean, uh, Lazovic has a lot to prove here, being uh, the youngest here, in fact. But Abdul Satorov being the uh, youngest World Rap Champion right ever, you know, so he's like, I mean, you know, hey, I'm going to do my thing here on paper, that is. But Lazovic is going to try to change that today. There's Dennis Lazovic as he was waiting in our player refreshment area. We keep that thing pretty secure. Stacks. And uh, that's right before they step into the fair play room here comes magnus to get his fair play check on people uh people tend to love love seeing that and getting that going but all right <laughs> we've uh we've now talked about all four of the matchups that are getting set to go down here in day two let's remind everybody of what the format will be throughout the entire week here in toronto 
the Champions Chess Tour Finals are here. Eight players who have earned their spot will face off in an epic battle to determine who will be this year's Champion of Champions. Up for grabs will be $500,000 in prizes, with first place taking home $200,000 for the victory. The action opens with an eight-player round robin. The top two finishers advance directly to the semifinals, while the bottom two are eliminated. The remaining four players will do battle in a double elimination survival bracket. Again, the top two players advance, while the bottom two players will be eliminated. The final four champions are headed to a single elimination bracket. The winner will be crowned our Champion of Champions. Boy, I'm excited to see this play out all week. It's time for us to make our predictions for just today, though. I'm throwing to you, Canty, first. We're starting with Abdusaturov Lazovic. Who you got? Got to go to Abdusaturov there. Okay. Uh, World Rapid Champion. I'll agree with you, Abdusaturov. Yeah, I'm also going to go with Nordy. I think this could be close, but I'm going with Nordy. All right, let's move. Oh, sorry, we're doing So MBL next. I'm sorry about that. We're doing Wesley So, Maxime Vacher, the Graf. Your thoughts? <laughs> Wesley So, like MVO. I pick So in that one. Okay. Yeah, Wesley So. Okay. I'll disagree. I'll say MVL. MBL. I still think his state of mind. Just something big will happen there. I also think that uh, MVL is gonna is gonna find the form here, and we're gonna get a very very packed and close standings as this one plays out. Now we're moving on to Carwana Carlson. Your thoughts in that one? Uh, slight favor to Fabi. Fabi. Yeah. Fabi. I had a feeling you would say that, and I just want to disagree. I'll say Carlson. It's funny, because I'm also going with Fabi, even though they got here in very different ways. I think this is going to be a really close one. 2018 World Championship rematch. Can't wait. All right, last one. Nakamura and Faruja. Got to go with Nakamura. I mean, you know, bounce back from yesterday. Yeah, I don't see him losing three in a row. Nakamura. I, I tend to agree. I think it's hard to see Hikaru losing three in a row, so I'm also going with him. All right. We've given you our predictions for the four games that are about to go down. Give us your predictions in chat. Let us know what you think. How crazy are we or are we right on? Before we throw it across the pond, I want to remind everybody that you do have one last chance. I think there are very, very few tickets available still to join us in the fan zone. Saturday is sold out. Completely sold out. You missed it. Wow. You got to risk it to get that biscuit. Biscuits. You missed your chance. But there may be a few tickets left for Friday. So head over to the Champions Chess Tour website and get them to hang out with the chess bras. I'll be there. Levy will be there. Probably some of the players. So make sure you check it out. And on that note, it is time for the games to begin. We throw this thing across the pond. The big pond over to Tanya and the boys bringing you the hits since the 1980s. Tanya, take it away. <laughs> Hey, Donnie, James, Gaia, you guys are ready. The players are ready, and we are ready in the studio for the action to begin. David, Robert, day two, about to get underway. Give me one name, one player you've got your eyes on today. Wesley So, he's at the top, and I think he might stay there. Oh, Wesley So, he finds himself uh, at that pole position currently, along with Fabi and Magnus. But Wesley, today he's playing against Maxime vachier Legrave. That's not going to be an easy one for Wesley. No, it's never easy when you're playing Maxime vachier Legrave. But uh, Wesley's in great form. We saw his accuracy, and he can bring it. Oh, for Wesley So, it is so much about ambition and confidence. And the others can't be too happy with the performance he had on day one. And the chess is underway. We see the handshakes between the 2018 World Championship players there. Magnus Carlsen about to make his first move against Fabiano Caruana, currently ranked world number one and number two. And he starts with knight to f3. Are we going to see a ratty? I thought I saw a knight f3 there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we saw a knight come out as well. It looks like uh, this is actually a board from another game. This is the board between uh, Wesley Sir and Maxime. Shocking, Bashley. right? We see a Grunfeld. It must be Maxime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not Fabi here. We don't see his hands moving. He's not making the moves. But uh, yeah, KG start there. It looked like neither player ready to start the clock. Neither yeah. player uh, in a rhythm. Magnus makes a move and Fabi took a while to respond. And I'm just wondering, we saw our uh, gang in Toronto make some predictions. Do you think Fabi and Magnus had their uh, ears on what was going on there? That was definitely awkward because <laughs> you could hear them being like, Fabi, Magnus. They wanted to lower their volume because they didn't want the people to be upset with them. And uh, 
Fabi and Magnus, they're professionals. They've been going at it for a long time, specifically against one another. The 2018 World Chess Championship came down to Rapid. They drew all their classical games, and then in the Rapid, that was where Magnus was able to separate himself for a second World Championship in a row. Uh, this is not their board. Uh, we will switch to the uh, Magnus and Fabiano game uh, as soon as we can. Uh, but this looks like the Wesley So versus Maxime Vachel Legrand board. And there we got the players. It was definitely one a night F3. Uh, Bought these players with back-to-back victories on day one and Fabi almost did topple Magnus in the world number one rankings back in 2018 he was just two points behind him what do you think is Fabi's match strategy coming in today well I think it uh, appears at least that he's trying to be solid with black he will try and strike with white Fabi's so well prepared um, he's known for his openings he showed us that yesterday he's been showing us for years now already but uh, yeah, I think as long as he can survive the openings, he will believe uh, Queen B4 is a mouse slip. Uh, <laughs> they're playing over the board, of course. It's a, an error there. He did play Queen takes pawn on C4, of course. Um, but yeah, if Fabi can survive the opening, uh, I think he'll gain in confidence. He's a very brand new Fabi, of course. Uh, his rapid skills have just grown exponentially over the last uh, few months. It's been amazing to watch uh, how Fabi's uh, speed chess has transformed uh, this year. And he has been on fire. Now, back in 2018, it did go into tie breaks. What are the chances of this match going into an Armageddon? Well, I think the fans want me to say 100%. <laughs> they want to see Armageddon. It is very fun. But truthfully, little separates these two. We've seen that uh, in some of their head-to-head -head clashes. I think David makes a good point that it's not just classical, but also rapid and blitz where Fabi has improved. I would say that Magnus, whoever he plays, whenever he plays them, is the favorite. But Fabi, he's bringing it. And in 2018, Magnus was so confident to take it into the rapid playoff. Uh, he just wanted uh, nothing of that final game. But I think now he just cannot feel that same confidence in speed chess against Fabi with the way Fabi has improved. And we see that it is Fabiano Caruana who goes into the first think of the position. This reminds me of Catalan structures. It started from a Catalan, I and mean, it's very familiar to both these players. And David, you know Magnus very well. He loves the white side of a Catalan, but how do you think he's feeling about how this game has developed? I think Magnus is feeling confident. Uh, the Catalan, uh, as a mark of respect, was his World Championship opening uh, in 2021. He's now using it against Fabiano. Clearly, this is uh, home cooking here. Um, I'm not sure if Magnus has played this exact move order before. He's got so many kind of one-off ideas within these openings. Something that to test Black, to force Black to be accurate. And he's essentially saying to Fabiano, I know everything here. Look at the clock times. He's barely paused Magnus. And it's definitely Fabi who's uh, on his own. It is uh, Fabi on the think right now. And I was just about to say that in these positions, it's all about Black getting this break in, the central break to get more space, to get out of that weakness, the weak pawn on C7. Usually, when Black achieves this break, it feels like you've neutralized White's advantage. Is that fair to say here? It's funny because I was going to say the same thing, but then I thought, this is Magnus Carlsen we're talking about. Level, position, equality, those are defined by who you're playing in some ways. So for a five and a Caruana, he knows that he's escaped the opening with a good position, but how quickly Magnus is playing, I think he smells that he can actually get the upper hand. The evaluation bar says, well, oh, Fabi's doing everything perfectly, and that is true, but maybe there's going to be a mistake down the line, and some players, uh, they'd like to force their opponent to get into this territory where it's uh, playing for two results. Magnus, he can't really lose this game, but maybe he can win. Yeah, this feels like an optical illusion as commentators because if you just showed me the board, I would say dead level, no chance White's going to be better. Suddenly I look across and I see the cameras. I know it's Magnus Carlsen. I see his clock time. He's barely uh, spent any time at all. And I'm starting to think, OK, White must have an advantage somewhere. But why? It must simply be because Black's pawns on the queen side are slightly vulnerable. Um, I mean, other than that, I'm struggling to see any real imbalances, any reason for Fabiano to sweat here. Uh, it must be very concrete, but surely with a couple of accurate moves, he has plenty of time. He will find uh, a way to equalize this game. And uh, if White is unable to create any pressure in the next two or three moves, this one's going to fizzle out very, very quickly. It feels like Magnus not taking too much risk here. Maybe hinting that he'd be OK with a solid draw and... Uh, hopefully guiding it towards Armageddon, where he would bank himself as a favorite. Well, I'm already, already wondering what Fabi is so deep in the think tank about, because my first instinct goes, my pawn on b5 is under attack. 
I should take the pawn that's attacking me. But I'm getting the feeling that it's going to be about a fight for some of these open files. Let's say black does take that pawn on a4, white takes back with the knight. You'd be well advised to move your bishop because you don't want to give up that piece for a knight. So let's say you go back to a7, keeping on this diagonal. Maybe white will just bring rook to c1 rather than d1. And I don't know, this kind of position where the a6 pawn feels a little bit tender as the a1 rook stares there. And that's why Fabi, he, instead of capturing on a4, he brings his knight back. I think that's the wiser play. Yeah, very clever move here. He's putting some pressure on this knight. And uh, if he trades off this knight, then the b5 pawn feels much safer. Also hinting that he might nab the bishop pair uh, if given the opportunity. I really don't see where white's advantage lies, but Magnus continues to blitz, continues to play at breakneck speed, trading off. I don't understand. I'm mystified. I've got to say black looks totally solid no matter which way you take back in the center with your knight bishop. Where can the problems lie? I don't see anything at all here for Magnus Carlsen. Nothing. It looks really solid for Black. So maybe Magnus is saying, I respect my opponent so much that I'm going to play an opening without risk. Fabiano is handling this perfectly thus far. Yeah, it looks like maybe after pawn takes pawn, Magnus will try and leap his knight into the center. Uh, in the Catalan structure, a d3 square is a fantastic post for a knight. But at this level, this should be relatively safe. Fabiano, opening success for him. Definitely surprising uh, how easily Fabi with the black pieces has managed to neutralize. I was expecting more ambitious play from Magnus uh, starting. It's, it's a mini match of just two games. They've got one white. And then if uh, Fabi does secure the draw in this one, he might be the one getting ambitious in a second game with the white pieces. Well, one player who needs to get ambitious right now is Hikaru Nakamura. There were no birthday gifts for the five-time US champion. Speed chess beast Hikaru starts uh, his day. He's on 0-2. He's playing against Ali Reza. Later on, he plays against Magnus Carlsen. And this is such a critical game for Hikaru. If things were to not go his way, that means a third loss in a row. That would really jeopardize his chances to actually go through to the semifinals. What are you expecting? How does Hikaru make the switch up from the start that he had on day one? Well, it can't really get worse from day one because he lost both of his matches. He mis made a mistake against Maxim Vashelagrov in a position where the computer said he was even. I think Hikaru knew that he was playing quite well. And the problem for Hikaru, they don't stop just because day one ended. You're playing Ali Reza Faruja. We saw the ferocious form that he was in on the first day where he was sacrificing pieces against Fabiano Caruana. The match ultimately was a win for Fabiano. It was really an epic comeback from him. But Faruja showed that he's ready to fight. Stylish Ali Reza with some stylish play on day one. And he did say earlier today that he's looking to mix it up against uh, Hikaru. Hikaru is speed chess beast. Currently wounded, but a wounded beast can be even more dangerous. What do we make of the opening outcome that we have right now, uh, David, on the board? Has Ali Reza managed to mix it up? Well, it feels like uh, actually Hikaru just wants a solid, stable start here. He just wants to play himself into form, perhaps. Uh, Ali Reza looks solid as black. White hasn't done too much, uh, kind of anything special, at least in the opening stages. White will shortly castle his king. It looks symmetrical other than the fact that white has a set of double pawns on the D file. Uh, that gives more central control, however, and gives a semi-open file on the C-file for the white rook. Um, so I've got to admit, I slightly prefer white's chances. Um, black is solid, but a bit passive right now. And Nakamura does have the luxury of time. He plays a quiet move like a pawn to A3 just on this last turn. He's basically saying to Faruja, you break out. I'm going to slowly, slowly improve my pieces, maybe creep forward later on. What are you doing in the meantime? Well, one way to break out for Ali Reza, if he really is in for an absolute brawl, is pushing the pawn in front of his king two squares. Now, considering his last move was sliding his bishop back, I don't think he'll go for this choice. But there are positions where even though we're told don't push pawns in front of your king, you can get away with it because white doesn't have the makings of an attack. So I do think that Hikaru has opted for a solid setup because because of his first day of action. I'm with you, David. I like his position with the semi-open C file. He's got those pawns in the center. That mass is just controlling so many key squares. But for Ali Reza, he's also done nothing wrong, so he should feel quite confident himself. Yeah, I think Nakamura probably watched that game against uh, Caruana yesterday where Faruja unleashed fire on the board. And he's saying, OK, I want none of that. Faruja is not going to attack me in this one. It's just going to be a solid, slow positional fight. And OK, he's found another way, uh, Faruja, uh, of dealing with his slightly cramped position. He's trying to trade off pieces, often good classical chess wisdom. If you're lacking space, if you're lacking squares, trade off and uh, your remaining pieces will feel much freer, more scope for them. 
And knight to h5, not a great post for that knight, but the dark squared bishops now are about to depart. And uh, maybe a sigh of relief there for black. But in the meantime, just looking very, very level. And uh, historically, at least, I think that would favor uh, Nakamura in terms of this clash of styles. And it's funny because normally I'm so eager to jump into the X's and O's of the position. It's just very solid. There's really not too much to speak of. Both players have played sensible moves. White will castle kingside eventually, but with the bishop staring at each other, you need to make a decision for Hikaru. Uh, he can just trade them. But the way he's side-eyeing the position, I can't tell if that's Hikaru face number six or number 16, <laughs> where he smells that he's a tactic, or if he's just like, I really got a whole lot of nothing right now. Well, the bishop trade is on the board, and the only way to avoid it is to fall back with the bishop in g3, giving Ali Reza the option to cause the imbalance by trading it off for the knight, and Hikaru is about to take a decision on it. Will he be more ambitious with the bishop retreat or trade off a pair? Uh, you, can, you, you, you always talk about trading on your terms. Once the bishop falls back to g3, it can even find itself on that central e5 square. I have a feeling the more time Hikaru takes, he's going to decide to retreat the bishop. But he goes for the trade, just as I say it. He takes the decision. This is looking more and more level. And while uh, this one continues, let's head over to uh, Maxime vachel Lagrave playing against uh, Wesley So. Wesley So with such a fantastic performance on day one. The only player who needed no Armageddon for the two victories. And some decisions to be made on the board right now. Dynamic play, that last move which is being highlighted, asks questions. Wesley needs to take a decision on the center. I yeah. think it's big tactics at play here, where Wesley, David, I think Wesley's worse right now. Maxime has a dream come true out of the Grunfeld. I'd be nervous if I were Wesley. Yeah, first of all, look at the clock times. Wesley has half the time Oof. of his opponent, MVL, just blitzing. He's gone back to basics, employing, again, his childhood favorite, the Grunfeld defense is black. Often a good strategy. He's been switching it up, uh, throwing new openings out there throughout the last... 12 months, 24 months, and he's uh, somehow surprised Wesley so early on here. Still looks very tense. Uh, a lot of pieces on the board. White has some control over the center, but yeah, Black's pieces are all mobilized, and look how quickly oh. MVL's playing. He sacrifices the exchange. Oh, we have to dive in right now because Maxime's rook is under threat from that bishop on g5, and he says, I don't care. Take the rook, and that's probably what Wesley kind of has to do, otherwise he just lost the pawn for no reason, and the rook takes back. And yeah, you can take this pawn on d4, but after knight takes d4, and we see a trade of minor pieces, trades are supposed to be good for the side with extra material, but the problem for white is black is super active. There's a rook staring through your own bishops towards the enemy bishop and queen. There's a queen on c7 that can line up with a bishop on the diagonal, maybe cause some problems in front of the white king and let's not forget a pawn count on the queen side shows three for black and only one for white that c pawn can just rumble up the board c4 right in this kind of position could be an option yeah looks beautiful for black i've got to say minimal material investment in return you get so many uh, advantages long term and this is happening we're rattling down this variation i love it from maxime i don't know if he's in preparation or whether this is just instinctive using all of those years of experience in the grunfeld defense but He's got the upper hand, Wesley, on the back foot already as white. He just understands these positions so well, Maxime vachel -Lagrave. the Grunfelds that we're seeing on the board. And he wasn't even on the board when he took this immediate decision. He sits down and immediately takes the pawn, giving up the rook. It just shows how much of an understanding he has of this. He loves the exchange sacrifices, whether it's the rook takes c3, rook takes knight in a knight off, or in this case, a giving up an exchange for initiative. This just feels like the clash of styles between two of the best players on the planet, but Maxime vachel has managed to get the kind of position that suits his style, while Wesley doesn't get the kind of positions that he enjoys. And that clock that you pointed out, that's going to be a major, major factor in this one. Whether it's preparation or inspiration, he's taking him down this tactical matrix where Wesley doesn't always feel the most comfortable or confident. And Wesley did just capture on D4. We will see some more material come off. But what's the essential point of this position is Black's king is very safe. So that means he could focus on the queen side where he has three pawns, just one for white. And that is going to tell the tale of this position. The eval bar slightly favoring Bl Black. I think from a practical point of view, how easy it is to play, we also should favor Black as well. Look at the speed with which Maxime is just blitzing out his moves. I mean, he's loving those bishops on the board. The rook lined up. He's got that extra pawn. This is Maxime vacher Legrave's bread and butter, these kind of positions. Wesley, I think he's in trouble, and he knows it. 
Yeah, first I have to say, Robert the Prophet, you've predicted this whole variation. And uh, secondly, I think, yeah, Black just has a dream position. Uh, you still have to play energetically. You don't want to allow too many more exchanges. For example, if the light squared bishops disappear, if queens disappear, suddenly white's rooks might gain in power. But uh, for now, with this exact material imbalance, um, it feels like it does favor black, as long as you're quick and start throwing pawns forward as quickly as possible on the queen side. Uh, I think Maxime is doing a good professional thing as well. After that tactical mess, that tactical melee, he's pausing, he's deciding upon a plan of action, and then he'll change the pace again, speed up yet again, and put pressure on Wesley. So a nice post for his bishop here. And uh, yeah, massive pressure on white. Wesley has to be so accurate just to survive these next few moves, actually. Those pawns are rolling. The only bit of good news I would say for Wesley is that he has pawns of his own. And as soon as I'm getting these words out, he plays pawn to f4. So black has three on one on the queen side of the board, our left-hand side. White has four on three on the king side. And you typically want to push the pawns where you have that advantage. And if that pawn gets up to f5, and maybe even all the way up to f6, we could see the start of a checkmating net with the queen running up to h6, and that could be very dangerous. So Wesley, he understands that he can't just sit and do nothing. He needs to act fast. Active defense, really, uh, really instructive stuff from Wesley this time. And actually, yeah, f5. I think Maxi might have underestimated this. It did look like one-way traffic. Black about to play the move c4, but uh, pushing the pawn to c4 would allow a counterattack. White will not passively react, passively retreat. He'll go forward and go for the Black King. So far from one-way traffic, and wow, Maxi Vashilograph, again, playing <laughs> so quickly, so instinctively, just plays king to h8 into the corner mysterious stuff he's allowing the attack to continue but maybe he's recognizing that after f5 with his king tucked in the corner he can actually capture and the g2 pawn is something he can target place that bishop in the center throw your rook on over to g8 white is not checkmating in fact white is the one who might get checkmated if you're not careful this is some crazy tactical affairs here on the board and wesley i think he did another very smart thing instead of throwing that pawn up too soon he needs to time it correctly he just slides his queen out of the rook's line of sight. He's covering that c4 squared another time. If white had a free turn, maybe bishop c4. Let's trade off those light squared bishops. And then I think we start to see an advantage for white. And the queen on c2 is really nicely placed because even now, if black was to go c4, you don't need to think about your bishop. You can go with the idea that you pointed out earlier. Just keep pushing your f-pawn now. Uh, you stepped out of the pin and uh, black's still in the pin. So d3 bishop will not be hanging. Really nice play by both players. But again, looking at the clock, I think it's pressure on Wesley in this one. Yeah, pressure on Wesley. But the last few moves, he has been uh, kind of fighting that swing in momentum. We thought it was heading in Black's favor, but the top players in the world, they always find ways uh, to kind of stem the flow. And uh, yeah, I love these last two moves, Wesley. So playing really actively. It feels like, again, he's been woken up. The opening didn't go White's uh, favor, but he's finally finding uh, his rhythm. And that's when Maxime is spending the time. So Wesley is doing the professional thing, thinking on Maxime's clock. And I think we will see this time start to even out unless Maxime says, I need to make a concerted effort to punish Wesley with that 17th piece of the clock. But for now, it does seem like Wesley has found his footing. The position is double-edged, chances for both sides. Yeah, it feels like this is one of the most exciting games of the round so far. Uh, very different type of uh, game to the maneuvering battle, the cagey. Uh, kind of standoff we saw earlier between uh, Nakamura and Faruja. This one is about to uh, really heat up. And Queen to e7, Queen slide. Feels really slow suddenly uh, from Vashi Legrav. Feels a bit indecisive, this one. And uh, all of those plans, pushing pawns forward, exchanging off the light squared bishops. Oof, suddenly, maybe I'm starting to favor white. The evaluation bar certainly shooting up in Wesley's favor. And again, quick reply. But if Maxime is also starting to favor Wesley's position, he might be doing the defensive thing. He's saying, you know what? That even if these bishops get traded, I am down a rook for a bishop and pawn. That's a one-point advantage for the white side. And if that's the case, then I can actually get a little bit of a fortress. My bishop on d4 will blunt that d file. Nothing's going on there. The c5 pawn stops an open file. What do rooks need? Open lines. And unless white is eventually going to push that f pawn, the lines will remain closed. So perhaps Maxime says, I can actually hold this if I more or less do nothing. Well, that last move looks like uh, Maxime isn't uh, doing much, but keeping the pressure on the clock. And for more on this game, we're going to go straight to Toronto. We've got Danny with us. Danny, do you think Wesley is in trouble right now? I definitely think Wesley's in trouble. And, you know, we were talking about the game outside on the couch with everyone weighing in. And 
we obviously go back to the point a lot about how MVL's repertoire is so consistent, almost stubborn. Everyone knows he's playing the night over the Grunfeld. But we also observed that Wesley can also be a pretty consistent creature of habit. And maybe against MVL, those styles are not going well. I mean, the most reflective factor of the fact that Wesley is obviously in trouble is actually not on the board, but on the clock. Maxime is playing instantly. Wesley's position is only getting worse. I think we're going to see the uh, streaky Frenchman turn it around here. Big moment. And uh, when we were having our chat earlier with Wesley, uh, I remember you mentioned that for Wesley, it's so much to do with how confident he's feeling. Now, he's had a fantastic start, but things looking shaky here. What about Maxime? Did you catch up with him yesterday? How's he feeling about his form after day one? What's funny is Maxime, of all the players, I feel like remains in the best of spirits. He's still teasing with Anish Giri on Twitter as far as where, where that autograph photo is being hidden around. I can't wait for people to see the story of how he got that. That's coming, that's coming later with some content we did. But no, Maxime is in good spirits. Obviously, he lost one match in Armageddon, but won another and didn't seem to phase him. And so with Wesley going right into the lion's den here in the Grunfeld, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. Um, but before we move on, I wanted to say that the reason I had to jump in right now is because Robert thought I was going to let it slide that he referenced whether it was number six or number 16 Hikaru Nakamura faces. First of all, Robert, you got to stay in your lane, bro. Secondly, it was actually number four because what you misunderstood is it was the six facial expression. But when the wrist is there, that's actually number four, which is a sign of Hikaru's confidence. He's very confident against Faruja. I don't know why, but he is. But Hikaru also, I think, super confident. And Robert, don't, don't let that happen again, please. Try to involve you even when we are far apart. So I, not, that's a lesson to me. I won't try to speak to you uh, when we're in very different countries and continents. So I'll learn my lesson. Don't turn this relationship negative right now. You know this thing works long distance. I'm just, I'm just needed to call you out a little. That's I, I, I was sitting there watching and you're referencing number six and sixteen, and I about choked on my food. I'm like, no, no, no. I gotta hop on there. Thanks, Danny, uh, for that update. Tiny Robert, get a room, guys. I mean, we got to get back to the chess right now. And look at what we do have on the board. The F-pawn has moved forward. The F6 square is under control, so at least that's not happening anymore. The one thing that worries me for Wesley right now is that Maxime can actually start getting ambitious on the queen side with his own pawns. Can you think about advancing that B-pawn one step ahead and creating passes that can cause trouble to White? Yeah, it feels a bit inconsistent what Wesley has been doing. Uh, he's been trying to undermine the black queen side, something we call the minority attack, when one pawn uh, kind of attacks a uh, larger number of pawns to create some weaknesses. Suddenly he's switched it up and gone for the black king, but this looks like a shot in the dark. This is really not being, uh, this is not a realistic attack for white. You have no pieces simply. And uh, I liked your idea, Tanya. I liked uh, pushing the pawns forward. Why not? That's where your uh, advantage lies. Push on the side you're stronger, but instead he plays a quiet move, rook to d7. He's just covering the king side covering the queen side. Maxime, I think, is trying to hustle on the clock. Danny mentioned it. Uh, maybe the biggest problem isn't the position itself. It's just that White's position, uh, yeah, not so instinctive to play and no time. Two and a half minutes only. Yeah. Well, Maxime bashir Grav still about four minutes on the clock and uh, drops a little piece. What do you think? Those are nerves. What's going on now? He knows that he's up on the clock, the position, everything to play for. And the move that he just made, right? Rook stepping up. It's actually quite a nice one, David, because there were these ideas of trading on the G-file, opening up the rook. The queen could have lined up from the B3 square, create pressure on the pawns. So playing prophylactic and also B5 always in the air. I would pick black any day uh, of the week in this one. Oh, Maxime is definitely in the driver's seat, and the bishop on d4 dominates this board because the dark squared bishop and white's pawns are now on light squares. There's no competition over there, and on the queen side, there may not be competition for black's pawns that are about to advance. All right, we're going to keep an eye out on this one, but it looks like Wesley is in trouble on the board and the clock, uh, and we will shift our focus to Hikaru Nakamura, the other player who has been in uh, big trouble so far in the finals against uh, Ali Reza Firuja. And once again, Ali Reza with double rook on the F line. This to me is very reminiscent of his game against Fabiano Caruana, where there was this king side attack that happened, potential sacrifices on F3. Is Hikaru feeling the heat right now with White? definitely feels that way. Uh, the momentum of this game, it looks really solid for Nakamura. Maybe he had a small advantage. He had a nice pawn structure. 
but things have been turning. Black has been improving every move. Look at this, Ferruja suddenly centralizing his queen, maybe shifting the queen over to help out the Black Rooks. White knights are the final bastions of defense here, just holding uh, the position together. But Nakamura, he is certainly on the defensive. Look how passive White's major pieces are, the heavy pieces, White's queen, White's rooks, not doing any work at all. So I think black is slightly better. It's nothing kind of tangible yet, but it could certainly become that way. It would probably be almost winning for black if his knights were better. His knights right now are passive, but they are great defensive pieces covering the central pawns. But if one of those knights could hop into the d4 square, a rook sacrifice for that knight on f3 would be imminent. So that's the thing that is allowing Hikaru to stay afloat right now. He's very passive himself, but he is trying to cover all his bases on the king side. Yeah, what do you play though? How do you, I mean, how do you improve your pieces? White's knights are totally stuck. White's rooks I mentioned a bit, uh, yeah. I mean, struggling for air right now. Nakamura, he does have a small advantage on the clock. I've seen him so many times online playing these blitz games. He kind of keeps the status quo of stabilize, 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 and only strike later. But mm. he's got to kind of uh, survive this storm, first of all. Absolutely, David. And, and your question, very valid. How does Hikaru create air for himself in this position? And I'm, I want to bring up a move here. You know, you're looking for pawn breaks. You want more space. Is D4 ever on the radar for White in these positions to try to get that space, to try to get some activity? Because one thing about Hikaru, he hates being passive in these kind of positions uh, and just letting Ali Reza do whatever he wants. D4, is that something that he can think about? I want that to happen. I feel like if you play d4, I'm sacrificing oh. my rook on f3 because I was just saying my knights need to become more active. Now I take on d4, and if you take back on d4 with your queen, in comes my knight to e5, and I'm out to go to Forkville on f3, hitting your queen, your king, and your rook all at once. So this type of position, it can open up, yes, for Hikaru's pieces, but maybe even more so for Alireza's. Wow, tactics galore. And, uh... I mean, D4 is so natural, it's so desirable, as you say, Tanya, but if it doesn't quite work concretely in this position, you're a bit stuck. And Black's Knight does have other ways around. Robert mentioned the D4 square, mm. takes two jumps with one knight, and then you're in. Uh, you're into D4 after perhaps sacrificing first on F3. Uh, so there are plans available to Ferruja. And suddenly the clocks have balanced out. Uh, it's pretty much level now on time. And wow. Black definitely in the driver's seat. Nakamura just unable to break this trend of the tournament so far. And we've seen Ali Reza, when he gets his kind of positions, when he gets the attack going, he's just so good with that in converting these positions. It's far from over, but passive, passive play here for Hikaru. Really no way to break through. He does line up the rook, so kind of eyeing that break that we were looking at earlier. D4 in the air now. Uh, and also, let's remind everyone, in the round robin stage, after this, two players will be eliminated. Hikaru Nakamura is yet to score a victory. He's yet to go on the leaderboard. And he plays Magnus Carlsen next. It's really critical for him to try and get this one uh, in bag. And here come the pawns. Oof. If he's going to try to uh, prevent Black's attack, I don't know how because all of Black's pieces are ready. Now he pushed another pawn that frees the c6 square up for his knight. And the big question is, well, now that d4 is unavailable from the white side, will he have to capture a pawn in the center? And that does allow some more Black pieces to flow. So I'm looking at this game and the overall standings, and I think that Ali Reza must be the happier of the two. He did struggle against Fabiano in that uh, Armageddon game, but it's a new day, and I think it's a new Ali Reza. Yeah, Alarez is so aggressive, pushing pawns. I love it, Robert. Uh, these three pawns for Black. You could see a fourth pawn joining the uh, joining the fight. Black's knight's about to come forward as well. Uh, Nakamura contorting. He's really finding some odd moves to say in this game. Knight to h2 looks like an odd square. And now, if I were Alarez, I would not hesitate. I think that maneuver you mentioned, bring the knight into the center. Beautiful outpost and uh, big advantage. He plays that move. He's just in the flow. Feels like uh, Alarez is really hitting top form right now. And uh, Nakamura, such a critical match. He needs to somehow pull that break and survive this game. Uh, this is a big one. And now both players under two minutes. Uh, I think for Hikaru especially. Ali Reza won one match. If he goes to 0-3, Hikaru is staring at elimination from the round robin stage, which would be quite disastrous. He jumps forward with the Knights, so Black does have the opportunity to do the same. Uh, Ali Reza, strong position. Will he be able to convert this one? with the clock situation. That's the big thing, is both players are approaching severe time trouble. There is increment. The players get three seconds added every move that they make. So that is the good thing for them. They won't lose on time. But when you get down to those waning seconds, that's when the likelihood of a mistake does go up. And here, I think that the likelihood of a mistake, it's a 
going up for both sides because now that knight has jumped into g4, it's putting some pressure on the black center. It's also protecting that weak spot on f2. So that knight is doing a whole lot. It can continue rerouting. It's getting messy. And the third thing that you just pointed out, I think that's a really important point, that he can reroute and go to f5 and actually challenge that uh, very strong knight that Ali Reza has just dropped on d4. Meanwhile, we do have our first result as the two youngsters, Noderbeck and uh, Dennis Lazowick, and their game won in a draw. But this is where the action at, is at, and it's really heating up. Yeah, rotating those knights, Nakamura, he's so good at that, uh, at that uh, kind of manoeuvre phase of the game. And right now, he's suddenly got a 30-second time advantage. And, whoa, I just saw an evaluation bar switch uh, in the game between Wesley So and Vashi Legrave. Some crazy tactics over there, uh, which we might jump to. But this one, so tense. Nakamura, he's traded off a set of pawns with white. But Black's knight on d4, so dominant. By far the MVP, the most valuable piece right now. And, uh, okay, at least he's trying to trade it off. Nakamura, he's fighting hard. It's not a knight, it's a stallion. And <laughs> if, for, unfortunately for Hikaru, he wants to trade it off, but he also doesn't because if you take it, then Black gets a pass pawn cemented in the center. So look at Hikaru trying to undermine the defense of that knight. Both players are playing well. I'll raise it down on the 50 seconds, though. And Hikaru, very resourceful. He does keep the tenacious defense going, but we did see a big slip on the eval bar in Wesley versus Maxime vachier Legrave, And we're going to take a quick look and... I think we're also getting a result in. Wow. They just finished, and uh, Wesley So goes down. Maxime Vachel Legrave sacrifices the exchange and gets the job done with the black pieces, taking the lead in his mini match against the tournament leader. Wow. And we will recap that one later because there were some stunning tactics towards the end. But uh, all eyes on this clash between Nakamura and Ferruja now. Both sides down low on the clock, just under 30 seconds for Ferruja, just over a minute for Naka, and uh, okay, a bunch of knights. That stallion is gone, Robert. It is, and now it's that knight on f5 that white has replaced by a pawn, opening up that rook that is sitting next to the white queen. So all of a sudden, black's pawns look a bit fragile. They're all split apart, a lot of isolated ones. This really is becoming a tense battle with chance for both sides. And you can start targeting those pawns already by doubling up on the e-file. The rook on b2 suddenly really nicely placed. It was defending that f2 pawn, and now it can start attacking... Uh, uh, Black's e5 pawn uh, with the idea of going ahead, but he chooses the queen instead, lines up. Queen e5 is a threat, defended. Uh, the eval, uh, eval, evil, bar. <laughs> either way, it is planted in the middle, but to me it looks like momentum on white side suddenly. Tanya, you highlighted a couple of weak pawns, three isolated pawns for Black. Such easy play for Nakamura, queen <laughs> in <laughs> to, to the heart of Black's position there. Nice uh, kind of finesse added to that move, just with the gesture there. And oh, wow, Farouja's clock. I don't fancy his chances of holding this. Maybe it was less of finesse and more invitation because it hovered on that C4 square and Alaris says, don't mind if I do. I'm going to push my pawn up there. That rook on F4 that's defending that pawn laterally, that's behind enemy lines. And now that queen is behind black's lines here. Both sides have different ideas. And I think that white rook that's on B2 that was previously defensive is going up. He does it. He's up a pawn. Oh, he's up a pawn, but look at those white pieces. The white queen, the white rook on the seventh rank. So many targets. Black's king, not entirely safe. Okay, there's a hit on white's rook at the bottom of the board right now. Black's queen, really agile right now, showing off all the angles, but surely that rook just moves. And also a really nice square because you defend the c7 square from white's queen, doubling up on the seventh rank. Oh. And he reaches for the rook and moves it to f1. Yeah, that was, was that? that was a hezzy. He <laughs> went to C1 and over to F1. And here we see, look at that rook. That black rook is defending the checkmate square and it's putting pressure towards the white king. Watch out for some knight sacrifices from Ali Reza because he's trying to exploit the fact that the white king may be in some grave danger. Why is Hikaru wow. hesitating so much on every move? Are you seeing the indecision there? And there it is. There's that knight sacrifice. It couldn't be captured. And Hikaru, he attacks the black queen. The queen goes all the way back to the corner, keeping an eye at the square in front of the white king. And, the white and it's blocked. Yeah, blocks it out. Again, dominance on the seventh rank and blunder from Ferruja as he allows... Okay, I was going to say a queen check, but oh. the white rook comes in threatening to eliminate the black knight. The black knight, once it's taken, this will end in checkmate. Wow, a ch check, and now the knight is going to be captured. This is going to be a mate on the seventh rank. Hikaru Nakamura escapes. Oh, he turned it on just at the right moment. The black queen sacrifices herself. She drops off the board, but white has a decisive advantage now. Queen and knight will beat two rooks. Wow. 
And that knight is going to jump to h5, a threatening a mate as well on g7. Hikaru Nakamura with a big turnaround, about to take the lead in his match. Oof, what a tactical flurry that was. Nakamura really upping the pace, turning on the style. And yeah, this is a decisive material advantage. You're also landing potentially a checkmating attack. And we see a handshake. That is resigns by Ali Reza. Hikaru Nakamura relieved after his first win. He takes the lead in his match against Ali Reza and he needed this win to stay in the race. Ali Reza to bounce back has to win the second game on demand. He starts with the white pieces. Hikaru there walking off but then takes a pause. Let's take a look at the remaining game. And desperation probably just brought out the best in Hikaru Nakamura. And these two players, they've been in pretty locked battle for a long time now. Very few pieces remain on this board. Uh, there's a bishop for black. You can see it very close to Fabiano there. Uh, white has a knight. But they've uh, been making little progress, though Magnus remains a pawn ahead. No idea how he got that pawn, but Magnus is doing Magnus things. Uh, he's going to play this out till uh, the end of time. Yeah, this makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. <laughs> makes me glow with pride that uh, Magnus Carlsen is trying to grind like a grandmaster, trying to squeeze water from a stone and win this endgame, which should, of course, be a draw because White doesn't have uh, too much ammunition left. But a pawn is a pawn. And uh, you can tickle, you can probe away, hope for a blunder. Knights are tricky, as we know. Uh, but black essentially should be fine with any rook exchange. And uh, it's hard to imagine white winning this against solid defense. But he's trying. He's trying, Magnus Carlsen. The only thing you need to avoid as black here is the trade-off of both the pieces. The rook and knight, if it's a king pawn ending, then you'll be lost. But that's not going to happen. As long as one piece stays on the board, you're doing good. But the opening we had, it was hard to imagine Magnus actually getting an extra pawn to start with, to even start dreaming about creating chances. Well, I think Magnus dreamed of exactly this situation where with absolute best play, Fabiano would hold the draw. You, you tip your proverbial cap. You say, you're the second best player in the world right now. And for Fabi, yeah, he's down a pawn, but he's holding everything together. There are very few ideas for White. And Fabi, he's... You know, he's going to hold this. Second best player in the world. But Robert, that's quite debatable. The year that Fabi has had, if we stick to 23, he could be the best player in the year just this year. What a performance he's had. Yeah, what a performance. And uh, it's really instructive how he's holding this position. Um, Fabi's body language looks very stoic right now. He's just keeping his pieces active. Look at that black rook. It's just annoying white. It's just a nuisance piece. Looking at the second rank, looking at white's f-pawn, giving any checks anytime the white king pokes its head out. Black's bishop kind of poised perfectly as well. Blocking pawns, attacking pawns. Um, yeah, Fabiano, this is one to learn from this game for both sides. And there is a 50-move rule in chess. If no pawns are moved, no pieces are captured, and the game ends as a draw. So the Arbiters, they're going to have their uh, jobs laid out for them on site. And it looks like, well, that king has a job now. The white king, instead of passively sitting protecting pawns, it's out in the open. That could scare Fabi. We'll see if he's able to continue holding Magnus off. Yeah, Robert, you mentioned the 50 move rule. The last time there was a pawn push or a capture was move 49. So uh, Magnus has to make progress by move 99. Mm. Look at the move counter on the top left hand of your screens. We're now at move 83. He has to... It's reset. ...push a pawn <laughs> before we get to 99. It's reset. 50 more moves before that becomes relevant again. And the F-pawn pushing forward does uh, cause Fabiano some concern, maybe. And he's going for the H-pawn. And it, can you actually protect the H-pawn now? It looks like Magnus moved way. his rook, and the H-pawn is going down. And with the H-pawn falling, maybe white will push the pawn, but black can sacrifice his bishop for the pawn. Uh, just for everyone out there, you may be new to chess. It is a theoretical draw, rook and knight versus rook. That is a well-known draw, especially for players of this caliber. And that bishop on h4, really nicely placed there. It's taking away so many key squares from White's knight to jump into to create any mating net around Black's king. And Fabi playing really confidently. Yeah. He's playing fast, he's making all the right moves, and that is a forced rook trade. And with that, a check comes in. Is he going to just trade everything and uh, bishop takes knight, rook takes rook, king takes rook? Well, bishop takes knight, rook takes knight is probably what but caused not. Fabi some concern, but Ooh. it was going to be a draw regardless, and now we see it. A king pawn ending, but black gets the opposition. This is going to be played out, and Magnus there, he sighs. He's not happy, but I think it was just impossible to get anything more in this position. It's a draw. This one ends in a tie, just like every classical game did between these two in the 2018 World Championship, and I think Fabi is a happy man. Well, he played great defense. I mean, he did not break. There were moments there where things could have gone wrong for him, but the Fabi we've seen in 2023 is a man who is not very mistake-prone, very few errors throughout the year, and the confidence that you talked about, we saw it on full display in that game. And Robert, I, you and I were having this discussion before the start of the broadcast today. 
Do you think that Fabi actually has been the best player in the world in 2023? It's one of those complicated questions that you know, I'm not trying to get a cop out on the answer, but he has had the best performance rating in classical chess. I think that speaks magnitude. So there's definitely the argument for Fabiano. Mags didn't play oh so many classical events, and you could argue what are his ambitions, but I think there is a good argument for Fabi having been the best player in 2023 in classical chess. And he does start with a draw against the world number one. And there we have our results from game one of round three. There is the final rapid game coming up between these players. Wesley So has to win on demand to take it to Armageddon. Ali Reza Furja needs to do the same. Crazy, crazy game between these two players. Uh, Danis Lazovic, Abdu Satro was a peaceful draw. David, what was the highlight for you in this well-fought match? Well, uh, yeah, I promised uh, a glimpse, a highlight of the So versus Maxime Vachelagra finale there and just the tactics that flowed in the Frenchman's favour. I want to highlight this one moment. It actually looked like Wesley So had escaped the worst White's Rooks lining up. It looks like White actually is the one on the attack. Some targets, including the F7 pawn. However, Maxime turned things in his favour by pushing forward, bypassing the White F pawn. G5, not only is this a good defensive move, but we see the attacking ideas after rook to e1 and now g4 opening up the black queen on this diagonal if you take this pawn you'd walk into a devastating double attack a check hitting this rook as well but not just this after rook to g3 a beautiful tactic a queen sacrifice queen to h4 and if rook takes pawn now the black queen would have sacrificed itself and a nasty checkmate on the h file because the bishop covers the g1 square this tactic allowed uh, maxime to win material and after queen to d3 he simply dropped back his bishop now with bishop takes e5 double attack on the queen on the rook and he won the game that was so nice. The, the ability to see that queen sacrifice from a distance, the domination of the dark squares. Maxime Vachelagraf, he every bit earned that game. Even when things started to go to Wesley's way, Maxime never gave up. He never caved in. And in fact, he's the one who showed that he had the upper hand. Such a great fight that was. And we're seeing amazing chess all throughout history. He's being written in Toronto for the fight to be the undisputed king of the champion's chess star. And you can own a digital a piece of digital chess history and there it is it is a beautiful display of the trophy and all you got to do is go to chesschamps.io to bid on this stunning stunning artwork the champion of the tour will receive one of these and you could be the recipient of the only other display of this uh, beautiful trophy in front so go to chesschamps.io and make your bid on this one and we've got a big big a game two coming up off round three the final rapid game between these two players where wesley so needs to beat this guy maxime vasher legrave on fire in that game one on the clock as well it's gonna be determination from both of these we will be back with more action. it doesn't look like much but neither would a sicilian defense to the untrained eye this is a performance enhancer you don't see it how about now? Manage your air quality, sharpen your performance, change the game with air things. This December, they're back for one more round. Chess GPT. I'm already liking this bot. It's such a big troll. Dead lost. Grandpa Gambit. This decides to get a bit crazy because he sacrifices the queen, Frank and Isla, and everyone's favorite kitty, Mittens. Well, if I go here, it's a fork. If I go here, it's, a, it's another fork. So I guess the only safe move is this. I didn't even see that. Oh, oh that is so sick. That's actually sick. Oh, shit, there is 95. Oh, my. Play them again while you can on chess.com. Your subscription makes shows like this possible, which is why our Twitch subscribers will never see ads on chess.com. Connect your chess.com account and Twitch account at go.chess.com slash connect accounts and bang, boom, voila, you're done. 100% ad-free bliss forevermore. 
Whether you're following our events on site or on stream, type the command connect in the chat and thank you for helping bring these shows to life. Wesley So was qualified for the first event as the reigning chess.com global championship winner. But his road to Toronto has not been without challenges. From tough matchups against Hikaru Nakamura and Magnus Carlsen to his remarkable comeback through the loser's bracket in the AIM Chess Rapid. Black is completely winning the race. Even without Black's three pawns, this is still actually a draw. So uh, Hikaru, he knows he's got this in the bag. He's smiling, he's got a time advantage and he clinches That's his it. fist. Wesley resigns. Fist bump. Wow, it's uh, over. Hikaru Nakamura makes it through to the grand final. Good call there, Danny. The knight joins the attack. He takes the pawn and it's a big mistake. Is there a finish here, David? Oof, oof. I think it's something to do with knight d5 and the b6 square is calling my name. I'm freaking out. What is it? It's over. Yeah. Wait, what gets happened? the draw. I think there was a draw offer that was made and Wesley just accepts it. Not a bad played rook d7. It is a dead loss situation, but he ah. just offered a draw. In the grand final, he lost to Magnus Carlsen, but banks enough points to qualify for the tour finals. This could be the last few moves of the aim chess rapid. Seven, oh, and he no. wins a piece. The pawn on d3 is going to queen. Good up, back right the here. checkmating, it's on the board, Simon. Ooh, there we go. Oh my god, and we have a winner. Magnus Carlsen checkmates Wesley So and wins the aim chess rapid. Opening for your wall is here. Capture new major pieces on unique metal posters from Displate. Now with the official collection from Chess.com. Mount them in seconds with a tool-free magnet kit and swap them whenever you like. Make your move. Get an exclusive discount on all metal posters. Shop now with the code CHESS at Displate.com.
The official chess.com merch store is back and bigger than ever. We've got the perfect gift for the chess lovers in your life. Fresh new designs for t-shirts, socks, hats, and more at chess.com.shop. Or use the command merch in chat to shop right now. And we've got Kaya with the player who's been playing some big chess. <laughs> Well, a big uh, match here today for Fabiano Corona against Magnus Carlsen coming now from a draw in the first game. Is that a good start for you? Yeah, it's a good start. I was under pressure for most of the game. I think Magnus knew the line better than I did. Uh, the, the opening he got, okay, it should be an equal position, but he was more comfortable with the position. And in the end game, it was quite dangerous. I think it should always be a draw. I don't think I was ever losing or anything, but of course I was under pressure and low on time. Um, it definitely, it was uh, a bit of a close, close call. White pieces in game two. Will we see a winner in this match or will we see Armageddon before that happens? Well, we'll see a winner in the match, but I don't know if there will be Armageddon or not. That's the, that's the only question. But uh, yeah, of course, it's going to be uh, tough uh, one way or the other. Of course, it's a good start, but it's only a draw. It's not, you know, uh, it hasn't shaken up the match uh, in any real way. It's just um, a normal start, let's say. So for how long have you had the, the opening ready, the plan for your white game here against Magnus in the round robin? <laughs> I don't think I've had, I even have it ready now. <laughs> okay, interesting, interesting. So you will now prepare and find out what you're going to play. I'll think about what I'll play for sure, yeah. It's going to be interesting. Thank you, Fabi, and good luck in that game. All right, let's see what Fabiano Carano opens with, with the white pieces against Magnus Carlsen in game two. That is uh, the big question. What will be the opening choice, the opening approach by Fabi? He mentioned that he felt the pressure, the pull in the game uh, one after the opening, but he managed to hold it quite confidently. And that's supposed, that has to give you some boost. When you're playing against Magnus Carlsen and you hold a difficult endgame, you know you're playing some of the best chess. It's how we described it in the studio, that Magnus wanted a slight pull, tried to play a position he was more comfortable in, but Fabiano played perfect defense. That was never an opportunity for Magnus to get a win. So Fabi, he should be feeling confident, but you don't want to get overconfident and press too hard with the white pieces. And I'm going to get our body language expert in. David, you've just been appointed that. You know Magnus well. What is that expression? <laughs> oh, did he just hear me? <laughs> It's quite possible. He did look over at the exact moment you said that, Tanya. Um, to me, he just looks very calm, very composed. Look, very, looks very zen right now, Magnus Carlsen. Um, just the way he's approached this whole tournament so far. It's still early days, of course, but he's playing all of his best openings. Uh, no freestyling, no troll openings, as we sometimes see from the world number one. And uh, yeah, he looks in the zone. Can you hear me, Magnus? Smile <laughs> if you can. Oh my God, I can see the smile. I think he can. Ooh. It's the telepathy right there between David and Magnus. He's uh, ready to go with the black pieces. It's going to be quite the battle. Will they go into Armageddon or will we have a decisive result in this one? How ambitious is Fabi going to be with White? I don't think he will do anything unusual by his own standards, by what his typical repertoire is. But I've been thinking about this question that you asked about Magnus. And Magnus on day one played Denis Lazovic and Nodirbek Abdusatarov. At least on paper, the two lowest rated players in the field, the youngest players in the field. So Magnus got to, off to a great start with two match victories. But I do think that he recognized that his toughest road lays ahead with Fabiano sitting across from him with the rest of the opponents on his slate. I mean, he knows that this is a big matchup against Fabi. And as handshakes, games are underway. It's go time and Fabi starts with 1e4? Is that knight to c6? Wow. <laughs> Commentator's curse. I said uh, all of his best openings. Magnus Carlsen, he has played this move and in classical chess as well uh, very recently, including in the European Team Championship over the board uh, just last month. But OK, this is provocative stuff. White already sees as a space advantage and Black's knight on c6 slightly misplaced. It's like a bad Carol Khan because <laughs> your C pawn can't challenge for the center in any way. The knight on C6 actually would like to have that pawn in front of it. If that pawn on C6 could jump across, you'd put pressure on white center. All that being said, even though white has a spatial advantage, there are no easy targets. Black is very solid out of the gates and Fabiano showing that he's willing to trade off pieces here. And I don't think that Mangs is much worse despite the provocative opening. 
Is there such a thing as a bad Karen Khan, Robert? That's my question. <laughs> One of the favorite openings of a bunch of streamers, Levery Rosman, you know, Dina Valentine. <laughs> yeah, but the Karen Khan, they say in the Queen's Gambit, is all pawns, no hope. <laughs> there are no pawns going on here, and I guess there still is hope. You're watching Magnus Carlsen play chess, but the point is that you're not challenging for the center, so I feel like Black is not having the best time at the board. It looks like a mix between a bad Karakan, but a good French. So <laughs> this pawn structure more reminiscent of a French defense, of course, with uh, white seizing more space. It's a bit locked. At least black does have the light squared bishop outside the pawn chain, though. And uh, even if it gets traded off these uh, pair of bishops, um, yeah, at least black can breathe a sigh of relief. No bad piece there in the middle game. And Fabi starts with this non-standard, uh, sorry, Magnus starts with the non-standard one knight to c6. Fabi makes the most natural moves, gaining space in the center, offering a bishop trade to Black's most active piece, and Magnus goes into a long think. Does that surprise you? It does. Um, I think two surprises. Firstly, that Fabiana reacted so quickly. <laughs> Not being surprised by 196 is already an achievement, but yeah, it's a bit odd because Magnus didn't have too much choice on that last move. He could have delayed the exchange, perhaps. Um, he could have run away, maybe pinned the white knight, but okay, bishop's off the board now, white's queen on d3. Nice square for it. And Magnus needs to somehow make sense of his pieces. He needs to decide which side, uh, which flank to uh, castle his king on. And there are, there's no tension right now. There are no pawns staring at one another, no pawn breaks in the position. Maybe eventually we'll, we will see black push that f7 pawn. Now that's the golden pawn. Whenever you push it, you have to be very, very careful because it can expose your king. But if he does choose at some moment to play f6, I was about to say, he will likely castle to the queen side. He gets his queen out of the way to start. Maybe we will see Magnus go in that direction. But if I'm Fabi, maybe I play a move like pawn to c3. Say, are you sure you want to castle in that direction? Because then I can play b4 and start going after the black king on that flank. So this is a very big moment for Fabi. Is he actually worried about Magnus castling queenside? I think the answer is no. But how is he going to deal with black's impending ideas? Yeah, pawn to c3. He's saying to Magnus, okay, please commit your king. And I will go for Robert's plan, throwing pawns down the board, pawn storm there. Magnus delays that decision and uh, I think very wisely does chip away at the white center. Here, fighting against the head of the pawn chain, white one connect four, white uh, achieved this pawn formation. So you need to break it down and uh, yeah, nice move. This one very much in the balance right now and uh, very much about who maneuvers, who kind of understands this type of pawn structure better. And that black bishop on f8, the dark squared bishop, it doesn't really have a nice space to go to because of white's connect four, as you called it. So uh, this move, it will help that bishop get developed, which will in turn help the knight that's next to it get developed, which in turn will help that rook that's in the corner. So black has not been able to develop yet, but in the next two moves will. The eval bar is right there in the center. So Magnus gets away with another dodgy opening. It doesn't matter how dubious it is. If the opponent doesn't know how to capitalize, Magnus has proven time and time again he knows how to get out unscathed. And f6 is this uh, very thematic French break. And when you've got the French without the light squared bishop for black, you've got to be a happy, uh, happy camper with that. Uh, the biggest problem in black's position in all, these, uh, in all these structures is having that light squared bishop. That's been traded off. Magnus gets the f6 break in. And it's really all about how quickly he can develop the king's side pieces. I am hoping for opposite ca side castling, but I don't believe it will happen because it just feels like Fabi will be faster with the attack on that flank. Ooh, you never know. It's Magnus Carlsen. Uh, he does like to provoke his opponents from time to time. The Black King still needs a few turns to castle on the king side where it would like to be. You need to get the Black Bishop out of the way, the Black Knight out of the way first. So it might come down to a matter of timing. But yeah, it would take a brave player, as you say, Tanya, uh, to commit Black's King on the queen side. And well, We'd love to see it. Yeah, we would love to see it. Okay. Oh, it's not happening ever. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> Definitely not. not. If you castle queen side after this, uh, I don't think madman is a sufficient term to use against that decision. But in general, that pawn on e5, it's both a great piece because it restricts the territory that black's minor pieces can occupy, but it might be an overextended pawn. So look at that pawn in the center there for white. It doesn't have a pawn protecting it, which means it can be vulnerable to attack. So it's going to be an interesting battle as we see it continue from here. Yeah, Magnus just taking this time out, gaining space and uh, covering the b4 square, not allowing white to push forward. Because the center is blocked, he does have that luxury of time. So this game now will take a slower pace and uh, I think we'll check back in a bit later on. Well, this one uh, promises to be a heated fight between the world number one and the world number two. Fabi with that last move defending the e5 pawn, freeing up his own knight to perhaps jump forward. And while Magnus has a think, we are uh, going to uh, move to the other big clash between Hikaru and Ali Reza. Hikaru did win their first battle. 
Ali Reza has to win on demand. And uh, the moment the board came up in front of me, I was like, one second, this has to be the Royal Lopez. And then I see White's Bishop is on G2. What just happened in the opening? Yeah, it looks like a uh, distant relative, <laughs> Tanya, of the Royal Lopez of the Italian game. Uh, the pawn structure in the centre, very reminiscent of all of these 1e4, e5 openings. But yeah, that light squared bishop does make a bit of an odd impression. Um, Black's archer from afar, though. Black's dark squared bishop on a7 on a nice long diagonal. And Nakamura trying to clarify the pawn structure on the queen side. But uh, I think this is good strategy from Ferruja. All the pieces, all pawns still on the board at this early stage in a must-win situation. That's step one achieved. And uh, in the meantime, Nakamura just maneuvering his knights over. And what, one of the biggest benefits, David, of the structure that White has chosen with the Fianchetto bishop is the pawn in front of it. That knight that just landed on g6, going nowhere. It's purely a defensive piece. While in the Italian game, sometimes that knight hops into f4 and caused some problems. In fact, when Alireza had the black pieces against Fabiano Caruana, we saw that knight jump into the f4 square with a sacrifice helping to deliver a vicious attack. So right now, I feel like Alireza does have everything under control. It's going to be a longer battle. And as you're highlighting here, the knight can improve, then that dark square bishop can develop. I prefer white's chances, even though black has no real weaknesses thus far. Yeah, it feels like he's got a full-blooded fight ahead here. Alareza, he's going to plant his knight on the c4 square, most likely. He can, at some point, open the center, uh, or at least block out this black dark square bishop with a move like d4. Um, he's got a bunch of available plans. And I like this kind of space advantage on the queen side. From experience, it's always slightly uncomfortable knowing what to do with black. Do you ever push the pawn to c6? Maybe loosening up things a bit more. Do you ever get the time to open the center with d5? Black's bishops, um, they can be very good, but they can also be slightly stuck and... Um, right now, Ferruja, yeah, level on the clock, all the pieces on the board in a must-win situation. I think he's achieved anything, everything he could hope for, but of course, still very early days. And for Ali Reza, the other good thing is that the next few moves come way easier than they do for black, right? White's knight on a3 can be headed to c4 or even to c2 and then the center of the board to e3 targeting some of the light squares. Uh, the break that you pointed out of the deep on moving forward always in the air. Uh, the one idea that Hikaru, as you rightly mentioned, David, at some point you want to get that break in with black as well. You want to try to get c6 targeting that overambitious player on the queen side, uh, opening up the files. Right now, development on. Both sides have reasons to be, I think, pleased with the opening outcome here. Yeah, Hikaru is not going to be upset, but Ali Reza, I think, is actually happy because he at least has different ideas in the position. It may be symmetrical for now, but once White pushes that pawn in the center, I believe he should push the pawn to d4 right now. Mm -hmm. uh, he is creating some tension on his own terms. It's going to be a long battle, yeah. but it's one where Ali Reza, he can say, if I'm playing the better chess today, I may be able to secure that point because it's not a simple solution for Hikaru. Yeah, and Hikaru, I mean, talking of body language, looks so calm right now. It feels like he's really bounced back, recovered. Uh, he's back in boss mode uh, after his uh, birthday blues yesterday. And at least he has no weaknesses in this position. He's feeling confident. He's feeling solid. And, OK, this one will liven up. But your move on the board, Robert, D4. White does occupy the centre first on his terms, most importantly. And uh, some work still to be done for Nakamura. You don't want to sit passively for too long. Often you're looking for ways to concretely break out, trading off a set of pawns, fighting for the central squares. Um, otherwise, you're just simply cramped and suffering. And for black, that pawn push that you were advocating for, pawn c7 to c6, just trying to uh, put pressure on white's extended b5 pawn, it doesn't really carry a threat behind it because black doesn't really want to capture that pawn anyway with that knight on a3 sitting there. So for black, there are ideas that I can see, but I, I don't know the follow-ups exactly. And as was pointed out, if you take on b5, the white knight will take back. That's actually a very good trade, a positive trade for white gaining space. So yeah, <laughs> you see the evaluation bar go very high up in white's favor with all the pressure on that flank. So I, I don't really see uh, more than one move at a time for black. And I feel like for white, there are several different options. All right, well, this one, the break has happened. D4 on the board, so it's going to be fireworks really soon. And uh, we're going to head to Toronto as we've got James uh, joining us as some of the players are fighting to make a comeback. James, can you feel the heat coming from the playing arena right now? Not only do I see the heat, but they're bringing the heat. Tanya, David, Robert, Bobby, Chess, what I has, has, okay? I'm feeling so great right now. Guess why I'm feeling so great, guys? Can anyone tell me why I'm feeling so great? You had a lovely breakfast. There are chess players that you okay. admire and respect That's in nice. the playing hall? 
You had a great wow. workout Man, today. Man, that's my twin brother, Robert Hess, over there. I can hear it. I had a nice workout, too, as well. What else? What else? Yeah, no. It, here it is. I got you. Hikaru Nakamura played the Joe Bava Jar Jar Binks London. He played the London. He played the Joe Bava London. And guess what? The course drops tomorrow. I don't know if it was promotion from Hikaru. I didn't talk to him. Maybe he just telepathically, because he is half man, half everything else. Somehow he just tried to figure it out. But the course drops tomorrow, and he played it. And guess what? He won. How you think I'm feeling over here in Joe? Joe Bava, Joe, Joe Bava London land. How do you think we feel in? So, James, you're basically saying that you're Hikaru's secret second for this event. Hey, I didn't want to have to say it, David. You said it, not me, buddy, okay? <laughs> you said it, not me, David. Come on. Breaking news. Of course. I feel great over here in Toronto. He's played it. He won. And we see a reverse Joe Bava, too, actually, in Magnus' game. You just, you know, he felt it. And you can play the Joe Bava sometimes both ways. That Shigorin is can be played in, in reverse. And, of course, I'm going to go back and look at that game and see how it's going. But we just got some Joe Bava land-ish stuff going on with this chessable course dropping tomorrow. James, I'm with you there. The openings have been quite fun, and uh, they're using one of your repertoire. But I have a question about the players' mentality and the attitude. After Ali Reza and Wesley lost, did you have a chance to see them during the break? Uh, how do you think they were feeling? Yeah, you know, I didn't see either one of them. I think Ali Reza actually came out. I think the way he's handling games, win, loss, draw, uh, it's very high level. I mean, he's just, you don't see any real emotion from him. He just kind of, eh, it happened, you know, get, get some, he grabbed a snack or two, went back to play, and that was it. Didn't see Wesley on this one, um, but I definitely saw Ali Reza. Every time in between rounds, he just gets up, he walks around, he's calm. You can tell he's in good spirits, and his psych, I think his psych is really, really good right now. All right, well, James, uh, exciting, exciting Jabava London's happening with the white and the black pieces. Uh, we will uh, keep checking in with you. And, uh, yeah, have fun in Toronto. And there's a lot of fun going on on the board as well. Uh, we are going to head over to Maxime vacher Legrave against Wesley So. Uh, Hikaru Alireza still heating up. Alireza has to win on demand. And uh, Wesley So needs to do the same to take it to playoffs. And there the players are. Maxime Vachelagrav with the white pieces needing only a draw to take match victory. And he's got an endgame and I'm kind of liking white's position already. Yeah, F for four, the flamboyant Frenchman throwing the F-pawn to F4 now. And I mean, Queen's off, Wesley's queenside pieces as well, a bit asleep here, especially that black rook in the corner on A8. I think he's opening it up right at the uh, correct moment. And Vashilagrav not playing for the draw. He's got the queens off. But this last move shows he's playing the position. He's playing uh, kind of objective chess. And there's some big threats actually on the board. Wesley has to be really careful to survive, let alone try to win this game. Very instructive moment right here because so many players, when all they need is a draw, they make passive moves, quiet moves. Instead of going two squares of the pawn, maybe they would have went one. But Maxime understands the position in all practical terms, calls for this push. His light square bishop is slicing across the board towards the enemy king. By opening up the F file, his rook next to his king is about to see an open line there towards that very square. And if black takes on F4, he may be able to push his pawn up to E5, go forward. And if that knight hops to the side, the board to h5 i got an extra pawn go me e6 slams down the board rook takes rook on d1 i'm not going to take your rook back at least not yet i'm first going to take on f7 intermezzo with check the king is forced only legal move is sliding to the corner and then after rook takes rook uh, the game is completely in white's favor your pass pawn the back rank issues it's all going to lead to a checkmate and a win for white yeah beautiful tactics it just works move by move and I don't think Wesley saw this coming. Uh, that instructive moment, just to mention again, Robert, if White does nothing, if White is too slow, if White just kind of takes time out, moves a rook, for example, this would allow Black to, for example, trade off dark square bishops, uh, get rid of those pieces. B5 might come at the right moment. Black has severe counterplay. And uh, long term, Black's actually doing pretty well. But yeah, just short term deficiencies. And F4 takes uh, this one kind of one off opportunity. And I don't even see a defense here. I think Wesley has to be really, really resourceful. A two-minute thing by Wesley So in big trouble already by move 17. And game one also felt like a Maxime show and this one as well. We heard it from the players earlier where they said that Wesley, the toughest, toughest player to crack. But today, just Maxime has been getting his kind of positions. And I'm just wondering, uh, David, if it's possible to just do an action replay that how is it possible in 17 moves, Maxime gets this incredible position out of the opening, even though the queens are traded off. He's the one who's playing for the initiative and Wesley in big trouble. Yeah, let's uh, go back and show what has happened in this game as we see rooks leave the board. I just want to highlight here, very tense position, uh, but Maxime 
influenced by the match situation, did just trade off a set of pawns in the center. Looks very balanced, very level, but now an active move. Bishop to c4, landing on this diagonal that Robert highlighted. And uh, if we fast forward, it's just about active play. Pawn to a4, clamping down on the queen side, and uh, now landing a bishop on this beautiful a3 square. And it's all about the power of these bishops. And this is how we saw queens leave the board. Uh, the queens were traded off in this really convoluted way, but a really accurate way. And if we catch up with the current position, Wesley's only defense now was to trade off rooks, parting with the open file, and a ba uh, backwards knight move now, holding things together. But black is totally stuck. Black is paralyzed, immobilized. You, can, you cannot move this knight, otherwise the white rook will infiltrate. You, therefore, you cannot move the bishop, which is stuck defending the knight. Therefore, you cannot move the rook in the corner. These three pieces will not play a role in the next few moves. And it's just about whether Maxime can profit in the meantime. I'm expecting him to push forward. You don't want to allow this black bishop to open up on the diagonal, but uh, a position like this is very one-sided. And uh, big advantage for white. Big advantage, Maxime with a promising, promising endgame, and he needs only a draw to wrap up uh, his match. Wesley in big trouble in this one. We will keep an eye out on this, uh, but we have to head back to the Magnus board because the world number one, it looks like, uh, has found himself in some trouble. Also down on the clock. We saw a very different uh, body language from Magnus at the start of the game. David, this is a concerned Magnus right now. Yeah, this is a Magnus who's focusing because he needs to. His back is up against the wall. Fabiano is going for the attack. Uh, white has actually won a pawn in the position as well. You see a white knight uh, near to the camera here, uh, deep in enemy territory on the h7 square. It's grabbed a pawn simply, and Magnus is king, stuck in the center, uncastled. Uh, unfazed, undaunted as well, but uh, yeah, Magnus in trouble objectively. But he voluntarily just moved his king. If we even go back a single move, you could see by the yellow highlight on the board, he played king to d8 on his own volition. And a move ago, was that force? I guess if we just can show this, that there was a huge idea for white. Knight f6 check was the threat. So if you play knight takes e5 for black, I think white gets away. Oh, I was gonna say, I thought white would get away with it, but knight f6 check, Oh, this is funny. After knight f6, you can play king to f7, Maybe. and that way if knight takes queen, knight takes queen, you lose your knight, but you gain the white knight. See, this is some really deep stuff. Of course, Magnus, Fabi, capable of seeing it, but instead Magnus says, I don't want a part of that. Let me slide my king over. So I guess uh, the tactics can be misleading in some extent. You get afraid of them, but he could have successfully grabbed the pawn in the center. Again, we're going to deep dive into our live board, but because this is such a crazy position, David, I want you to go back just a couple of moves from where we left it last to see how we actually got to this point, uh, because this is getting uh, very intense. Yeah, very intense position, a crazy position. And uh, we left it just before this moment. Black has actually just brought the uh, bishop out to c5. White has put the knight on d2, just developing. Here, Magnus played a4 and... Fabiano said, OK, I don't care. You're trying to clamp down on my queen side, but I don't trust you. I'm playing b4 anyway, allowing en passant. And this is a very bad strategic move from Fabiano, but a very good dynamic move. He's activating his pieces with gain of tempo. He gains time against this bishop, and now he trades off this bishop. And uh, look at how the white knight is about to pounce on c5. White's gained a bunch of time at the cost of a couple of weak pawns, but who cares about weak pawns if you're going for checkmate, if you're going on the attack. And uh, just beautiful, energetic play. Now another the knight lands on the other side of the board, knight to g5, hitting this square with the knight now on h7, and uh, we see greed being good, knight takes pawn, and uh, the rook defending. This is how we got to the current position, a nasty knight check threatened, as Robert pointed out, and uh, discovered attack against this undefended, unprotected black rook. Black cannot castle kingside, of course, it's illegal right now because the white knight covers one of the squares the king wants to castle through. You cannot castle queenside because there would be devastating tactics such as knight to c5, a sacrifice, attacking the queen. If the knight is captured, suddenly the b-file is open and first you land a check, of course, and this would end in devastation. This would soon be checkmate. Uh, so Magnus, he had no other option, uh, or at least he felt he had no other option than king d8. And now Fabiano says, OK, your king's heading in that direction. I'm going to preempt. Uh, that decision and play a4, getting ready to attack if the king continues. But he is giving up this pawn on e5. So Fabi says, I don't need this pawn in the center of the board. Black can take it with tempo, a shot against the white queen. And I'm guessing the white queen would just step back to a square like e2. And the knight's in trouble, a5 is coming. But this is getting very dynamic. In fact, these moves are on the board right now. Uh, doesn't black have the better long-term position? Because white's queen side pawns, they're split over there. So if the queens come off the board, suddenly black is much better. 
And the knight is attacked, and if you go back to the square that it came from, I think the trick that you pointed out earlier becomes a reality. The knight can jump back to f6, mm. and the rook is hanging on h8. You're going to end up losing material, which means that now Magnus has to retreat with the knight defending his rook on h8. Yeah, he has to be so careful, Magnus Carlsen. Maybe only two moves to survive in the current position. As you say, Tanya, he has to choose one of these two squares, uh, maybe this one, just to defend this rook in the corner. I like this one better because it also creates a threat, introduces a knight, uh, knight fork. These knights are dancing around like nobody's business. It's, they're dancing like it's 1999. <laughs> knight to f4 threatened with a nasty fork. Uh, but who knows who's better at this point? It's chaotic. Question, what are the chances that if Magnus goes knight g6, we see a repetition with queen g4, knight e5, queen e2, knight g6? Oh, I think <laughs> low odds, but it would be a logical end to the game, Tanya. Uh, a queen and knight no. tango to end, the, uh, end this one. I could see that happening because for Fabiano, if he lets this game continue and he doesn't have this initiative that he was relying on, we're talking about how he is worse long term. The a4 and c3 pawns in any end game, they will be the weakest link on this board. So uh, that repetition is a funny one. We sometimes joke that, oh, these super GMs, they may just find a way to, to get oh the game God. over with. Here it comes, Tanya. Maybe you're the prophet after all. Wow. Hold your breath. If Magnus goes knight e5, you do have a check on g5. Is that a dangerous check? I don't think so. I think that after the check, you can uh, even oh. interpose with the queen. And that's not what Fabi wants. I think he is going to bring his queen back to e2. Armageddon, perhaps. Here we come. But look at the clock times. Fabiano is four and a half minutes up right now. Armageddon, I think, would favor Magnus. Magnus, earlier this year in Norway chess, won seven Armageddons in a row on consecutive days. He's the king of Armageddon chess, Magnus. I don't think Fabi should repeat. But you know who he didn't play in Armageddon? Fabiano Caruana, because <laughs> Fabi beat him head-to-head -head in the classical game. So they did not get that experience against one another, of course. They have played so many times online here. But for Fabi, you don't look at Magnus' time like, oh, he's in severe time. Like, he's Magnus Carlsen. How many times has he won the World Blitz Championship? How many times has he been the World Champion? How many times has he won the World Rapid Championship? He knows that even with minimal time on the clock, Magnus can bring it. And his position, I think, is actually quite in danger of crumbling if he continues this game. And you know who did win the two Armageddon yesterday? It was Fabiano Caruana. So big question right now. Will Fabi get more ambitious? Go ahead with that check on G5, which as David said, can be easily blocked with the queen coming to E7 and perhaps doesn't give a white much. Or will Fabi just let go of the clock situation, play the position on the board. I don't really see another good square for the queen. Retreat to E2. Will we see this repetition happen? And Armageddon. Moment of truth is incoming. Fabiano is reaching out for a piece. Oh, he, he plays on. He doesn't repeat the position. I think Magnus was hoping, uh, maybe even expecting, uh, a repetition of the dance between the queen and knight. Now this attack means that the knight probably won't choose the square that it was last on. If it goes back to g6, then white could land a check on g5, gaining even more time. Uh, where's Magnus going to plant his knight? He goes back to f7 and said, no more checks. Also, more, most importantly, as Tanya pointed out earlier, defending Black's rook in the corner. Uh, everything protected now for Black. And uh, yeah, Robert, White is kind of a bit loose on both flanks right now. White's knight on h7 looks really oddly placed. And those pawns you mentioned on the queen side, long term, horrible, horrible. Uh, horrible structure there. And that's why he pushed the pawn, because I was going to emphasize the point that he would have liked to bring his rook on a1 towards the center, but that pawn a move ago was under threat by both the black queen and the rook. So he goes a5. Does it really carry a big threat? Is white really willing to trade off rooks? White's back rank is actually quite vulnerable. So if that a1 rook is traded for the a8 rook, there could be some back rank checkmate ideas. And you see the eval bar. It is going in Magnus' favor. He is down the clock, but two minutes for Magnus is an eternity to me. Fabiano Caruana sending a clear message to Magnus uh, by declining the repetition that was in his hand that he is playing for more in this game with the white pieces. He feels he's got the pressure on. And it's understandable, you're about four minutes up on the clock, Magnus King not feeling safe, all the tricks and threats down the H file. It is uh, incredible to see Fabi fighting this out for the win. Yeah, that's why he has so many fans. That's why we all love Fabiano. He very rarely takes quick draws. He very rarely takes the uh, peaceful way out, let's say. Uh, he's always up for a fight, no matter what color, no matter what opponent. And um, normally the chess gods reward that type of attitude, that type of play. But this exact position is really still wild. And five minutes against just under two minutes, Oof, it's anyone's game still. But no natural moves for white. I'm starting to worry about that back rank. As soon as you said it, Robert, I'm 
seeing all of these tactics that uh, end up in Black's favor just because the White King is slightly suffocated behind its own pawns. And that's why he slid his king to the side, did Magnus. He's saying, please take my pawn on b6. There may be a back rank checkmating idea. And I also want to point out that look at how uncoordinated, discombobulated White's peas are. There's a knight all the way up there on h7, a rook down there on h3, then a knight across the board on b3, and a rook there in the corner on a Wait, What are these pieces doing? There's no harmony here. And I feel like in these types of positions, it's so easy to overlook a tactic in the back rank problems that I was just talking about. A takes b6, a swap on a a1. White is not losing just yet, but you could see at some point that queen jumping into b5, and then the b1 square, everything is loose. Mm. Ah. And Magnus under two minutes, but looking extremely relaxed right now. He also has these ideas of starting to push the E pawn, the central pawns up the board. This has happened to me I don't know how many times. And I want to ask you guys, where you have just declined a repetition, declined a draw offer, and then you just start regretting it immediately. Yeah, normally one of two things happen. Either you reject the draw offer and your opponent suddenly panics and they think, oh no, they must be believing in their position if they're decl uh, declining a draw. Or, as you say, Tanya, you regret it immediately and suddenly the opponent's like, wait, I was happy with a draw a minute ago, but suddenly I want more. And rook to e1 instead. I don't know, Fabiano, he's giving up a pawn now. Uh, the a pawn, can it be snapped off? I like Tanya's idea, pushing the black pawn to e5 in the near future. Um, it feels like Magnus is the one with options, but still much, much lower on the clock. Fabiano, is he just hustling now? He's going for it. He's saying, if you take my pawn a5, yes, black gains material, but white gains that c5 square access. And Magnus, he said, go for it. Maybe there's queen up one square. Trading off those queens would, of course, be in black's favor. Now he's up a pawn. And it's not just any pawn. It's an outside pass pawn, some of the most dangerous pawns in endgames. I'm worried for Fabiano right now. The time is actually evening. Magnus is gaining some confidence, and he's now gained an extra pass pawn. After winning that A5 pawn, one thing's clear, that Fabi, whatever he needs to do, it has to happen in the middle game. End games are completely busted for black, even if the material, for white, even if the material gets level, even if you win that E6 pawn, the A5 pawn in the end game will decide the result. Fabiano has to go all out in this middle game. Yeah, and that's the problem. He's got the c5 square for his knight, but if the white knight had landed on c5, black could have forced a queen exchange immediately. Queen d d6. That's why Fabiana has to run away. And look at that eval bar. It's been shifting, shifting, and black simply has an extra pawn now. And it's that powerful pawn, so strong against knights, these rook pawns. Yeah, it's all going wrong for Fabiano right now. And this queen retreat, it's not a go-in, go-all-out kind of move. It, it does signal that things have gone wrong for Fabi. They certainly have. He is retreating to stop that runaway passer. He couldn't play his knight jump forward because a queen trade would have been forced. He can't afford that. And it's not like, and I want to give a quick shout out to Lazovic against Abu Sitarov. Dennis Lazovic up a pawn trying to press in the end game. Magnus, he's up a pawn, but there's so many pieces left on this board. He goes e5. The engine reacts at first saying, oh, it's going back towards the middle. But then it, with more depth, it realizes black is still in charge. And why not push those pawns in the center? Everything in this position is defended for black. Every single piece, save that rook uh, on a8, next to the king over there, is defended, so he's pushing his pawns forward. Magnus Carlsen up a pawn, but with a minute on the clock, Fabiano's knights will be jumping in, uh, the queenside knight coming on to c5. The kingside knight can come to g5 in certain positions, creating some tactical ideas against that rook on h8. Yes, Magnus with the upper hand, but with just a minute on the clock and all the knights on the board, it's still a game for all three results. Yeah, still a game and uh, great chess quality here, but also great air quality out there in Toronto, uh, as we see just below, um, just at the bottom of your screens there. Uh, CO2 levels, uh, not ideal, <laughs> but uh, everything else looking perfect. Great conditions for the players, and that's why they're all bringing the best chess right now. It says air quality is fair. What would be a fair result in this game, Robert? Well, for Fabiano, I think a decisive game would be the fair result. He's the one who chose to play on. I don't know in what direction, but when you make that choice, that was a big moment. He could have forced the draw more or less by repetition. He chose to play on. He may pay the price. Look at the clock. It's evening up here, and that's really bad news for Fabi because I feel like Magnus' moves are easier to play. Fabi just retreated his queen backwards. He doesn't have an, a natural follow-up. The knight jump to c5 no longer comes with a threat against a pawn. I think that Fabi's running out of steam, running out of options, and, well, he may be running out of time. Yeah, he's put the pressure on his own back here. Uh, the burden is on white to do something. You're simply material down. You have no coordination. I think it's the lack of coordination that's really killing him here. Um, it's the hope that's killing him as well, that hope of trying to win, trying to play on, and rejecting that draw. I just don't see any ideas at all. Black's central pawns, Black's A pawn, they're just marching, and 
Okay, the rook lands back where it came from on a1. It was just here two moves ago. Indecision from Fabiano. He's changing his mind. He's regretting his uh, life choices. And I don't see any reason for Magnus not to push that pawn, push the black a pawn. You can move the black queen as well to b5 to protect it. Everything's turning. It's just collapsing uh, move by move. And the one hope is still the clock. Magnus uncharacteristically taking a long time here. He's already gained the advantage. He's done the hard work. And normally he's so good at stabilizing. Okay, he plays one of the best moves, clearly. Uh, queen to b5, but 30 seconds. That was half his time he spent on that one turn. You give Magnus, like, one opportunity, just one chance, and he's just all over the game. Uh, Fabi declining that repetition. Magnus gets the a5 pawn, gets that e pawn rolling, and now the queen is coming out, and it's him who's putting pressure on white's pieces right now. Both players under one minute. It's going to take a miracle for Fabi to survive this. And it's easier for us. We have the evaluation bar. We see what the trajectory of the game is. I don't think Fabi understood uh, some of the problems he would face, that their danger would arise this quickly. And you see that knight, it was protecting the rook. It needed to be there. Now it hops towards the center into d6. It's going to jump forward some more. And look at Fabi, move after move. He's retreating pieces as Magnus. He presses forward. There are no issues in Black's camp. This is looking really tough for Fabiano. The last few moves, Fabi has been making retreating moves one after the other while all of Magnus' pieces are coming into uh, Fabi camp here. The a pawn is going to tie down that rook on a1. Meanwhile, the other rook on h3 and the knight on h7 have been stuck there forever, not able to create the tactical tricks that Fabi was relying on, and that is desperation. Yep, desperation g4. He had to do something, uh, Fabiano. He was just stuck. Uh, you cannot just wait for your opponent to slowly improve and kind of get their pieces to ideal squares and slowly crush you. Uh, now the white king is eternally weak. The whole idea was to kick back the black knights and go for black central pawns, but this is a beautiful outpost. Black's knight on c4 where it's just landed, not just defending the center, but supporting the advance of that a pawn. Again, he's just been playing with offside pieces. That white knight on h7, it grabbed a pawn, but it's been stuck on that square, that useless square, for 10, 15 moves now. And there's not even a check against the black king. It's safely situated on c8. He goes, finally moves one of his knights. Now he can move the other. But the knights are superfluous here. They're stepping on each other's toes. And that a pawn, it's about to become a queen. I wonder if queen b2, is he, there it's played. He is giving up a rook with check in this position because he will get a new queen. Wow, that is beautiful, Robert. Let's just show that variation. If the queens had been exchanged, then Magnus Carlsen would have won on the spot with a beautiful tactic here. Queen to b2 would have allowed a simple rook sacrifice. This is a check. The king can move actually in either direction, but king to d7 and uh, no way to prevent a pawn from promoting uh, to a queen. This would have been deadly. Let's catch up with the current position. Queen still on the board here, of course, but look at this pawn on a2. It will decide the game before too long. White still dancing around uh, without any purpose as Magnus tries to land the killer blow. And the rook comes up just to protect everything. All of Magnus's pieces are doing something here. And now files are opening in front of Fabi's king. So he stole a pawn, but he opened a file. So the F file is open, the G file as well. And maybe this knight on e7 can go, oh, oh, oh queen b1 oh, instead. That is stunning. Take my queen and give me a new one, please. And on the way, give your rook as well. And Fabi panicking there. Doesn't make his move in time. Uh, he just gives up. He resigns. What happened there? Did he run out of time? It looks well, like his clock is on zero, Tanya. He ran out of time, but it was a lost position anyway. Busted for Fabi. Magnus Carlsen. He plays, he wins. And there he takes his match against the world number two without needing an Armageddon. What a game from Magnus Carlsen. And as you've said on previous days, David, when you poke the bear, sometimes you unleash the bear. And Magnus Carlsen, he leapt all over Fabi's position. He takes game two. He takes the match. He's the perfect three out of three. Magnus Carlsen will, of course, be back on the board as he will play against Hikaru in uh, the upcoming. Quite a day it is for him. Starts with Fabi, takes him down, and now he will fight it out against Hikaru Nakamura. And this match is still on as Wesley So is fighting to try and take it into the Armageddon. And the players are blitzing out their moves, David. Uh, wow, Wesley, two pawns up. 
Yeah, Wesley has worked his magic here, his endgame magic, because last we left it, White was in control. White had full domination, and now Wesley simply converting. He's got two extra pawns. He's forced Knights off the board, and there and we what? see a handshake. And that's what happens with Wesley So. He is often criticized for making draws, but he had to win, and he gets the job done. Wesley So wins with the black pieces on demand against Maxime vacher le -Grave, and Toronto continues to be magical for Wesley So. Wesley So now writing down his Armageddon bid as he makes his comeback win there. Both of them take a little bit of a pause before giving their bids in. This one goes into Armageddon. We still have one more game remaining as Danis Lazovic is fighting it out against Nordebeck Abdusatro, but Maxime is not happy. He knew that he had it in his hand, completely in control with the white pieces, but Wesley does Wesley things and uh, strikes back. It continues to be quite the run for him. Yeah, quite the run and just, uh, yeah, instructive endgame play. That's uh, a reason never to panic if you're uh, playing as black in these must-win situations. In the meantime, both players with interest rushing over to the other game that's still in progress. And uh, Danis Lazovic against Abdus Satorov, also a rookie game and also black with two connected pass pawns. Abdus Satorov looks like he should be winning this game. Oh my gosh, Dennis Lazarek was up a pawn for the majority of this game. Nordebeck could only draw, that was the best bet. But no, he has turned it around because he is the most determined player on the planet. He doesn't care who he's facing, and you can see that look on Dennis's face. He can't believe what's transpired. Yeah, he kept pushing and pushing, and it took a risk to many, Dennis Lazarek. And this might be his third unlucky defeat in a match in a rook end game. And uh, lessons for the youngster, but Abdus Satarov, can he finish it off? We'd love to get a look at the clock to get an idea. Not a bad. Looks like he's panicking right now. He's got the H and G connected passes, but hasn't made progress on them. And there we have it. It is Dennis Lazowick who's playing on seconds and not a bad with enough time on the clock. Wow, and a drawn position yet again. I think Abdus Satorov was completely winning, but now the Black King is stuck. Anytime the Black King moves, it will be checked by the White Rook or the White Rook will go behind the G pawn and uh, suddenly Black cannot make progress. Oh my goodness, how instructive is this? You have the wrong pawn remaining. Rook pawns are really bad in Rook endgames without other material and King and Pawn games. You have to take this A7 pawn. Bl Black's G6 pawn will come off the board, and he this is just a dead draw now. He's wow. just repeating. Is he even going to try? You take A7, G6, and he says no. He knows this is uh, done. It is a draw. Danis Lazovic secures a draw from a lost position, but he did have the upper hand in the beginning. Yeah, I feel like that's a fair result because with best play, Nodirbeck was proving he could make a draw. Somehow, some way, Dennis Lazarek pushed too hard because he's showing that he's also a fighter. It's not just Nodirbeck, and he was losing towards the stretch, down the stretch there. He survives. He takes it to Armageddon. You got to be excited for him. It's his first Armageddon. It is. Uh, we've got two Armageddons on our hands right now with Danis Lazovic, Nodebeck putting in their bids. Really exciting stuff. And Danis just turns around. He says, no peeking there. Well, actually, make it easier to peek because we can almost <laughs> see his bid. Uh, so for Nodebeck, he's strategizing. He hasn't written anything down yet. And for Dennis, well, I'm curious just how much time he'll put on that board. Yeah. Wow. And the players, uh, it is Nodebeck uh, who is thinking more on the bid. Dennis, the first one to write down the time that he's bidding for. Nodebeck still very indecisive. Yeah, both players, uh, both fast, both young. One of them's going to get off the scoreboard. Remember, they need to avoid finishing in the bottom two in the round robin to stay alive in the tournament. So this next Armageddon for them is crucial. They both need to win. And uh, therefore, this bid gains in importance. It's so important at this stage not to go 0-3 because if, not if, when one of these players wins this match, suddenly you're right back in the thick of things. You have to remind everybody that while the top two sail through to the semifinals, three through six play a survival stage to see which other two join the already qualified semifinalists. So if you're one win match win out of three, now all of a sudden you're tied with a bunch of people, you're feeling much better about your chances. Yeah, because the bottom two just get eliminated. It's the end of the road in Toronto, so it's so important to start climbing up the leaderboard. And Danis Lazovic, he's just such 17 years old. He is the underdog. He's got a cross on his back and this is his chance to show everyone that he does belong in Toronto in this tournament as he will be playing the Armageddon against the Nordebeck Abdusatrov and it's not the only one as we see there. Uh, Maxime Vacher le -Grave, Wesley So also go into the Armageddon. Meanwhile, Magnus Carlsen 
Fabi did have the opportunity to take it to repetition, but declining that, it was all Magnus Carlsen. David, too many big moments to pick from. What was your big takeaway? Yeah, I just want to highlight one game we didn't get to pay too much attention to, and that was Hikaru Nakamura getting his second win of the day, closing out that match victory against Alareza Ferruja. And he did it in style, Hikaru, in uh, really trademark style here. Uh, it is a chaotic position. Hikaru has the black pieces, and he found the clear-cut way to an advantage that actually most of us would find difficult in this position. White's bishop is attacked, it is pinned, the knight is attacked, but Hikaru calmly just traded off the queens. He knows a draw is enough, but he wanted more. And in this position, black, currently a piece up, had to decide uh, what to do after this knight, which was attacked, jumped forward to b6. And Hikaru actually caught this knight in a net after just moving his rook, the beautiful move, the calm move, rook to d8, the knight is trapped on b6. This is beautiful. No way to extricate this piece. And as we saw a few moves later, a few moves down the line, rook to d6, rounded up this knight, and Hikaru did not look back. In the final position, if we fast forward, he actually found a really beautiful checkmate as well uh, in this position. The white king has just moved to h4, and after knight takes f5, check, the king finds itself pinned. If it steps forward, this would have ended the game. Bishop e8, checkmate. Hikaru, classy game from start to finish. Just amazing stuff by Hikaru Nakamura. A wounded beast is a dangerous beast, and that's what uh, Hikaru showed in his uh, match today against uh, Ali Reza. And of course, you've got two big Armageddons coming up. But before that, Twitch subscribers, stay with us as Toronto will be bringing in all the action after this break uh, of round two, the Armageddon start. But right now, it's time for the Champions Chess Tour trivia for our Twitch subscribers. Be the first to tweet the correct answer and make sure to tag Champ Chess Tour and use the hashtag CCD Finals. For three months of the Diamond membership, we'll be back with the Armageddon. Chess Kid is going live and in person at the Chess Kid National Festival. Bring the whole family. Meet your favorite chess masters. Solve puzzles. Play K to five tournaments. Compete for the Chess Kid National Championship title and so much more. This festival is surely one for the books from February 16th to 19th, 2024, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Book your seats now before they're gone. Denis Lazovic has been the youngest contender in Division One this season on the Champions Chess Tour. The now 17-year-old, who got his GM title only last year, has proven that age and experience is no bar to excellence. Lazovic won Division 2 in the AIM Chess Rapid to qualify to Division 1 in the Julius Baer Generation Cup. He knocked out both Wesley So and Nodibek Abdusatarov on his way to the losers' final, eventually losing a close match with Alariza Ferruja. This looks like it's suddenly winning. Black cannot improve his position. White can, meanwhile. 
and uh, simple plan, as you say, Tanya. The White King will eventually cross over. It's not going to be cut off forever. Dennis Lazowick takes down Wesley So. Wesley is out of the tournament. This is an incredible technique by uh, Dennis Lazowick. It's going to be King versus King in the end. The it's Black Rook's going to give, up, give itself up for the pawn. And there it is. Dennis Lazowick takes down. Nordebeck Abdul Satro is okay, yeah. on the board. <laughs> this is... Oh, I'm really happy to see this. That is it. Yeah, unbelievable. Unbelievable chess here, unfortunately, for Dennis Lazowick. After a fantastic run and a big fight, being so close to victory, a couple of inaccuracies, and it is the end of the road for the 16-year-old. Banking 175 points throughout the season has given Lazovic a golden ticket to the Tour Finals. Can the teenager, known especially for his strength in online chess, cause more upsets when the 2023 season concludes over the board in Toronto? With all the chess happening in Toronto, find your local group or take the lead at meetup.com slash chess and grow the community. And for now, we're going to Kaya, who is on the ground with Wesley So and Maxime Vasher Legrave, and they're about to reveal their bids. This is so exciting, you guys. We are now going to reveal the Armageddon bids for Wesley So and Maxim Bachelle Grau. I'm going to count to three. And when I uh, hit three, you guys turn your boards and we will see what's going to happen. So one, two, three. There it is. So Wesley So bids 857. Is that 57, Maxim? 952. Wesley, you go very low here. What's the thought behind yeah, that bid? Probably made a big mistake. I mean, most players bid nine minutes and 30 seconds. So I'm the first one to bid low, so we'll see if it. All Probably right. a big mistake, but we'll see. We'll play with the black pieces. Uh, any any thoughts here, Maxim? Um, you know, it just three matches for Armageddon. We'll see how it goes. You guys, uh, I'll let you go. Uh, yeah, I, get... wanna, I wanna get. I wanna get the players to start bidding low, so I started under nine minutes. Starting a trend here, Wesley. Yeah. Well, this is gonna be an exciting game. Best of luck to both of you. I'm gonna let you go. Prepare. Thank you. Back to you guys. Wow, Wesley's so disappointed with his bid. Yeah, you saw it on his face at the end there. He's like, why did I do that? I think it's because he won with the black pieces in that second game. He's feeling that rhythm, but he did go under nine minutes. Which over the board is not a lot of time. Yeah, online, which we have seen throughout this entire season, eight minutes 57 would be a good bid. But you saw the immediate reaction. I think uh, sometimes you make a move, you realize it's a blunder. That's exactly what happened with Wesley So's bid there. Did you think Wesley just gave too much away with Maxime? He just looked so confident after seeing that Wesley reaction. Yeah, but as James calls him, flexly so. <laughs> I think that Wesley, he could be playing some tricks himself. I know he might be disappointed, but he also could be letting Maxime think that's the case. Wesley is a super quick player. He won the Fisher Random World Championship. We know that he has what it takes to win the Global Championship. So don't count Wesley out despite that reaction. I think he has very good chances here and the soul solid Wesley needs only a draw with the black pieces it is going to be an exciting one and that's not the only Armageddon coming up it is also the two youngsters who will be taking it to the fierce sudden death not a back up to such and Dennis Lazowick here are their bids all right we're gonna have another Armageddon bid coming in here so you guys I'm gonna count to three and when I hit three you guys turn your boards towards the camera so here we go one two three Let's see the bids. So I have an order back. 10.58 for black and 
10 minutes. That means you're going to play with the black pieces. How do you feel about winning the bid, Dennis? I, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see, we'll see. And you go quite high there, Norbeck. So you're happy with playing with the white pieces? Yeah. Uh, after yesterday, uh, yesterday's experience, I, I, I choose to play with, uh, with white. <laughs> Another exciting Armageddon coming up. Thank you guys for joining and best of luck. Back to you guys. Wow, Nodebeck alluding there to his Armageddon against Magnus Carlsen, which he did lose. And he says he's happy with the white pieces. Danis Lazowick, 10 minutes. That's quite a smart bid by the 17-year-old. Yeah, it seemed like both players are happy there because for Dennis, he bid low, so he wanted black. But Nodebeck said, I actually wanted white heading into this game. He gets what he asked for. Yeah, it's so hard to pick a favorite. Both players, they've been kind of trading blow for blow here. And Dennis Lazovic, if he can maintain the level he's shown so far today, yeah. I think he actually choosing black there will be a masterstroke. But the games are ready to go. To Armageddon's, we've got big action coming up. The players playing with the white pieces have to win. Black gets result odds and it is going to be handshakes and we will be underway. Here we go. It's a pawn push. It's E4 from Abdu Satorov. And wow, G3, which has really become fashionable today. Ferruja employing something very similar against Nakamura earlier in uh, the round. And our friend Daniel Naroditsky often plays openings like this online. So uh, you know, when you see this opening, I think, oh, we're playing online. Then I remember it's in person, and that's a different feel for these positions. You have to play quickly, and without any increment until move 60, these players have to move at a lightning pace, especially those with the black pieces. But I think Dennis has done a good job stabilizing, defending his center. There's no tension at the moment. I think that he's escaped the opening, and he should be on happy feet right now. Yeah, step one when you're black in an Armageddon is don't react too slowly to a surprise. And clearly, he cannot have predicted this opening. I don't think uh, I've ever seen Abdu Satorov employ this opening before, but Denis Lazovic, yeah, reacting instantly and continues to do so. Brings his bishop out now after a trade of knights. This is a pin. And uh, yeah, very solid position for black. No real weaknesses. Denis is the underdog for Nodebeck. He has to win this game. He's got to be the one feeling the pressure more right now. The pressure is definitely on Nodebeck because I also feel like going through those two games, Dennis has played the better between these two. And for Nodebeck, everyone in this field is looking at Dennis. That's the person that I have to beat at minimum. Otherwise, there's no chance for me. And Dennis is like, hey, I'm a really strong grandmaster. Look at my results over the board in the World Rapid and Blitz a year ago. He plays the quiet move, Rook B8, defending his pawn, not opening up the full length of that light square diagonal. The Fianchetto Bishop on G2 still has a ways to go. I think he's handled this perfectly thus far, and we'll see how Nordebeck continues to press. Yeah, he's already eaten into that time advantage almost by a minute uh, that Abdu Satoru started this game with. Still a very level position, actually a relatively well-known type of position, and uh, we'll check back in on this one later. But impressive start by Lazovic as he lashes out with F5, not just content to play for a draw, playing active, uh, objectively strong chess instead. All right, this one is going to be a fun, fun battle. That's clear from the position that we have. And another fun Armageddon is on. Uh, Maxime vacher Legrave against Wesley So. Also a non-standard outcome from the opening. And it is Maxime who has to win with the white pieces. Wesley needs only a draw. And what do we make of this position? I haven't seen this before. Chaos. Look at the pawns. Both sides have six of them, but they're in different locations. Black has B7 and C7 pawns. White has those pawns in the center. Now, you would think that has to favor the player with central pawns. We typically say control the center. But Black will do that with his minor pieces. Also, the white king on G one without its Fianchetto bishop sitting in front of it, that can be dangerous. So for those of you thinking, let me take that knight on c6 with my bishop, ruin black's pawn structure, think again. You might find your king in a world of hurt. Yeah, let's just show that, Robert, because it looks like strategically you're winning here. This is just a horrible pawn structure uh, for black, but more importantly, it's all about this square. Uh, bishop will park itself there and white's king. I mean, look at the white pieces. It's basically Fisher random chess and uh, uh, you don't have any activity at all. Yeah, simply this would be disastrous. Instead, he pushes forward E3 and he's going to try and build a pawn center. It's essentially uh, these middle pawns against the flank pawns. Black's pawns are maybe harder to push. Uh, personally, I prefer white's chances. And uh, still with a six minute advantage on the clock, looks like a opening success for Maxime Vachel Le Graf. He's got a complex position and uh, Wesley still needs to find some stability. He moves his knight into the center. Asking for the pawn to push forward to d4 with gain of time. <coughs> bit odd, that one, I must say. A bit mysterious. 
He cleared his throat. He said, come again. <laughs> I think that Wesley actually might be in some semblance of, I don't want to say pure preparation, but he has understanding of this position because knight e5 is not a move you play, I feel like, without a natural feel for the position. d4 is automatic, but d4 doesn't actually threaten the knight on e5. There's a pin. So we'll, there he goes. He pushes with c5, exploding that pin. Push your pawn to d5. Get a pass pawn in the center. That's great. But you also hand me a pass pawn along c file. <laughs> and we saw Maxime in that first game between these two use a pass c pawn to his uh, success. And we'll see if Wesley can do the same. And I'm just wondering, did Maxime forget about this idea of c5 or that his queen was pinned? Because suddenly, you've got questions to answer. You don't want to create a weakness in the center of the board with the trades that will happen on d4. Uh, Maxime does slow down. I'm still thinking about Wesley's reaction at the start about his bid, starting with about eight and a half minutes, but with the draw odds. Do you think he's happy with the last few moves, getting c5 in and feeling more pleased? Now the knight is attacked. Yeah, I think Wesley will be thrilled that he's trading off pawns. At least it's clearer what black should be doing now. Uh, the more pawns pieces that disappear, the clearer uh, things become. But... Yeah, Maxime, he did react slightly. I'm trying to read maybe too much into the body language. But uh, <laughs> suddenly, after C5 was played, he's put his hand on his face. Uh, definitely a missed one there. And uh, Wesley not actually clarifying the tension in the centre. First, planting his knight on a nice outpost, threatening to remove white start square bishop, a very important piece. But not just threatening that. If you slide your bishop back to the corner, Ooh. the knight goes to D2 with a fork of those two rooks. I have not seen a tactic like this at this early of a stage. But knight D2 is a threat, and... I guess Maxime's allowing. Can you take on d4 first and then follow with knight to d2? Looks that way. Why not? This is a nasty fork. Just to highlight your uh, point there, Robert, and your winning material. He plays it. This must have been missed by Vasily Grav. Such a rare pattern. And you, you see Maxime, I mean, he hasn't reacted at all, but I do think he's flummoxed. He's like, what just happened here? And now it's going to be extra material for black. A big blind spot there, a huge miss. Knight d2 coming in. Um, Wesley about to win material, needing only a draw. Where does Maxime find his initiative for this exchange? Wow, it's crazy. The evaluation bar is still planted in the middle of the, uh, in the center there. It still says 0.0, .0 level, but it is onus on Maxime Vashley Graf. Burdens on him to create some play. He activates his rook. Very clever move. And after Knight takes rook, will he recapture? No, he hits the Black Queen. Wow. And suddenly a dilemma for Wesley. So what to do with the Black Queen? Because you have to keep your bishop protected. The Black Dark Squared Bishop as well, slightly vulnerable. And uh, Black's Knight is trapped. You can take that at will uh, whenever convenient. First, though, you need to decide what to do. Maxime, remember, he needs to win. He cannot yeah. just repeat with his rook. And David, that was such a good option. If you go rook c5, black would have no option but to repeat in this position. But that just works to perfection for Wesley. So Maxime has to fight for more, which means actually getting into a worse position right now. The good news for Wesley, I will, uh, excuse me, for Maxime, I will say. The good news for Wesley is up material. The good news for Maxime is that he has a lot of pressure, at least a lot of pieces aiming towards that black king. He can't afford to make a draw. That's the bad news. But that bishop on d4 in particular, if he can aim at that g7 square another time, he will have some chances. And actually, the eval bar is still sitting in the middle over <coughs> here, despite that extra material for black. Yeah, and uh, okay, Maxime needs to find an attack. First, he hits that black queen. She is rather awkwardly placed, and a bit of indecision there for the first time, Wesley so. And uh, the queen is dancing around, finding a safe square for now, because she is stared down by white's light squared bishop. White's knight surely is going to move in the next few turns. Uh, you cannot right now, because black's... Uh, queen is hitting your dark squared bishop in the center, the bishop on e5. It's just hanging in the air for both sides, their pieces right now. And a queen a1 for white, that speaks to me. Throw that lady in the corner. Nobody puts baby in the corner except for Maxime when he's aiming towards the black king on g8. And that look, he plays it. It looks really scary all of a sudden because if I can steal that pawn in front of your king, I may land a mating attack. And if you push your pawn to f6 to blunt that diagonal, I might be sacrificing away. You see the eval bar going up and up. And I think that black's king is just devastated, lacking material in front of it. And you know, maybe the move order is something we can work on. But Maxime has the time to calculate it. Oh. Maxime Vachel Legrave and his exchange sacrifice, I want to call it now, and not a blunder anymore with the way he's managed to create play against Black King, the Queen and the Bishop lined up. A huge threat on the board. Wesley plays F6. This is a big moment. Will we see Maxime go for the line that you pointed out? Is he going to sacrifice more material here? It looks so tempting. 
Either way, there are options here. You don't need to sacrifice. You can keep the tension. You can retreat your bishop. But uh, there we go. The, we get a helping hand from Stockfish uh, from the computer just below at the bottom of our screens there. Pawn to a4 gives white a decisive advantage over plus two. That must be because the black queen, she's actually almost trapped. It's the only move that gives white the advantage. Everything else is hovering towards the middle. But a4, the point is to kick the queen away from its sights of that bishop on e5. Because white would love nothing more than to move the knight and expose the bishop on f1 to that queen on b5. But after a4, you force that queen to an awkward square. And only then will you move your knight. It's such a big opportunity. Huge moment here for Maxime Brochard-Legrave. He was the first to blunder. But they often say it's not the first mistake in chess that often tells the tale. It's who makes the last one. Nicely put there, Robert. And for Maxime, it is the moment that you want to slow down and look at your options. It is without a doubt that he's thinking about the sacrifice on f6, but Black's queen is ideally placed to come to defense uh, after bishop takes pawn. David, I think you can just recapture the bishop. White jumps in with the queen, and Black's queen will land on f5, and it just feels that white will not have enough power play. He has gone for it. He's gone for it, but as you say, queen to f5 holds everything together. Maxime missed a winning opportunity. The Black queen was actually trapped. Uh, that variation... Pushing the pawn to a4 would have won material, but this one instead allows the black queen to defend, and I think he's banking on queen takes pawn here with an ongoing attack. Black's king is naked, it's just forgot to get dressed this morning, it has no shelter around it, but black is a whole rook up and should survive. The black bishop, for example, can come into c3 and back to defend. So Ma Maxime here, he's bluffing, five minutes on the clock for Wesley, so if he finds bishop to c3, I think he's got an advantage, and he reached towards a piece there. Which piece was he going for? He needs to slow down as well. This is a critical moment. He needs to slow down, but I'm looking at his clock now dipping under five minutes and it's only moved 27. So the decisions don't look too easy even after Bishop Safety. Great find, great shout out by you, David. Uh, that does shield the Black King, but White has three pawns for the sacrificed Rook. There are four pawns on the King side. That Knight can come into F4, Bishop to D, things like that. I just feel like Wesley has a few things to figure out and they're not always gonna be that easy. Yeah, and Robert, I am thinking about a tournament that you and I called on, the Tata Steel Chess India, where Maxime was down an entire rook, very reminiscent of this one, against Vidit Gujarati. And he just created magic out of nowhere, an attack on his opponent's king, and that's what he's aiming for right now. If Wesley defends accurately, he's winning. But how easy is it to defend accurately in these kind of positions with four minutes on the clock and no increment? He's such a good defender. That's the thing. Wesley so Wesley solid. And look at this. Instantly reacts to a tricky move. Pawn to e4 was a bit of a trap. But uh, the queen drops back, gaining time, bullying away the white queen. Queen exchange, and it's game over. Black's extra rook will count. Suddenly, Maxime has to retreat. And as soon as you start retreating, you lose all momentum, lose all attack. And Black's rook is actually going to come to d8, trade off white's active rook. I do fear there are one or two traps, but uh, I do fear for Maxime if Wesley finds an accurate uh, kind of reply on the, just the next two or three moves. And in a way, there's something ironic about the fact that the queen on h6, which looks menacing in most attacking positions, it was actually kind of trapped over there. And that's why Maxime played the move e4 so his queen could slide back. Unfortunately, if he does slide back with the queen, as you mentioned, the rook can come into play, start offering some trades. And while well, the trade is now fully offered, that bishop on f6 wow. is loose. So, Wow, what? look at Wesley. He's like... I got this, you take my bishop, I get a new queen. Thank you, that's a good trade for me. Wow, he literally doesn't care about material here. Uh, suddenly, is it level material on the board? But it's all about that A-pawn, as you mentioned, Robert, that uh, potential future queen. Wow. Such a practical decision there by Wesley. So trading off, giving back some material, but going into a safe endgame. And let's not forget, Wesley needs only a draw with no attack against the king. Maxime's only hope is to start pushing the H-pawn as quickly as he, as he, as he can but it's also the black A-pawn that is about to advance, and it just feels like black's pieces will be able to stop the H-pawn. That bishop from A2 can go back to G8, defending the H7 square. Yeah, and we're going to see this race, and, okay, he drops back, attacking the white rook instead. The black pawn is now three squares away from touchdown, uh, from promotion. Okay, what does white do? Does white try to pin this bishop? He needs to move his rook. There we go, landing on the F-file. A threat. White wants to play bishop to C4 next move. The black bishop is pinned. So still not over. Still all three results possible. And look at Wesley. He slides his king out of that pin. Now he's ready to push his pawn. And I think what White is going to have to do is bring the rook to a passive square and sitting in front of the passer. And then there's a second one that Black will eventually push. I just think that Wesley has this one completely under control. I'm looking at the move number 36. He's got four minutes on his clock. And the position actually is quite simple for him to play. 
Yeah, he's so good at just keeping things simple, keeping control, uh, kind of minimizing tactics, Wesley. So um, there was that mess for a while, but sudden, suddenly, as soon as he stabilized, I mean, it's been straightforward. And Rook to e7, that is calm. I would have been just itching to push the pawn, throwing it forward. But why calculate when you can uh, stabilize like this? And the problem is Black's King is well within touching distance of the white h-pawn. No other real counterplay. Did you see Wesley just grab another piece? He's doing that chess player thing where you're nervously fiddling with material, but he's also taking all the material he's up. He's like, oh, there's that rook that you don't have. I've got two of those. And let me get a queen while we're at it because I'm going to get a new one. An h6 check. That's a single check. His king is safely tucked away in the corner now. No promotion for white, but I do think that there's one coming soon for black. Yeah, white's bishop just unable to join the action. He's basically playing without that piece and... Um, yeah, simple plan for black, nothing to do for white, and the time advantage slipping away. Wesley, this has been a masterclass, just this uh, kind of defensive effort from him, taking the sting out of white's, white's fun, white's play. I wonder if the chess world has made a mistake. We know Magnus Carlsen, the best player in the world, but maybe Wesley so in Toronto is the best player in the world. <laughs> he seems unstoppable at this stage. And look at Maxime going for tactics, and Wesley says, I'm not taking your free pieces. I'm just going to push this pawn to the other side. But Wesley so continues to thrive in Toronto. There's something about the Canadian air that makes him play his best possible chess and also brings up the combative nature that we often see dormant in him. He often is a bit more solid, but now he's spectacular. Wow, look at the tricks from Maxime Vashilagrav. Bishop to a2, the bishop's still attacked, but if you take it, there's a knight fork. White would land a knight on g6 with a check, and probably still winning for black, but uh, at least you have to think twice. I think you can do it. I think you can take this bishop. He does it, nice. because at the end, he's going to play bishop to b3 to block the rook. The Oh, he goes to f7. I guess it's going to be winning in this manner as well. But he also, for you know, to be fancy, could play bishop b3. The rook could not stop the pass pawn. The A2 pawn is coming up anyway. Wesley So on the brink of victory of this one. Still, Maxime, a very, very tricky player. You've got to sort these last-minute problems. The bishop is attacked. Can he actually ignore it? Can he go for A2 or it's too dangerous? You take on F7. Do you want to get into those calculations? Wesley's going down. He goes for A2. Yeah. Who needs bishops <laughs> when you can get a new queen? And uh, Black's king can survive all on its own. A draw does favor Wesley as well. Is he asking for the move, move number? number? He because did. it's a one second increment once the players reach move 60 and they are allowed to ask the arbiter. Wesley calmly promotes to a queen. I don't even think he needs uh, move 60 here. He's got three minutes. I'm surprised <laughs> he's uh, asking about the move number. Uh, even if there weren't any increment, I think he'd be pretty confident of converting this advantage. And uh, yeah. What to play? Queen to e5, centralize. What can as, be more natural? As long as you don't walk into some kind of knight fork, which happens online all the time, I think players, they see the board differently when they're over the board here. <coughs> and he goes rook e8, so centralization with the rook instead of the queen. And here, as long as he doesn't blunder into a critical fork or a checkmate, uh, he can even make a draw at any moment. And I think there was a checkmate. If you go king to g5, you step it up. Uh, there is a pawn check, a rook check. And so there are dangers with the rook and knight. And uh, Maxime continues to fight. Yeah, knights are tricky. <laughs> and all the pawns connect. They defend each other. Ooh, Ooh. bit of a decision there. He drops his queen back. And suddenly, white can force a draw with just a bunch of rook checks. No way to evade the perpetual <laughs> check suddenly. But that's good for Wesley. Exactly. And that's the nature of Armageddon. A draw is a win for black. So Wesley doesn't need to end the game by delivering a checkmate, he can end the game with the draw. And I think that White, you know, Maxime knows that he has it, but he can't actually go for it because then he loses the match anyway. Maxime down a hole, Queen cannot go for a draw. That is a heartbreaking. And it almost feels that Wesley set this position up. He put that Rook to E8 to take away all the escape squares of the King, inviting a perpetual... Oh, 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 my goodness. Oh, that would have blundered and lost. He walked into that Knight A6. He was about to walk into it and finds it in the last moment. Is Wesley panicking? What is happening right now? That was going to be an unbelievable, uncharacteristic blunder from Wesley. So now he can just do the repetition thing, but he almost blundered a knight fork, which would have dropped his queen, and dropping the queen for a knight in this position with whites up three pawns, that would have been an immediate win for Maxime. He is human. He does get nervous, Wesley, so maybe he was just teasing his opponent there. He kept his hand on the piece, so the move was not completed. He was able to move it to a different square. If he had let go, that would have changed the game. Maxime would have won on the spot with a knight fork, but wow, what a tense moment that was. 
And uh, he's back to having things under control. Now he gives a check from behind. The White King, though, marching up the board. I look at the way Maxime just continues to play this position. He's down a queen. And he's just marched up the board with his own king. He's trying to set up some kind of mating patterns, dreaming for it. And Wesley just panicking. He's so nervy right now. Yeah, but now he can just take this knight on f5, so he'll never get checkmated, and he can deliver a ton of checks with his queen. So I feel like for Wesley, he's about to get checkmated. If that knight goes to h6 right next to the king, that's actually a checkmating pattern, and he goes and gives a check with his queen, so a good decision. Uh, he has many options here, but I would probably just snag that knight with my rook and then just try to make a draw after that. Yeah, he's still in control. Just get rid of that knight, eradicate all prospect of a knight fork, of a blunder, and also look at the counter. Move 60. They do gain <coughs> increments. He's uh, flexing here, flex Liso, with the tactics. He thought there was another knight fork. Robert. I did, because there is a knight fork. Knight h6 check. You might think, oh my gosh, Wesley blundered his rook, but the queen will sacrifice for the knight before the rook wins the free white rook. And if you have to back up if you're Maxime, now it's at long last, Wesley is finally safe, and it's the white king that is going to be hunted down. The queen is coming on to g6 with a check and another million checks to be followed. Uh, Wesley so he is very close to wrapping this one up. It's just amazing resistance and play by Maxime. I never thought I'd say this, but it looks like even at the very best, the top level in the chess world, it's not easy to win a queen up. Yeah, I mean, you can see how experienced, how practical uh, what Maxime is with his play. Uh, just posing problems despite his lack of a queen. But this one ultimately should still be winning for Wesley, with the increment especially. And, uh, okay, it goes on. It goes on, David. Uh, just amazing. He can jump in with the queen, uh, a check to f2, but that just invites White's king forward. King g5, there are no checks. Yeah, he's found a formation, a setup he's happy with, Wesley. So, and why break from uh, your comfort zone? The queen back, forth, back, forth. It's up to White. The pressure's on White here to actually do something. And it's just impossible to do so, unfortunately. No way forward. It is heartbreaking uh, for Maxime, who really did try to do everything in this game uh, with White. A must-win game with White in the Armageddon. And now it is, uh, that is, that looks like pretty much about to be the end. Maxime continues to fight. King to H4, no checks. No checks, but oh, I have a feeling someone's going to blunder. Oh I mean, we nearly gosh. saw it once, right? <laughs> but it, <laughs> it feels so difficult for Black to blunder this away. Unless you let that G-pawn start running up the board, and that queen will always have checks to deliver against the white king. But now if you check on F2, maybe the king goes up to G5, and suddenly we're talking about the makings of a checkmating net. I mean, this is just unbelievable. Wesley still has over a minute on the clock, and he's <sighs> getting increment all of a sudden. But it's just weird that this game continues in a way that we're talking about attacking chances for white. I've never seen anything like this. I, I mean, a knight, a couple of pawns for a queen, and Maxime continues to fight. He continues to play on. Wesley, it just looks like he's finding, trying to find a way to just finish the game on the spot, to try to find his draw, but in the process, he's giving Maxime chances, chances to improve the position. The pawn has moved up the board. The king is coming in now. Yeah, this really reminds me of Game 6 of that World Championship match between Carlson and Napomnishi. Apart from the fact Black has a rook for one of White's pawns. Same material imbalance, but uh, actually pieces, they do fight, and pawns, they do fight quite well against a queen. Here, White's king is surprisingly safe, but unfortunately, no way to get to the Black king. And Maxime keeps trying, keeps probing away. A check, the king sidesteps. Eight, he's six getting nervous. Under now, control. Now maybe rook g8 is the move I would play because I just want to deliver a checkmate from the black side. The white king, it's trying to be used as a weapon with limited material remaining. Whoa! He gives up his rook because he's going to get the knight back. That's actually very clever. I thought, you know, what is Wesley doing? But you could see the oomph in that move. He grabbed that pawn and slammed it down. Oh, he knows now. He knows psychologically that's a killer blow. A check, the knight. Oh, he doesn't Ooh, even take the knight. the rook. Wow. Oh, Maxime continues to play, but now without the rooks on the board, this is over. This is over. Only needing a draw. Uh, uh, it should be straightforward now. You can just give all the checks in the world. Just don't blunder a knight fork. White's pawns will never really push without... Oh, oh, okay, that's, that's that DGT board just doing crazy things to us. It put the queen on a square, the knight could take it. But Wesley, he's not going to blunder the queen. Wesley can't believe that Maxime is still playing, that he hasn't resigned already. Hey, uh, resignation is a loss. Getting checkmated is a loss. So why resign? You only have a chance to uh, take this match if you play on. 
Oh my gosh, unbelievable play by Maxim there. He is probably gonna lose this game, but just full credit to the Frenchman to fighting this out till the very end, and that is it. Wesley Saw does it, he finds the draw, sacrifices the queen, and takes the match against the Frenchman. What an Armageddon. What an Armageddon, so many twists and turns, ups and downs, tactics galore. Ultimately, Wesley just too solid. And uh, yeah, having black there, uh, he was able to take the arm again, but still one game ongoing between Abdus Satorov and Lazovic. And uh, Wesley so checking that one out as well. It's been an end game in that one. I've had my eye on I thought it's been a very interesting uh, situation where Nodirbek has had the advance for a very long time, and now he is up a couple pawns. But the difficulty of this end game that we see on screen here is that sometimes there's actually, when you have a bishop pawn and a rook pawn with the rooks on the board, it could still be a draw, but not now because look at this brilliance from Nodirbek. David, you've made the video on him. <laughs> he just is dominant in the end game. So strong in the end game. There was a checkmate threat there. Black's king cut off. Off. Another checkmate threat if the white rook ever lands on a8. The problem is you cannot fend this off. You have to allow a trade of rooks if the black king kept marching and a handshake. Lazovic does resign Abdu Satarov too strong in that rook end game. Really, really nice technique there by Nodebeck in the end. Using tactics in the rook pawn ending to simplify the position uh, and Nodebeck gets a moving on uh, the leaderboard uh, right there with that win against Denis Lazovic. Two really impressive Armageddons. You have to be heartbroken for Dennis Lazvik because in this game, he had opportunities to survive, and his three match losses have all come down to almost individual moves. Against Magnus, that rook end game, he slipped up in time travel. Against Wesley, he blundered a pawn in a position that was quite level. And then here against Nodirbek, okay, it was 60 plus moves into Armageddon, nerves are there, but it's been a case of one move itis for him in this event. Yeah, he's He's going to learn so much, though. 17 years old. It's always just these rook games, just these small details, small margins, as you mentioned there, Robert. And uh, he will bounce back, Lazovic. He will. Uh, he had. He did hold Magnus to a draw as well for Danis Lazovic. He goes down to Abdus Satrov in the Armageddon. And Wesley So, after being disappointed with his own bid, takes it. Takes it in the Armageddon against Maxime. And what an Armageddon that was. Akaya is in Toronto with the winner, Wesley So. Wesley So is here after such a dramatic Armageddon game. Congratulations on winning the match, Wesley. Yeah, as usual, yeah. Thank God all wins come from him. But I, it seems, I I mean, the last game went very well. Mm -hmm. But it seems that based on history, I just can't play chess against Maxim. <laughs> I, I well, I, I would disagree. I don't want to play him again. <laughs> you might have to in the finals, actually. <laughs> I, yeah, I hope I don't face him. I just have such a terrible result against Maxim. Like, also in the Grand Chess Tour, played. And, like, in Norway, he beat me. So, it's just a very, very difficult opponent. I'm just so relieved to get out of it alive. Well, okay, let's dig like, into the Armageddon yeah, here, though. Maybe next time, like, if I'm white and I play him, I'll just, like, make a draw in, in five moves or something, you know? Well, so first of all, you were you were regretting your bid. You went under nine minutes for your bid, so you did have... Uh... Yeah, but it worked very well because yeah. I didn't get much problems from the opening. Like, I, I was regretting it because I found out what Maxim bid, mm -hmm. and so I should have bid nine and a half minutes, but it worked well. I, I was a bit surprised because Hikar would bid very low online, but here everyone's bidding super high, so I, I'm, like, really confused. And then let's dig into the Armageddon game as well. There were a ton of moments. One moment, you touched your queen. You were about to move it into a knight fork. You were able to move it back to a more sensible square. I mean, take us through yeah. that moment. <laughs> That's really crazy. Uh, no, actually, I saw the knight fork. It's just, you know, I'm giving him some false hopes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to move it to h7, but somehow my hand stopped on f7. Of course, I saw the knight fork. But I was like, you know, yeah. trolling, <laughs> not trolling. I would only troll Anish, but I was like duping Maxim. But I was thinking where to put h7 or c7. But it's really crazy because I thought I played really well. Like I mixed up the opening, so I wasn't sure what was happening at all. Like it was so complex. But I think I played very well, defended that. Maybe he had some chances. Like after I played f6, I was really worried about a4. I wasn't sure if he saw that. Maybe it doesn't work. I'm not sure. But I thought I played really well. And uh, just when I was happy with my position, like I got my queen. I realized that I still have to work for it. <laughs> yeah. wow. 
obviously. And it is a great start to the tournament now for you. How are perfect, you feeling? Perfect start. Yeah. Yeah. I, like, like when I lost the white game against Maxim, I had literally zero hopes to come back in the match and somehow miracle. So thank Jesus. And uh, another match coming up today, round four against Ali Reza Ferruja. Will we see some more mind games there then? <laughs> 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 like you touch the FIFA, you, yeah. you play you, you play C6, and then you play C5. Please do that. Maybe when he plays E4, I will go like E6, and then move it to E5. Yeah, <laughs> like what Mikael Tal against did against Bobby Fischer. If he, like he played C6, and yeah. then he went C5, and then he looked at Bobby. <laughs> Just in a great mood here, Russell. It's so good to see. So, what should we expect from your final match here today on day two in the finals? Well, hopefully I can play very well and uh, not lose the white pieces this time. Uh, that was a big, <laughs> that's a big mistake. <laughs> well, congratulations on a great start, Wesley, and thank you for joining us. And so good to see you in a great mood. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, probably lose to Maxim like eight times out of ten, so today is definitely special. Good day for you so far. Thank you for joining us, Wesley. He is just in a great mood, playing some mind games here, Wesley. So back to you guys. Wow, such a special day for Wesley right there. Mind games from start to finish. And what a time we live in when the nicest guy on the circuit starts trolling his opponent. Queen to f7, seeing that fork was never the plan to fall into the blunder. What's going on? Is this where we start blaming Anish Giri for getting all the top players into uh, their Twitter troll senses? But you know, Wesley, it's good to see him that relaxed because so uh, oftentimes players can, they can just get this pressure on themselves where they're just not letting loose at all. They feel like they can't joke around. But Wesley, he's in great spirits right now after being disappointed in his initial bid. Yeah. Wow. Wesley, so clearly in great spirits, great mood and playing some great chess, David. Yeah, we saw Wesley's uh, victory there in the Armageddon earlier, but I wanted to highlight a few key moments in the other game that we didn't get to follow too much between the two teenagers, the two youngsters, Abdu Satarov and Denis Lazovic. And it was a fascinating rook end game. Even end games can be full of tactics. And it was at this moment Abdu Satarov pounced with a really nice trick. He played pawn to e5 check with white being a pawn up. He threw one of the pawns away because if king takes pawn, suddenly the king is outside the box and no way to catch this runner, the, black, the white a pawn about to become a queen if the black king tries to chase back. It is just too slow and white's rook now can just move out the way. The queen will land next turn. Instead, black's king did correctly step to the side, but if we fast forward all the way to the end, a nice couple of tricks to finish this game. White here giving a check, forcing the black king to take this pawn on a5. A nice drop back, threatening a checkmate, and when the king marched forward, another checkmate threat, forced resignation. The only way to avoid this is to march forward with the king, but a rook trade would have ended this battle, and the white seapawn now free to run. Beautiful te tactics, beautiful technique from Abdi Satorov, who took the win. I think even more impressive than the technique was the speed with which he saw it. I mean, you have made that video on Abdul Sitarov and how strong he is in the end game, and he's proving it time and time again, and that game is no exception. There were some mistakes, there's some slips. It's the nature of Armageddon where all is on the line, but he continues to impress, and now he's on the scoreboard with a legitimate shot mm -hmm. to make his way to at least the survival stage. It's been such a dramatic day of chess, and the action continues as we will be having round four, including a matchup between Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura coming up. And Magnus has got to be feeling good about his chess too, as Kaya caught up with him after his win against Fabi. Here with Magnus Carlsen winning his match against Fabiano Carana. First, Magnus, a little bit of inside information here. You've been watching the Norwegian, what do we call it even, soccer, yeah, um, qualification for the first league. Yeah. So um, that was uh, was a lot of fun. And you're happy with the result? Boring, huh? The an Oslo team going down. Yeah, uh, I think they will back stronger, but um, um, yeah, it's always fun. So happy about that, about that, happy about your match win with uh, Fabiano. What happened there? I, I think um, I probably, well, I, I decided, you know, to play a somewhat unusual opening, gunning for a fight. Um, and um, I mean, he was he was all for it. So it, we had this really complicated position where I gave up a pawn initially for um, some positional compensation. I suspect that I was I was worse, probably considerably worse, uh, for a brief moment. And then I, at some point, I started to take over. Um, I was down on time, but he didn't really find the plan, and suddenly, you know, everything was, was working out for me. 
He's been on fire lately, everyone talking about that. So do you get some extra joy from winning a match uh, against him? Yeah, but I mean, I've played with him many years, so I don't think... Um, I don't like think he magically gets much better or much worse in, uh, in a few weeks span. And then Hikaru Nakamura. It's a big day for you. Hikaru Nakamura is coming up in the next match. What can we expect from that one? Um, I don't know. I haven't thought too much about it yet, but... Um, I mean, I guess he won a fairly convincing match now, so at least he's showing, um, showing some signs of uh, improvement. Thank you for joining us, Magnus. Good luck in the next match. Thank you. All right, Magnus Carlsen getting ready for his match against Hikaru Nakamura. And there isn't much time to get ready, as in just a few moments we will have the first moves of uh, this, uh, of the next big clash coming up uh, against Hikaru, and this was... These are the match stats coming in against Fabi. A almost a 93% accuracy by Magnus Carlsen, 90% for Fabiano Carno. What stands out to you in this one, Robert? Well, it's interesting because there were no blunders, but it was consecutive moves where Fabi went wrong. He didn't drop a queen. It wasn't anything of that sort, but he went in one direction and then immediately came back. So there was that indecision. There wasn't the cohesiveness of his pieces. I think Magnus played a better overall match. Yeah, Magnus, his strategy was interesting with white, very solid, with black, provocative. He's basically saying, come at me. And uh, when he got his chance, he counterattacked. It was really impressive stuff from Magnus. Small margins of the, uh, this level, of course. Both players uh, kind of avoiding those big mistakes. But in the end, Magnus just too strong. And this next clash against Nas Nakamura, I'm expecting more of the same. It's going to be decided by one or two moves here and there. It's about who's fastest, who's strongest, who's sharpest. And I cannot wait. Oh, like, I was made a bit of recovery with that win against Ali Reza. Uh, but David, you might need to make a little bit of a recovery as well. I saw your reaction with the whole Norwegian soccer league. Magnus was smiling. You couldn't believe it. What happened? Where's the loyalty from Magnus? He used to play for Volaranga Chess Club, and now he's supporting the fact that Volaranga Football Club have gone down, got relegated. Oh. Oh, it's my team as well. I'm disappointed. Oh. I'll say. David uh, was a little heartbroken with uh, that news, but it is uh, uh, back to chess as the next round four is about to start. And this is where we are going into the final round of the day. At the top of the leaderboard, no surprises there. It is world number one, Magnus Carlsen with three wins and Wesley So after a dramatic, dramatic Armageddon against uh, Maxime Bashir Le Graf. Fabi with Two points there, Maxime, Hikaru, Ali Reza, and Nodebeck get up on the leaderboard. Dennis, yet to score. What can we expect from this final round of the day coming up? Well, you see how tight the pack is with one point. All those players down there, they have a real shot of leapfrogging others and heading at minimum to the survival stage. So Magnus and Wesley, they're pretty much in the clear. They know at minimum to make survival stage. They want to keep on going and get straight through the semis. But for those other players, including Dennis Lazarus, he if he gets a match victory here, he still has a shot too. Yeah, I'm expecting players to fight even harder for their lives now. As you mentioned, Rob, it's so packed in the middle. I mean, that match between Magnus Carlsen and Nakamura, it's mouth-watering. I'm hoping for Armageddon somewhere. If, that, if not in that match, I think uh, elsewhere we'll see them and that has guaranteed enjoyment and excitement a lot uh, so far in the event. I'm expecting more of the same. It is uh, indeed going to be a lot of exciting chess coming up. It is uh, Magnus taking on Fabi. And not, not just that one, we've also got Ali Reza, who will be fighting against uh, Wesley So. And this is also a really, really big clash. Wesley looking unstoppable right now. Ali Reza has got to do his best and we will be back with more chess. I'm International Master Alex Banza and I'll be presenting you Silman's complete endgame course from beginner to master. Besides what you will see from Mr. Silman, I'm gonna try to do my best and share with you some of the insights that uh, I managed to steal from uh, my coach. Trust me, you have never really imagined uh, something like this could be compared to chess. You will notice that the difficulty of these positions uh, will kind of uh, increase exponentially as long as we uh, progress with the series. Let the games begin. 
Knight takes on a3, bishop takes on a3, knight b5, targeting your bishop, targeting the pawn. You have to keep the bishop on the diagonal. Knight takes on c3, defending my pawn. Knight e2, but after the stunning knight to b1, threatening pawn to a3, pawn to c3, threatening b2, threatening a2. There is just no way to stop. Uh, improve your end games and start crushing your opponents with this uh, very evil playstyle. Magnus Carlsen was qualified for this season's first event as the reigning CCT champion. And so he began his journey with a target on his back. Unstoppable from the start, his dominance has been undisputed. Winning half of the regular events and sealing his spot in the tour finals already in the Air Things Masters. That is beautiful tactical awareness from Magnus Carlsen. He is really earning this championship. It's over. We have a winner. Magnus Carlsen takes it. He wins the Air Things Masters. The checkmating, it's on the board, Simon. Ooh, there we go. Oh my god, and we have a winner. Magnus Carlsen checkmates Wesley Saw and wins the AIM Chess Rapid. Black Queen on the board now is going to win this game. Magnus, he's got it. He's got it in the end. Wow, what a fight though. That was amazing. It's uh, over. Magnus Carlsen, he takes it. This is the winner of the Julius Baer Generation Cup. On his way, Carlsen has played some epic matches and proved his strategic brilliance in the Armageddon bidding. Armageddon is coming up. And let's reveal the bids from Hikaru what? and Magnus. Look no. at that! Hikaru has been 8 minutes and 59 seconds, beaten by one second. <laughs> Magnus Carlsen bidding 8 minutes and 58 <laughs> seconds. Oh, no more, no more checks. checks. Oh, and what's happened there? What happened? We see a reaction. Magnus oh, is Magnus mouse slipped, blundering into that queen. Magnus with his unique ability to just have all his pieces at the right squares to execute an attack and finish the game. I don't know how he does it, but it seems to happen time and time again. When did the pineapple thing start? None of you fans get to see this. This was an awesome little streamer tutorial here for any streamers looking to improve their setup. This seems like a beautiful place to set up the headquarters of the most watched chess streams ever. Let's go see how it happens. Hello. Hello. Is Hikaru here? Wrong address. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All right, we're in. We're here with Ikaru, and there he is. There How's he, it going, was, Danny? I was just in town. Wow, that's it's totally surprising. Random. Yeah, I guess. But why are you at my house? I just wanted to see where the uh, where it all goes down. Yeah, well, why not? Let's take a look at where the magic happens, Let's man. Do it. This is the uh, where the magic happens. I've got my camera on. I've got my whole setup here. Of course, classic puzzle rush. Everything else. I've never seen this shelf over here. This has not been opened. It's a four by four Rubik's cube. I don't know who gifted it to me. I think my mom did, or maybe my brother did years ago. Um, that, of course, is a Twitch plugin. It lights up if you plug it in. I have this little cube, which actually uh, is from December 9th, 1993. You can actually see right there. Wow. So uh, it was actually carved, I think, by my uh, biological father. And this, of course, is my name. So that's pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. Then, of course, we got this nice controller nice to be used, Xbox obviously. Uh, and anybody who streams has to be a gamer, can't just be playing chess. That's just not fun. That's just ridiculous. This shelf, of course, is the a special one. This is the one that everyone gets to see. Yes, exactly. And this yeah. has some pretty special stuff. First of all, I have this Grand Chess Tour thing, which I won when I won the Paris Grand Chess Tour event in 2018. Okay. This is Valencare, the, the winner. This was a gift from the um, from a fan, I think, during the Fide Candidates in uh, Madrid. Someone bought me this, like, it's like a hologram of, uh, of the stadium. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Real Madrid Stadium. So That's cool. Kind of cool. But this is from the uh, Mil Millionaire Chess Tournament 2015. When oh, I won. my gosh. Yeah, so that's, that, that's epic. That's a play button for my second channel, more GM Hikaru for 100,000. And then otherwise it's all, Got a yeah. little green pawn here, a little chess. Yes, a little chess dot com pawn that nobody gets to see. It's like the <laughs> smallest thing here, the, out of all the things, kind yeah, of kind of random, pineapple. yeah. Yeah, this was actually, uh, my parents bought this for me in Hawaii, I think last year, it's just a nice little Hawaiian That's pretty. Uh, pineapple trinket. and. This I've never really used, but that actually lights up if you plug it in, so it's a big pineapple. W when did the pineapple thing start? Chess teacher and this guy comes with a pineapple shirt to teach you a medal. <laughs> and he says, yeah, I'm a GM in chess. I would say go back to Bikini Bottom. <laughs> 
That started in the middle of 2020 during the pandemic. Specifically, there was a force in the stream on Twitch where his community made a joke out of me watching it. I was wearing actually this pineapple shirt that I'm wearing now. So they started making the joke about the pineapple man and the pineapple house under the sea. And it just stuck. So I, I keep with it. And also even beyond that, I mean, pineapple I think is the main fruit in Hawaii and I've gone there many, many times. So we have a chess.com logo there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This is amazing. Well, and then we've got this angle here. We're not going to show anything incriminating on screen. There's no, there's nothing incriminating. I mean, I can obviously just show you guys. Yeah, like, go it's pretty it. straightforward. Go yeah. So I was going to like, what I do normally is my setup is pretty straightforward. If I'm streaming on Twitch, I'll have the chat basically popped out right up here. I'll just extend this. I have my dashboard via Streamlabs. Click on recent events. Normally I'll have like OBS open as well. So I'll just have like OBS. Just one second. I have OBS over here, and then on this monitor is where I do it. So I guess just for fun, we'll do Let's one. Let's do it. I love do it. one puzzle rush. See how many I can get. Let's go check. And for the record, I am standing in the fair play cam position. Exactly. None of that you fans true. get to see this, so uh, except for when Anish Geary inappropriately leaks things on Twitter. We're going to talk to you about that, Anish. <laughs> um, check me. But this is where yeah. the fair play cam would sit, right mm -hmm. here, looking at Hikaru, his mouse, his monitor. So for anyone who's ever wondering what it looks like. We gotta keep watching him over here. He's crushed, he's crushing this puzzle rush. All pretty good, actually. There we go. I, I gotta speed up though. I'm a little bit too slow right now. Should be checking, but should be forward. Takes, oops! Oh, that was, that was a mouse slip because I, I thought he was gonna play another move in the puzzle. Oh, darn, I should have gotten 54. Okay, but that was no, 53 your... was pretty good though. That's 53 was good. Yeah, that was pretty good. I should have gotten 54 if I played Rook H1 quicker, but. It was pretty awesome. This was an awesome little streamer tutorial here for mm -hmm. any streamers looking to improve their setup. Exactly, yeah. Welcome to Hikaru's world. Yeah, and then I have my drinks always, which everyone always all, everyone always sees my, my glass and of course my, my coffee mug. I, 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 I rotate a few of these mugs, but this is the one I'm using right now, yeah. so. So yeah, fans, you can see fans watching too. this video are lucky they've seen everything now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yep. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I, I hope you enjoy the tour and bye everybody. And Kara Nakamura streaming cribs. I don't know how to unlock the door. <laughs> Hold on, I have to get out of here. Okay, bye everybody. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> bye. bye. This is the one hour chess lesson you could take to make sure that you have all the starting tips, strategies, and basic understanding to really be ready. By owning the D file, white can do anything that he or she wants. If you don't understand what to do here, you might move the queen to safety on C6 and immediately lose the first lady to bishop to B5. King on the sixth, pawn on the fifth is a winning king and pawn ending where no matter what black does, we are going to be able to bring a new queen to the board. You can also skip the parts that maybe you already know how to move the pieces or the language uh, and, and jump in at a level that's appropriate to you. With Chess Kid's new live classroom feature, coaches can do so much more. Easily create or preload games from your library and invite your class in seconds. Teach face-to-face -face interactive lessons without having to leave the site. Teaching chess online has never been easier. It's round four of the 2023 Champions Chess Tour in Toronto, and it's the matchup that so many people have had circled in our round robin stage. That's right, you see him squaring off right there. It's Hikaru Nakamura versus Magnus Carlsen, and it's coming up in just a moment. We are here back in the playing hall alongside James Canty. I am Danny Wrench, and well, let's, before we talk about the big matchup, we see the highest rated player in history already sitting in his chair behind me. Let's talk about what we just saw. And round three, Canty, the result that stuck out to you most? Ooh, that's a good one there. Oh, definitely that Armageddon at the end. Wow, yeah. that was crazy. With Wesley So just clinching that one, that was very, very strong. And it was also a very crazy match. We all were out there just watching it happen. It's crazy. It's funny because I agree. I think So kind of stole the drama yeah. because he lost the first game, comes back to win in Armageddon. But it's funny, Hikaru was so dominant that we didn't even really have a chance to talk about it, right? That's he right. talk right. about a turnaround from a birthday that didn't go his way yesterday. He takes down Aldi Reza Ferruja by a score of 2 Oh, didn't even need Armageddon to get it done. 
And uh, yeah, I mean, that, I guess it gets him poised as we head into the next round. Abdusa Turov won in Armageddon, as we already saw as well. But all right, we, uh, we want to talk a little. We want to talk now about what that means as far as where the players sit in terms of standings. You saw the results. You probably watched it live. Let's be honest, you've been here all day. You've got nothing better you to do You didn't go on anywhere, Sunday. of course. Magnus Carlsen and Wesley So are tied atop the leaderboard, have won all three of their matches. Fabiano now with two after losing to Magnus Carlsen. You see Noterbeck, Abdusa Turov, and Denis Lazovic, not where they want to be. If we ended the round robin stage today, the two youngest players would indeed go home. So, where does that put us? Well, we're back here uh, in the studio. I think we're, we're looking ahead a little bit to this matchup that a lot of people want to talk about. Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura will be yeah. facing off. Yeah, the big dogs going at it. I mean, of course, like, when they're in good form, especially Magnus being in the form that he he's in, Nakamura, if it was yesterday, it may have been a different story. It's his birthday, not working out. But today's a new day. He's won his match today. Now he's got to face Magnus. Yeah, you got to face Magnus. I think if you're Hikaru, maybe you want that in terms yeah. of building on a match you just had with Ferrugia, right? You might as well give me the biggest might dog well here well, while I'm yeah, feeling good well. and see what can happen. So well. I can't wait to see it. Of course, yesterday on Hikaru's birthday, we premiered a video where we gave Magnus some trivia on Hikaru Nakamura to see how much he knew. A couple of weeks earlier, we actually had a video released in terms of how much Hikaru knew about Magnus, and we're going to replay that one for you right now. What better way to get you excited about the matchup here than to remind yourself of a video that broke the internet a couple of weeks ago. Just how much does Hikaru know about Magnus? Watch this and find out. Let's see. You ready for some Magnus Carlson sure. trivia? I'll do pretty badly, but sure, let's go. What is Magnus Carlson's birthday? His birthday is November, I believe November 30th. I'm, it's is it 28th or 30th? I think it's the 30th. It's November right. 30th, yeah. You know the year? Well, I'm 87, and he's part, yeah, he's part of that next generation, so it should be 1990. Nailed it. Where was Magnus Carlsen born? Now, this one is tricky because I, I get these cities confused. Uh, it's, it's with a T, but the problem is in my mind, I always want to say it's Trondheim, but that's not the right one. It's, uh, it's, um, it's Tonsberg, right? It's Tonsberg. That's what it is. There's a lot of teas from, so, but you got a Tonsberg. But I always confuse that with Trondheim. And actually, there's a picture of like the hospital room on the Wikipedia page, and I thought it was kind of strange. Yeah. Th th there is. It's like they, there's a picture of like the window or the hospital itself. And I just thought it was kind of weird that they memorialized that. But anyway, what? <laughs> okay. Beside the point. All right. At what age did Magnus Carlsen become a grandmaster? It's getting younger. That should be, it's 13 or 14. I'm pretty sure it was at 13 years old. I don't, I don't remember exactly how many days. Correct. 13 years, 148 days. What is Magnus' favorite opening move in Over the Board Games? I'm going to assume it's E4, but I honestly don't know. <laughs> Correct. He's played E4 762 times and D4 555 times. Okay. On chess.com specifically, under his Magnus Carlsen account, what is Magnus' favorite opening move? For online, what's his favorite move? I, it's probably not E4. I'm going to guess that it's, um, let me think about this. I'm going to guess that it's Knight F3. It's E4. It is E4? Okay. Who did Magnus play in his first FIDE World Championship? Oh, this I remember very well. Th this was actually, because Magnus's rise was very quick, and I, I remember it was very well. He played, I think, he played the World Cup, and then he played Ice, and those were two very, very critical moments for him. And the World Cup, I remember it was very well. He played Levon Aronian in 2004 and in Tripoli. And I remember this also because, um, like, I was playing in the first round, too, against a Russian player. I won in, won in like, the first two tiebreak games. But Magnus's match against Levon went very deep. I think it went to, like, six games, I think, in the tiebreak, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and everyone was watching that match very closely because Levon was considered one of the big favorites to win the World Cup. So it was against Levon Aronian. Triple. That was great. We thought we were going to get you with that trick question. but uh, I remember that very well. You nailed it. Okay. What do Yevgeny Bereyev, Gadakomsky, Uhang Shi, and Jan Shistov Duda all have in common? Oh, they've, they've all... Um, I'm, I think it's pretty obvious. They've all beaten Magnus in the World Cup. Nailed it. Okay. How many candidates tournaments has Magnus Carlsen qualified for? So it would have been 9, 11, 13. So I'm going to guess it's, it's three. It's my guess. Four. 2007, 2011, oh, he did. 2013, okay. and then eventually 2024. Oh, so you're counting this. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you're yeah. counting this one, but. That's the part of the trick question, right? All right, let's see. How many tries did it take for Magnus to win the main event, not the Blitz, of Norway chess? I feel like he did. I feel like the first time he won was actually a year that I was not there for some reason. So I'm going to guess that it, it. he played 13, 14, 15. I'm going to guess that it was the fourth try, it was 2016. 
Very good. Wow. I was right? Yeah, took his fourth try. Okay. What happened first? You playing a classical game versus Magnus or him winning the Norwegian Championship? So that, that game of Beale would have been July of 2005. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that probably my game against Magnus happened first. Correct. Okay. Magnus recently co-authored a chess book. Who did he co-author it with and what is the title? I don't know the title, but it's it's a book with um it's a book with like David Howell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Grind like a grandmaster. Grind like a grandmaster. Okay. Yeah. One of Magnus's first sponsors was a clothing company. What was that company? Those were the very early days. I remember yeah. Chess.com was at that event in New York yeah. City. Um, but yeah, the company would be G Star Raw. Nice. Which of these has Magnus Carlson won five of? Classical World Champs, Blitz World Champs, Rapid World Champs. Uh, classical. Nailed it. What is the name of Magnus Carlsen's Twitch channel, and do you know how to pronounce it? I mean, the, the name is, it, well, I mean, I, I know what it, how you spell it. I probably mispronounced it, but I think it's Maskinissen. Correct. Will we see more from the Ma Maskinissen uh, Twitch in the future? I have to say that your um, pronunciation is abysmal. Maskinissen. Maskinissen? How, how did I do it? Maskinissen, yeah. Magnus Carlsen trivia, wrapped. I obviously mispronounced the that was Twitch really channel. bad, bro. That was, it was really bad. It was pretty bad. It was, pretty it was bad. the first time saying it under pressure, but all right. <laughs> Hikaru answered those questions pretty well under he pressure. He did. Were you surprised fact, by how much he knows? Yeah, actually. He knew a yeah. lot. But I mean, I see that with, uh, you know, Magnus did the same thing with Hikaru of like how, yeah. just how many questions they knew about each other, man. Yeah. That's really cool. They're, uh, they're foes, they're rivals, they're shaking hands behind us, we know it. And we're gonna, we're gonna dive in now to really just get the hype going, right? No more pleasantries, no more trivia about how much we know. Let's check out this hype video. If the fans were not more ready, could they get more ready? On, get check out this hype video we prepared for this particular matchup when we knew it would come before we dive into predictions. Magnus and I have been around for a long time, and I think Magnus is clearly the best player who's ever played chess. Hikaru is obviously one of the very best players in the world. Certainly, he has the best result. He's the highest rating in history. What is maybe the most challenging about his style is his resilience and also his ability to calculate. His end games are better than anyone else in the world. I don't think it's even close. He does have a psychological edge as well. Like, people have to do something special to beat him. You know with Magnus, it will be a full-fought game from start to finish. That's one of the challenges that motivates me. Whenever I play him, he is the world champion. He is the best player in the world, and I really do enjoy the challenge. I have beat Magnus, and I think I have very good chances to win. There may come a time when I don't consider myself a favorite for a tournament, but that time is not now. We are ready. We are getting set. The players are getting set, and there's no more waiting. It's time for them to throw down. I think they're anxious and want us out of here. So let's just dive into it. Canty, it's Nakamura Carlson. Who you got? Got to go with my boy Naga. All right. It's got Hikaru. I'll say Magnus Carlson then. Well, this is a this is one that I think I speak for every fan in the world that I'm hoping it goes the distance to Armageddon. I'm going to take Magnus in a closest of close matches. Let's move on to MBL versus Lazovic. Who you got? MBL. Okay. MVP, MBO. Yeah, we'll agree. MBO. I'm also going to take Maxime. Obviously, it's it's a hard one here, but I do agree with Robert's comments that I feel like Lazovic is this close to a breakthrough, despite the fact that I'm taking the Frenchman. So, all right. Next matchup, we're moving on. Wesley So, Ali Reza Faruja, who we got here? Yeah, so is just so solid right now. He's playing good. Great chess. Got to go with So. And he's also in such a good mood. Yeah, it feels good, right? You know, his, fa his face is just a big, big smile. So, I will say Wesley So. I'm also going with So, uh, and just double checking my prediction. I think I took So. Who did I take? <laughs> I did take So. Sorry, it's a long day. Uh, Levy's glass is getting to me. I was looking at Levy's prediction. Hey, I think yeah, Levy's buddy. prediction was going to be Ferruja, but he's not here. By the way, we got two pairs of glasses today two in levels. honor of the second day that COVID has defeated Levy. Levy, we're waiting for you, Come and on. the glasses will continue to That's mount right. until you're here. Yes. But all right, we got we all got Wesley So there. I think unfortunately it might be a tough day for Ferruja if that holds up. Our last matchup to predict. Carwana against Abdus Satura. Definitely got to go with Fabi there. Big Fabi. Got to go with Fobs. Yep. I will agree. Fabiano Carwana. Okay. It's it's content, Ali Reza. It's content. We'll just throw <laughs> I, I feel so bad. What? <laughs> I'm sorry about that. We'll, 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 we'll talk about it. All right. Last matchup we have here is Abdus Satura Carwana. Who'd you take? Fabi. 
I think oh, I also sprint. took Fabi. There you go. That's what we got. We got the games and they're ready to start. We're going to throw back to the studio. And uh, with it, we have Oslo waiting. We have the studio ready to take the games away. Let the content roll. Let the commentary go. Tanya and the guys, take it away. Dari, you've uh, got to watch our fair predictions. Everyone can hear you at the back and what's happening. Uh, that's a lot of fun and there's more fun coming up uh, on the chessboard as in just a few moments. The players will be off. And of course, our marquee matchup, Magnus Carlsen taking on Hikaru Nakamura. That is going to be a fun battle. It's always fun when Magnus and Hikaru play. And I think Hikaru is going to have a little bit more fun now that he won his match earlier today. Uh, but we heard from the players themselves. They always have an epic rivalry, but Hikaru believes in himself, even though Magnus has to be the favorite every time he sits down at the board. When you're about to face Magnus, beating Ali Reza, the kind of confidence boost you need? That's a decent warm-up. <laughs> I mean, you need all the confidence you can get when you play these top players in the world. And, I mean, we've seen their battles throughout the last year, the, throughout the last two years, and it's always tiny margins, so close. I'm expecting an Armageddon and... Ooh! Uh, I'm expecting a lot of fireworks. Well, we have an Armageddon in this one. Uh, two mini rapid games first. It is handshakes and we're off. We're off. Magnus pushes a pawn. Hikaru does likewise. I believe that is d4, d5, and uh, Queen's Gambit. Oh. A double Queen's Gambit. But Hikaru, he's been doing this, right? He's been playing some offbeat openings. He, against Maxime Vashilagrav, chose a Petrov variation that you don't see very often. So Hikaru is showing, I'm going to think outside the box. I hope my opponents can't prepare for me. Yeah, this one, as you mentioned, it's uh, a bit rare at the top level. It had a bad reputation years ago. Um, it was thought that you simply could not play copycat chess. You could not bring your queen out uh, like this so early. But um, yeah, in recent times, computers make everything viable. And uh, black does have a solid position. The idea is just to eliminate all of the central pawns mm -hmm. and get symmetry. And uh, yeah, Nakamura looking confident. Yeah, looking really conf confident. Some mind games there. He plays queen takes pawn immediately gets up and leaves the board. Magnus, after a thing, develops the other knight first, defending the central pawn. He can delay taking it back because the d4 pawn is pinned, so the knight from b1 can still jump on to c3, targeting that queen. Uh, that's out quite early on in the game. Yeah, it seems like white can gain another tempo by playing this knight c3 move. And I believe that Hikaru, he, he moves instantly, he's analyzed that with the center, the c and d pawns, they're disappearing, that maybe this isn't actually that difficult to play and perhaps white needs to find a fine string of moves just to keep the advantage, otherwise we may see equality. Yeah, we see the evaluation bar slightly on white side, but nothing significant. And uh, equality will be the name of the game if white isn't energetic enough. And uh, I think he's relying on surprise value. Hikaru Nakamura again getting up for the second time within the first minute of this, of this game, this clash. Wow, impressive stuff. He has landed the first psychological blow against Magnus. It does look like Hikaru Nakamura has managed to get that surprise in as Magnus slows down and then retreats with the knight, continues to put pressure on the queen. Traditional chess wisdom, don't get your queen out early on in the game because it can be pursued by the pieces, allowing them to develop to the right squares. And we can also see a Magnus now, he has to decide where to take out that light squared bishop. And that's the next move uh, that is coming up. Yep, he puts a pawn on e4. What could be more natural? Uh, we heard that uh, that quiz with Danny and Hikaru about Magnus. He likes to put a pawn on e4 and move one. <laughs> he forgot to do it, so seven moves later. Uh, better late than never. But uh, occupying the center, bringing the light squared. Bishop out, as you say, Tanya. And Black has wasted three tempi with the queen. Is Magnus looking amused right now with what's going on over the board? Well, Hikaru certainly isn't, so I can read his expression, and this could be a bad sign because sometimes players play these offbeat openings, there's not well-trodden territory, and then when they're out of preparation, things can backfire, and Hikaru, I can't tell, and I won't try again because Danny already <laughs> chastised me, is he thinking, looking aside, relying on his preparation, or is everything played from this point on, his uh, own over-the-board findings? He brings his knight out, when in doubt, develop a piece. Um, yeah, I'm intrigued. I think we need Danny to tell us what face number this is. Uh, but Magnus, he will just get developed as well. Normally when you're surprised, you don't want to take too many risks. There we go. Bishop to e2. He'll get the white king to safety next turn. And um, a very stable position for both sides. Symmetrical pawn structure. Uh, the central pawns have been traded off. The players continue to develop. And now a very symmetrical pawn structure with that last move. Black also aiming at developing the dark squad bishop, getting the king to uh, the castling safety. 
But it just feels as if White with that extra move might be the one who makes the jump first. The knight can land onto d5 first once, of course, you get your king to safety. And these positions are not without poison. There's always chances for this position to change from quiet to tactical. As you said, a knight d5 jump at any moment can be in the cards for white. And for Magnus, I mean, these little decisions that he's made, he puts bishop on e2 rather than on c4. If this bishop were on c4 right now, it'd be a more dynamic, aggressive position. But I think he's just going to get his king castled and then try to figure out the aftermath. Because for black, where is that dark square bishop going? These are not easy questions to answer. And I feel like both players, they are now on their own and is about who plays the better chess. Yeah, I'm expecting Magnus to castle. You don't want to dally with uh, too many tactics, uh, especially with your king in the center of the board. Maybe he's contemplating whether to put a bishop on g5 as well, trying to eliminate this defender of the d5 square. Then he has full access to this outpost in the center. But maybe Hikaru would do the same. Maybe bishop out to b4. And yes, it might come at the cost of wrecking your own pawn structure, but taking this knight off the board could be a priority. Uh, Magnus just weighing up whether to get tactical, whether to get spicy, or to just take the calm way out and castle his king. When in doubt, I think that should be the default setting. But Hikaru looking confident still. Barely used any time on the clock. And I Good think, start for him. Yeah, Magnus has some very natural moves. As you said, castle kingside first, develop your dark square bishop either all the way to g5 or a little bit more quietly on e3, rook to c1 after. So you have these simple, straightforward moves. The question really is how big will the advantage be? We see the eva bar slightly in white's favor. As we all know from experience that sometimes your slight advantage, it dissipates in a hurry and you're left with just pure equality. Yeah, that's why he's kind of highlighted this, he's identified this Magnus Carlsen as a key moment despite how early it is in the game because he knows he needs to be accurate to pose any problems whatsoever to a strong opponent like Hikaru. If he's too slow, if he's uh, lethargic about things, then it could fizzle very quickly. He does castle and how will Hikaru react? I think the speed of this next move will kind of show us how confident he is and how deep he is in his preparation. He's already, uh, there he plays bishop to e6. This shows that he still is within his preparation uh, because his king remains in the center. He's not castling, at least not yet, and here comes knight d5. So now we're going to have some fireworks. There might be some pins. There will be some options for both sides, but it is getting spicier. Mm -hmm. As uh, Hikaru frowns, looks off to the side. I'm not sure what face number that one is, but uh, he's surprised, confused by Magnus's choice. Wow. This one is heating up with the knight jumper. Magnus getting that one in. And now we are going to see some structural changes. Of course, we will come back to our marquee matchup as we see head in hand. Hikaru has his first thinker. But another board where think uh, is perhaps required is Fabiana Caruana with the black pieces taking on Nordebeck Abdu Satrov. And my guess, David, would be that this came out of uh, the Spanish. And that strange rook that was on a2, perhaps the light squared bishops got traded there. Maybe we can back up, take it from the start, and then do a deep dive into this position. Yeah, you're right. Uh, you called it correctly there, Tanya. The opening was a Roy Lopez or a Spanish, and uh, it did begin with e4, e5, and uh, this variation uh, with the bishop coming out and getting kicked back. And uh, let's just fast forward to one of the critical moments. You mentioned the white rook on a2. It became a bit of an odd piece in this position after black developed to e6. Still well-known well -known territory, well-known opening theory. But now after bishop takes bishop, the rook recaptures, and it is left on a vulnerable square, and we'll see how that plays into uh, proceedings later on. The knights simply retreated and black broke out with d5. And this isn't the most uh, kind of popular move as far as I'm aware. I haven't looked at this for a while, but uh, it did turn out well for Fabiano because suddenly the white knight gets kicked around. Look at these black pawns really strong in the center. And not just that, but after the knight retreats, queen to d5, a tempo gaining move, hitting the rook, defending the center. To me, in the current position, if we catch up, Fabiano looks in control simply with black already. I would say advantage black just to, due to how much space you have, how strong these pawns are. But look at Noderbeck's last move, rook coming to c1. He says, your center looks very good, but I'm about to strike with c4, dynamite move myself, hitting your queen, gaining some space, and opening up the queen side here. The e5 pawn is a bit tender. Sometimes in these positions, your best option would be, can I actually push my pawn backwards one square, put it back to f6 to protect that pawn e5. A pawn's best friend is another pawn. We love our pawn chains. But I think that right now, it is Nodirek who's trying to break free from the chains and throw those pawns c4 and cause chaos. Yeah. 
I'm still liking Black's position here. It just looks like there's so much harmony in Black's pieces. You've centralized everything, gain space in the center. I hear you, Robert. C4 is uh, always in the air, creating problems for Black, but just with the piece activity, uh, even a move like retreating with the bishop to d8, and I'm scared how the eval bar might react to it, uh, but bishop d8, it doesn't love it. But it just feels as if you've got your own pawns uh, moving forward and the rooks are nicely placed in the central lines. Yeah, I think Black is, uh, at some uh, well, urgency needs to put the king in the corner as well. There might be some tactics. I'm liking Robert's idea, for example, uh, if bishop d8, pawn to c4. Um, of course, Black shouldn't get too greedy here, but if you do take this pawn for a second time, suddenly queen to b3 would be a deadly pin on the diagonal. Not just that, but Black's knights are so loose along the c file that something will drop off. For example, if you drop back a simple queen trade, and the knight on c6 is undefended. So there are some tactics. Um, I like your idea, Tanya, moving the bishop out of the way, protecting this pawn with your rook. But uh, maybe first you shuffle the king into the corner or, uh, or other moves dealing with this semi-threat of pawn to c4. Would love to get e4 in, but it just looks like white might be the one getting c4 in before black gets that central break. And Fabi, he slows down. The clocks are uh, leveling out. This whole rook maneuver that we saw by Nordebeck, first the rook goes to a2, recaptures the bishop, then comes back to a1, then to c1 with this idea. That's some high-class chess right there. Yeah, it's rerouting a piece. It may take some time, but he understands that black cannot crash through the center yet. And I just want to note that Nordebeck, he does pretty well against Fabiano, especially online. Nordebeck, he qualified for these finals by winning the Chess Kid Cup. Who did he beat in the final? None other than Fabiano Caruana. So their head-to-head -head is quite combative. These are two of the most determined fighting players in the entire chess circuit. But Nordirbeck, despite being just a teenager, he's shown that he can uh, keep pace with some of the best veterans of the game. Yeah, and uh, I do actually like his approach, despite the fact originally, kind of optically, it looks great for Black. White is provoking the opponent forward. He's trying to uh, probe for weaknesses later on. Fabi, maybe overextended. And fighting chess, you mentioned it, Robert. Um, Abdus Satorov just always fighting, always provoking. Um, also, did he, uh, did he take down Fabi when he won the 2021 World Championship? Um, either way, he's got yeah, just this fantastic style and um, so great to watch. This one is guaranteed to be a proper fight right now. And, uh, okay, he's in the tank, Fabiano. He realises mm. now that C4, massive, massive idea. Hard to stop. And it's so strange because visually this position looks like a beautiful outcome uh, for the black pieces out of the Spanish, right? You've got so much control and peace harmony, but uh, very often it's so concrete in chess. And now with modern chess especially, C4 is a big threat using the tactics and Fabi's taken about, what, it's been a, almost four a four-minute think. Looks can be deceiving. He has all of these pawns centralized on his own fourth, the fifth rank of the board. But then when you push your pawns, sometimes they go a little bit too far. They're overextended, and it's easier for your opponent to land a counter punch. And that c4 move is really available because black has thrown the pawn up to b5. The e5 pawn needs the queen's defense. It just seems like white is about to have some fun. It's a bit of retaliation, but it's coming at the exact needed moment. Yeah, and uh, Fabiano continues to freeze. Yeah. Four and a half minutes now, he needs to speed up. It's one of those positions where actually the critical moments will also be ahead. Mm. So uh, at some point you need to decide, just drop the queen back, drop your knight into d4, move the black bishop, move the king into the corner, something. But you need to uh, decide fast. Make a move, Fabi. This is just way too long. And what you just pointed out, is opening success by White making Fabi think at this moment when many critical decisions lie ahead of him? It's... Uh, it is success to get an opponent like Fabi, who's so well prepared, to let him burn the clock right now. And I'm getting worried. He's touching the five. He's crossed five minutes just over this position. One can feel that uh, Fabi is feeling the pressure on this one. Another player, and he finally does make a decision. It's not the king uh, move to h8, but another quiet move to h6. We will come back to uh, the Norderbeck board, but another player who is perhaps feeling a little bit of uh, the pressure and the heat, Wesley. So take a look at that. Alireza with the black pieces, he's going all out. He's got his pieces forward, but is this 
brave or stupid? What is happening here? My French is far from perfect, but I'm getting some deja vu here from the French number one. Ali Reza Ferruja, he's thrown a knight on F4. He completely blitzed Fabiano Caruana's queen, uh, kingside yesterday, and that was a peace sacrifice. Nothing has been sacrificed thus far. Black's pieces look like they're storming around the white king, in particular that pawn on G5, which can be joined by another pawn if the H pawn decides to go up the board. But this is, again, one of these positions where you have to uh, be super precise because one inaccurate move, suddenly white regains his footing and then it's black who might be on the back foot. Yeah, this king could be very, uh, just very, very weak uh, if you aren't able to play energetically. If, for example, this beautiful knight on f4 gets traded off, just as I say it, the king moves. I'm expecting the black queen to land on this uh, promising, this flexible f6 square. And your idea, Robert, I think he might even back it up by a rook sliding uh, and some point later on. And white needs to counterplay. White is really stuck. This bishop on g3 is especially bad. If you have to take this knight, uh, I think black could actually take either way, but uh, even with the g-pawn, and later you have the semi-open g-file to wow. play with. And white has to contort, uh, rotate the knight back to e1. This is odd, odd stuff. I was going to say, you should break in the center. You should push a pawn to d4, but where is this knight going? This is mysterious. I don't care what the Valbar says. I'm loving what Ali Reza has done here with the black pieces. You know, it's his king on the king side, but he's got h6, g5. He's making his intentions very clear. He's playing for the attack. That's why you're pointing out for the queen. Queen coming to f6. h5, h4 ideas. Opening up the h line. The knight is already on f4. Um, Wesley cannot be too happy. And it is good advice there, David. Now, when your opponent is playing on the flank with that idea, you want to try to open the center. It looks like that is the only break that Wesley has. I'm taking black in this one. Well, it's also a break that Ali Reza has. He brought his king up. He escapes a pin. That pawn on f7 was previously pinned. Now he can thrust his own pawn forward, opening up the rook, staring down towards the white king. So this is going to be a messy situation. Wesley, he typically prefers solid play. We saw what happened in game one against Maxime Vachel Legrave. Maxime brought the action to him. Wesley was not able to withstand the pressure. Ali Reza, he's playing in a similar way. Yeah, messy, and that suits Alarissa's style. Yeah. Wesley wants the control. Of course, Wesley can do anything. He navigated that arm um, again very well against Maxime Vachel de Grave earlier today. But um, yeah, this exact position, I think he won't, won't be feeling too comfortable right now. I think we're going to see h5 on the board. Um, it feels like such a natural follow up and so much uh, up Alarissa's style of play. And it is on the board. Really nice plan there. H4, you really want to force White's bishop to take the decision to trade on F4 so that the G line opens up. Uh, Vesley, he can't be too happy with the way things have turned out with the white pieces here. Yeah, H4 for the score. It's coming. And Wesley needs to do something. He pushes a pawn to F3, kicking back Black's bishop. At least some breathing space for his own bishop, that dark square bishop on G3. But yeah, these exchanges, these potential trades of minor pieces do not help White whatsoever. Totally different position, but it sort of reminds me of his game against Dennis Lazovic from yesterday, where Wesley, he ended up winning that game. But early on, it looked like Dennis was having all the fun with pressure down the king side. Maybe Wesley's saying, I have the pair of bishops for now. One may get traded. I still have one remaining. This knight on c2, after rook e1, it may go to e3 and watch out for knight f5 or d5. So there are some holes in Black's position. And Wesley, he is down a little bit of time, but he's starting to speed up because he's found himself a plan. Oh, I just loved Wesley's interview earlier. It was uh, <laughs> just the joy on his face, just yeah. the, the innocence, the way he's loving chess right now. It just seems to have freed him up to play just fantastic chess. And he's playing fantastic chess here. Despite the fact he's on the defensive, he's playing calmly. He's just retreating his rook, creating squares for his knight. Everything's flowing. And uh, this is the Wesley, Wesley we know and love. Yeah. Three match victories. Wesley's got reasons to be pleased with his play so far in Toronto. Perhaps uh, becoming his favorite city to play chess in. So rookie one, he's trying to activate his knight. Ali Reza making his intentions very clear. He wants to go for uh, the white king. If black was to push that pawn forward. Bishop retreating back to f2, trying to keep the files closed on the king side. I think you can. You can get away with it. Retreating isn't always a bad thing to do. Um, you know, taking on f4, it looks like it's playing into Black's hand. G takes f4, opening up that g file. It just seems too risky. So that was why Wesley played knight back to e1, pawn to f3. He wanted to vacate that square and the diagonal so the bishop could retreat. And yeah, he then can control even more squares when the knight comes in e3. You're, you're just completely handling white, the light squares, over there in the center on the king side. Yeah, I don't know if you should push for Ferruja, but if not that, then what else? Suddenly, uh, the moves that were so natural, so obvious, so tempting, 
Uh, he's going to be pausing. He's, go he's certainly hesitating right now. I'm not sure how to build up. The question is whether to take this bishop. It looks like you ruin white's pawn structure. But then Robert's point, these light squares, suddenly juicy. White's knight is coming in. Yes, you could put a black knight on e7 passively to kind of block the white knight's advance. But I'm not sure that's something you really want to rush into. And uh, therefore, Farouja pausing for the first time in a long time since we actually jumped into this game. And uh, yeah, the more I look at it, the more I think this is just chances for both sides. It's becoming a position that first looked dynamic, now is looking strategic, which is Wesley's forte. So Wesley is handling this very well. No surprise given his three out of three start. He is playing amazing chess in Toronto year after year. This seems to be his city, his type of tournament. And in match play in only two games, you can't afford to make any misstep, especially in a position like this. Yeah, and I think uh, that's the whole point. Wesley needs to be so precise here. It's hard to bet against Wesley these days with the chess that he's showing. But again, I really like what Ali Reza has done. His, uh, his creativity attack, I would take black here. He's managed to make his chances on the board. It's the kind of position he likes to play, but he's going down on the clock right now. So Ali Reza, we are waiting for uh, his uh, decision. Playing aggressive, playing brave right now. What are, you, what are you predicting in this one? Do you think this matchup, given their clash of styles, there's a chance this goes into Armageddon? Or do you think it will be decided with decisive games in the Rapid? Oof, tough to predict. I'm going to say it's going to be deci uh, decisive. Actually, even just this game, uh, just because the way Ferruja has started, the way he's kind of set out his stall and said, I'm going to attack. Uh, no real way back from that. But uh, you never know. It's early days and they're both extremely strong, of course, both on form today. Well, while Ali Reza has a think on how to continue this attack that he's created, and he, just as I was about to say, he does make a move. H4 is on the board. We will jump in. We saw Wesley move back with the bishop, so the G file remains blocked in that one. Let's head back to our marquee matchup. Magnus Carlsen also reaching out to make a move on his board. I see that's a retreating one. Hikaru with the think here. Uh, he was the one who surprised Magnus early on in the opening. What is uh, the current position, uh, David? Well, first of all, I'm looking at Magnus's pieces and nearly none of them have crossed his uh, first rank. It look, again, it looks like Fisher random chess. Ooh. And wow, tactics from Hikaru. Not winning, <laughs> nothing too spectacular. Just a double attack on the White Queen. White now has to move uh, Her Majesty there. Black's Rook on the D-file attacking the White Queen. Black's Knight attacking the Queen. And uh, I think the idea from Hikaru is just very simply to trade off White's light squared bishop. Ooh, the board tested us, teased <laughs> us there. The Queen did land on a safe square on F3. And uh, knight takes bishop would guide the game towards equality. Just too sterile here. Total symmetry. I typically don't like calling a game a draw. You say level, even. It's one of those words. This looks very, very drawish. There are only five pawns per side, equal material, uh, no weaknesses to speak of. So Magnus, he looks displeased. I mean, it was a shady opening from Hikaru, perhaps one he won't use again just because if your opponent's ready for it, they may be able to take advantage. But this is completely equal. There's really not much to speak of about the position itself. It's just completely dead. Yeah, a picture paints a thousand words and look at Magnus on the camera there. Does not look too excited, too interested in this position. Um, he knows this one with high likelihood is going to be a draw. Uh, Hikaru, just great opening preparation. He's neutralized Magnus effortlessly here. Mm, yeah, and we saw the same narrative in Magnus's game against Fabi in round three. Starting with the white pieces, Magnus really did not get anything out of the opening. Fabi neutralized all pressure, and it looks like Hikaru's managed to do that as well, getting that early, early surprise in with his opening approach. It has worked to perfection. Uh, and we will move on to the world number two. From world number one to world number two, natural progression there. Fabi starts with the black pieces. Wow, that looks like deep, deep pressure on the black king, especially with that last move that has arrived, that has just arrived on the board, h5, shattering down black's king side pawn structure. Look at the eval bar. Is Fabi in big trouble? Yeah, look at the death stare that uh, Abdu Satorov was giving Fabiano a, minute, a moment ago as well. He's actually down a pawn here with white, but it is that pressure on the Black King. Black is simply overextended. Black's pieces are loose. Black's queen slightly vulnerable. Black's knight on c6 undefended. Black's rooks don't coordinate. And yeah, those kingside pawns, he's allowing them to be fractured, kind of broken here, but he's just trying to defend with his rooks. 
He's got double the amount of time on the clock as well, Robert. Yeah, the second game in a row where we look at Fabiano's pieces and they're all scattered across the board, which is not typical of a Fabiano Caruana game. And while that is a very surprising move to me from Nordebeck Abdusatarov, who is super confident playing quickly, but trading queens when the Black King looks like it's in danger, that may let Fabi off the hook. White remains with the advantage, it's easier to play. But Black is a pawn ahead in the current position. So if one pawn falls, maybe even two, it might only be a one pawn lead for White, and that gives drawing chances. Yeah, he's banking on a favorable endgame here, but maybe he should have been playing for checkmate or playing for uh, kind of higher purposes there. Uh, let's just show what's likely to happen this last bishop retreat, uh, just to highlight some alternatives. He could have maybe moved the queen out the way, for example, lining up some discovered attacks against the black queen. But now the queens have been traded. Bishop to a1 forces that to happen. And now the pressure on this undefended knight that we mentioned earlier does force Fabiano to give up this e5 pawn. No way to defend it. If you move the knight backwards, this would be disastrous. White could, for example, take on e5 with the knight, maybe even with the bishop, and uh, black's position collapses, an attack against the rook, against the bishop, and the c7 pawn falling. Fabiano drops his knight into d4, giving up the pawn on his terms, giving back the pawn, I should say, and uh, this position still advantage white. Look at those weak pawns on the queen side and on the king side too in a moment. Actually, all four pawns for black will be isolated and uh, big advantage, but... but not much material remaining. Yeah. That is the one major downside is now Fabio doesn't have to worry about his king getting checkmated. And if he can keep initiating some trades, that does increase his chances to survive. Yeah, so Fabiano may be breathing a sigh of relief, but not out of the woods yet. Objectively, still a advantage for Abdu Sotorov. He just needs to make the time advantage count now. Rook F7. I would just take that pawn, take on g6, break the structure, and then think later. <laughs> it does look very, very pleasant for white. Any a player would prefer to have the white pieces in this position, but I just feel like uh, with for Fabiano, it was the right thing to do at that moment, just give back the pawn in the center, now try to trade as much as possible. And that could put some fear into Nordebeck, who knows he's better, but he's like, can I really keep trading? Even if I win a pawn, a rook endgame, a pawn up, that may not be winning. So I'm liking the position. I love the way that Nordebeck plays chess, but it's critical for him to keep it up right now, keep that pressure going against Fabi. He's got a great position, but will it be enough? And we just as we're moving away, we saw a trade that Robert takes you by surprise. Some really surprising decisions there by Norderbeck in a better position, trading off the queen, trading off that strong bishop when there was no rush to do that. We will check in and see on that endgame, but there is no endgame on this one as uh, the attack does continue and Ali Reza asking more questions, forcing Wesley now to take a decision. You really don't want to fix the center with white, right? If you go d5, you give black a free hand on the king's side to continue with the attack. But is there an alternative? Well, I'm also knowing the a5 pawn. That one is loose. So for Wesley, he could play d5 or pawn takes c5 first, which is what I would go for. And then maybe just steal the a5 pawn. Black is hoping for counterplay thanks to some control of the light square. It's a dark square bishop for white. Ooh. Oh, and we got a queen wow. sack for two rooks. The Engine saying that maybe Black is doing okay here. David, take it away. What's going on? Yeah, it's a hard one to evaluate. Two rooks do mathematically uh, outpower a queen. And if White gets time to bring the second rook into the game, kind of team up with the two rooks, White, of course, will be better. That's what Wesley's banking on. But maybe there's an attack, some counterplay against the White King later on. I'm looking, for example, if Black just waits. As soon as the White Rook moves, I'm looking at checks. There might be this nasty check on e2, and uh, the Black Knight will plant itself on a nice blocking square on d4. Watch out for h3 coming. Watch out for g4 or f5 blowing open the king's side later. Instead, Alareza plays queen to b6, a double attack. Another one maybe Wes Wesley had missed. Robert, I just want to backtrack and ask, what was the downside? Why could he not have just snagged a pawn for free? It looks like he could have taken that pawn without really huge risk. Maybe he was worried about some of the knight d3 ideas or something of that nature, but that's really a one-move threat, and it actually doesn't threaten anything because the rook on d8 is also loose. So it's a, a bit of a strange decision coming from Wesley So, who worked his way out of some initial danger into a positionally healthy position, and now he's like, oh, wait a second, tactics once more, my rook's hanging, my pawn's hanging, knight e2 check at some moment, pawn to h3 for black. All these different ideas are in the air, and... I'm starting to like Alibrez's position more and more. Yeah, and with giving up that queen for two rooks, the last thing you want to do is get into a passive position trying to defend the b2 pawn. You don't want to come back with a rook on d8 to uh, d2. It just allows black extra tempos. 
to uh, get the queen in. And meanwhile, we're getting our first result. Magnus Carlsen, Hikaru Nakamura, as predicted, ended in a draw. Uh, this game just heating up. Uh, Wesley attacks the knight. Ali Reza steps back with the king. Wow, this one is definitely getting spicy. And I want to give a shout out to Dennis Lazovic, who secured a draw with the black pieces against Maxime Vacher Legrave. Wow. So Dennis continues to impress. I know he's got zero match points on the scoreboard, but he has held his own against some of the best players in the world. A 17 year old continues to impress. Yeah, he hasn't lost 2 uh, 0 to anyone so far. He's been very close, just small margins. Uh, great result there with black. I mean, against Vashi Le Grave, that's a fantastic result. He's one of the best with white these days. And G3 provokes a decision from the black knight. Or do you counterattack? Do you hit the white rook? I mean, I'm looking where to jump. I want to plant that black knight into the D4 square, but there will be tactics if you retreat. And uh, I think actually a bit of a trap from Wesley. So he's relying on a trick. Uh, the most natural move to me would be to drop the knight back and to bring it into D4. But rook takes E7 would set up a nasty knight fork. That's been the theme of the day, yeah. all these nasty knight forks. And this is a royal fork, of course, of king and queen. So uh, what else to do? Uh, maybe even in this position, there are tactics after rook takes e7. I realized knight to d4 would actually threaten the f3 pawn. And this is one to calculate. But if in doubt, maybe you flick in a check and take this bishop. And uh, the game goes on. That's what he's going for, these tricky, tricky knights. And uh, what to do now? You can take this bishop, take this pawn. It is chaotic. While the chaos in this one continues, uh, we will check in uh, what happens in just a moment. But first, let's take a look at this one because Fabi is in trouble as uh, Nordebex rooks are sweeping uh, the pawns that Black has on the sixth rank. But Fabi going for counterplay on the G line. Is this closer to a Nordebex win or a draw? Look at the clock. Fabiano under 10 seconds. With that in mind, I think it's going to be a win for White. Two protected uh, pass pawns as well, connected pass pawns on the queen side. If somehow he can trade off one set of rooks, it's game over. That's Abdus Satorov's goal right now. He can take another pawn on h5. Two pawns up. And Fabi is trying to get a counterattack. He's using his rook that's in front of the white king, trying to bring the other rook down. But the problem is Fabi's own king is very exposed. So there could be a ladder checkmate where the rook on a6 cuts that king off. You see, it won't get access to go up the board. And so if the second rook slides on over to the queen side, maybe we will see a ladder checkmate. So I don't believe in Fabi's chances here. Mm. And it's going to be a shame for him. But no dear Beck, he's earned this point if he's able to get it. Yeah. Fantastic play so far by Nodebeck. Can he put the finishing touches to this endgame? And he goes with the idea that, Robert, you were pointing out, sliding the rook to c5 so that if the black rook jumps in, there's a check on c7 followed by a mate on a8. So Fabi forced to keep one of his rooks on the 7th rank defence. Let's just show that idea. If Fabiano had brought his rook down, it looks like severe counterplay, but a check. And this is the checkmate that everyone needs to know. Uh, rook endgame 101. This is a checkmating pattern, the latter ladder checkmate even. And uh, the lawnmower checkmate sometimes. But uh, Fabiano, he's just stuck. What to do? White can simply just push these pawns forward now. This black rook is stuck, defending the seventh rank. Zero counterplay. This should be a win and ample time. Three minutes left. Abdus Satorov, big favourite to take this. Fabi with just seven seconds on the clock uh, in a position that looks close to losing right now. It's the only thing that he can rely on is trying to get counterplay with those two rooks, somehow getting them either to double up on the G file or the rook jumping onto the second rank. Is there any hope for Fabi to put pressure on that G2 pawn here? I don't think there's any realistic hope as long as Abdu Satorov doesn't panic. Um, he's trying to force the issue potentially, but... Okay, he drops back with his rook. Still, same idea persists. You cannot move the rook from d7. But the white king does get checked around a bit. Hmm. And uh, still yet to decide upon a winning plan. Clever play by Fabiano here because he wants to deliver a check, but even better play from Nordberg. A check, the king goes up. You are allowing that ladder checkmate. But now with the king sliding over to uh, h7, there won't be the same ladder checkmate because the black rook can backtrack and stop it. But two extra pawns or two extra pawns. But he does have a threat. He wants to either give a check from the second rank or double up on the g file. So putting pressure on g2. And Nordberg doesn't have the time just yet to start advancing uh, the queenside pawns. Yeah. Not quite yet, but if he removes the black f-pawn from the board, then he can always uh, bully the bully Caruana here with the, tr the uh, thought of a trade of one set of rooks. If one set of rooks comes off, it's just game over. Black's king is so far away, the white pawns will simply advance. But, okay, counterplay, at least one small threat, maybe. <laughs> Rook takes pawn check. You really don't want to lose the a3 pawn, because two on none, that's a very clear win. But one 
on zero and one on zero on separate sides of the board. Kind of got a split like in bowling, and that may not be the best for Notre Dame's winning chances. And you can see him. He seems shaky, and the eval board also shaking, but it's going back down towards the center. Yeah, the nerves are jangling here. Fabiano going for this type of idea. Potentially, you could imagine the black rook on G7 somehow landing on the first rank. Again, oh. another ladder checkmate. Uh, suddenly counterplay the A3 pawn attacks. He's retreating, going passive. Suddenly, big threats on the board. Rook to C1. It's not checkmate yet. White can block, but uh, it's certainly in the air. The momentum has certainly turned. Fabi getting his chances with just seconds on the clock. Not about he needs to slow down right now. He's got about a minute and a half, and he needs to use that time uh, judiciously to try to find the right way forward. And I think he's done just that, freeing up his king from that last rank. Yeah, rook F2 was Yeah, good. there's a couple checks for black, but as you say, rook F2 was such a great defensive try. Yeah, just getting the white king, breaking it out of jail, out of prison there. And uh, again, just, just floating this idea of a rook trade. But still some work to be done. Black's king isn't quite checkmated. <laughs> Both kings actually in a bit of trouble in this endgame. But uh, yeah, still some work to do to convert this advantage. Maybe the white king should go up to h3. You slide the rook behind <laughs> the king. He goes to h2 instead, but he's just going to bring one rook uh, to the G file, now the F2 rook over, and try to bring rook H3. But look at Fabi. He's being clever. He's saying, please bring your rook on over to G2, because if you do that, I force a rook trade, but I win one of your pawns, and that may give him chances to survive. Tricky, Fabi, with that last move, rook to C4, threatening a check on the H line. So still not a giving Nodabek the position that he's aiming for. Nodabek is trying to... Uh, trade off a pair of rooks, keeping both pawns alive. If he achieves that, it's game over. Fabi has to get counterplay with both these rooks on the board. He's visibly nervous though, Nodibek. He's got over a minute. Why is he behaving like this? He was fiddling with a piece. He's kind of panicking every move. And yeah. he's repeated the position now. This is the second time we've seen this. He cannot give another check. And uh, yeah, he feels like he's just yet to find the plan. And Fabi defending so tenaciously here. Threatening some checks from behind now. Far from over this one. I think King H3, I think it's now is the time. He brings his rook to E3 instead, and the eval bar is going right back towards the center. And the Black King, this is a checkmating net. If he did not check the king back, Black would have had a checkmate by force. Let's just show that there was a massive thread on the board. If White had been careless and, for example, pushed his B-pawn forward, what could be more natural? Push past pawns, check, check, and mate. This White King could have been caught. Watch out for this theme to persist. Um, yeah, this recurring idea of checking the White King is causing him real issues right now, Abdi Sorov. And he looks nervous. He's fiddling with the pieces. He's getting low on the clock. He still is ahead on time. But Fabiano's task is easier because even if both players think that White is winning, winning a one position, they say, is the hardest thing to do in chess. And Fabi keeps bringing the king forward, trying to get White in that mating net. And not about he's shaking his head. He knows that he hasn't been able to find a way to free up his pieces or trade those rooks. He hasn't made any progress. Meanwhile, Fabi, he is putting on great resistance. And yeah. we might see a three-time repetition oh if Norebeck brings that rook back. We have seen that position numerous times at this stage. But now the white A-pawn is suddenly hanging. There's still some threats of checks behind. Wow, Fabiano. He repeats, and I think Fabi, is he about, he almost, I think he was about to claim. Could he have claimed? But this is the big difference between online and in-person. OTB events, it doesn't automatically get a draw. You have to make the claim. It's tough when you're not taking notation down. Uh, the arbiters will step in if it happens enough times. But right now, Norebeck, he's, Seems like he's lost his entire advantage. You look at the Eva bar. It's at zeros, which means that it might be now a three-time repetition. Yeah, those threats of those checkmating nets and threats against the white pawns combined are just too much. White cannot fend off both of those ideas. And I did check. I don't think it was a three-move repetition, so it was a good call not to claim there, Fabiano. But uh, he's defending. He's focusing on those moves. And playing perfect defense here. Just amazing, amazing resistance here by Fabi, playing for that peace activity, the king participating in it, and Nodabek just unable to make progress with two extra pawns. And it's something all the players complimented Magnus about, how resilient he is, that he doesn't lose when he even should be lost. And Fabi's doing much the same. He's improving his defensive tenacity, his resourcefulness, and right now he just keeps chasing the white rook. Yeah, what to do with white? Now he's really in danger of repeating the position. All these checks won't help. The black king will not get checkmated on its own there. Uh, it can defend itself. And, okay, he moves across. Suddenly there are checks. Ooh, the white king in a bit of danger suddenly. Fabi gives one of those checks. Where are you hiding? You can't go to the third rank. You've got to keep that A3 pawn defended and it's going to fall. You just give a check on e 
D1, pick up the rook, pick up the pawn. But he might think that his king is close enough and the black king might be cut off. So is this a theoretical draw? That's the essential question. Both players, just like the audience, don't have that answer in front of them. So rook takes rook, king takes rook, and rook takes pawn on the flank pawn with check. The white king slides up diagonally, and the black king, is it close enough? I think it does get back in time. Fabiano's calculating that right now. Yeah, I just checked, he cannot take the rook. Oh. He cannot, he will get cut off across the board. And uh, we'll show this later on, wow. unless it happens on the board right now. He doesn't trade rooks, he saves himself, Fabi. That was a trap. Abdus Satorov looked a bit disappointed there that it didn't happen, but now a bunch more checks. Fabi's still extremely active. I think this was a good practical decision, keeping the tension, because Abdus Satorov still cannot make progress. Incredible precision Ooh. there by Fabi, and he's getting the extra seconds on the clock as the position gets repeated. And oh. look at Nuremberg. He's trying to set up ladder checkmate ideas. His, the Black King is cut off along the fourth rank. He's going to put his own rook on the fifth rank. But Fabi continue to check this king. The White King does not have much shelter. So check, 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 check. Where is that king running to? And if you trade rooks too far away from those queenside pawns, then Black will happily, happily pick up the A3 pawn. Ooh, he's driving the king forward, but the king can hide in front of its own rook here. Okay, it keeps marching up the board and the white rook will zoom behind to block it on F4. But it's almost checkmate. That second rook, the black rook in the corner, when that slides over to give a check, only that white rook on the H4 square can block that check. Otherwise, it would be made. The black king almost checkmated as well. The black king barely with any squares. Look at it getting chased back now. This is surely Oof. winning. Fabiano, he's blundered. He's allowing a rook trade, even checkmate, and game over. Oh, my God, that was a mid at the very end. What a game, what a peace play there by both Norderbeck and uh, Fabiano Caruana. But Norderbeck comes back on top, takes that end game. Incredible resistance, but Norderbeck, incredible power play by him as well. Persistence trumped resistance oh, there. Wow. Norderbeck, he never lets up, not for a single moment. And he should be feeling good about himself today. He beat Dennis Lazovic in the round three matchup earlier. Now he takes game one against Fabiano. That was stellar stuff. And that was the only decisive game of, round, of game one of round four. Nordebek Abdusatrov takes down the world number two. Meanwhile, uh, Ali Reza Faruja with attacking play, brave play, but Wesley so keeping it so solid that ended in a draw. And Dennis uh, Lazovic, Maxime Vashir Legrab, great result for the 17 year old, also a draw. And uh, of course, the marquee matchup ended peacefully. And Kaya spoke to Magnus Carlsen after that draw. in the Norwegian interview. A uh, little bit surprised out of the opening here with Hikaru and also some thoughts about a queen sacrifice in this game? Yeah, there were several there were several points where I could actually think about sacrificing the queen and I very much wanted to. Um, but I didn't get the chance really. Yeah, so obviously it was a surprise to see him play this this line. And um, I mean, I've played it like a couple of times as black, so I knew a little bit about it, but not too much detail so I was just trying to play something you know with common sense and um, then yeah I just missed this move bishop to b4 later um, I was going to just capture on e4 earlier and thought that was slightly better but um, yeah the way the way it went I had no chances I mean I was probably even like very slightly worse so for that to draw is okay. So what will you expect in game two when he comes uh, at you with the white pieces? It's very hard to say. Sometimes in these situations, he just likes to try and force the draw. Other times, he's um, you know trying to give you your best his best punch. It's hard to predict. It's uh, been some epic Armageddon battles and bidding with Hikaru throughout the season. Do you really want to avoid Armageddon with him, or do you think uh, that would be a cool thing? Um, no, I wouldn't. I mean, playing back in the second game without lead, uh, it's hard to be too unsatisfied if it comes to Armageddon. But, you know, I'm prepared for um, whatever, you know, he he tries and, and then we'll then we'll see if I have to play Armageddon, then that's okay. Thank you for joining us, Magnus. Best of luck in next one. Thank you. That's Magnus Carlsen. Let's see what happens in game two.
The ball is in. Hikaru Nakamura scored with the white pieces. Will he get ambitious or will he take this match into Armageddon? We will find out. But what a round one we've had, David. Some big moments, big end games. What's to that to you? Yeah, I just want to uh, highlight that key moment in the only decisive game of uh, that round. It was where Fabiano could have saved the draw. He defended so tenaciously. He gave a check. He gave another check. And actually, when the king marched back, he did avoid the trap of taking this rook because in this position, uh, very instructively, uh, the white king marches forward and the black king gets driven uh, away. White is indeed winning this endgame, but uh, instead he could have simply repeated. Why did he come back to G1? That is the mystery. He could have just given checks forever and would have secured the draw. Fabiano, in the end, did go down to defeat, but he was so close and Abdustorov took the win. This is so difficult to also just keep the resistance going. Amazing pressure there put by the Uzbek phenom. Nodebek takes the win, which means that Caruana has to win on demand to take it to Armageddon. A big, big game two is uh, coming up. And another player who was very impressive in game one of round two was a 17-year-old Dennis Lazovic holding the former World Blitz champion to a draw. They'll be battling it out in the action coming up in just a few moments from Toronto. Don't go anywhere. I can guarantee that working your way through this course and solving all 1001 exercises will reward you not only with a greater tactical knowledge, but also with spotting more tactics in your own games. My name is Fiona Steilantony and I'm a Women International Master. I wish you a warm welcome to the course 1001 Chess Exercises for Beginners, authored by Franco Mazzetti and Roberto Massa, with videos by me. In this case, the knight on c5 is not protected, and so the winning move is g6. g6 is the discovered attack, but it is also a double attack, because not only are we hitting the knight on c5, we are also threatening mate on h7. In this case, rook c7. Black has no choice but to capture, and now our queen comes in. We've lured the queen away. Now the king is too far removed. It cannot protect the black queen, so we are going to pick up the black queen on the next move. Any good chess tactics book has one pattern in it that feels like it is on a completely different level than all of the other tactical patterns. Bearing the vivid and accurate moniker, the windmill, this pattern features an amazing sequence of repeated discovered checks that can be used to win a nearly unlimited amount of material. The most famous windmill is definitely the one played by Mexican prodigy Carlos Torre against former world champion Emmanuel Lasker. But Bobby Fischer's Game of the Century also features a windmill. Here's another one that I really like. White starts with a rook sacrifice that leads to a combination of bishop and rook checks that simply consume Black's forces. The Lafong is a dirty, dirty trick that will probably only work at bullet, but you have to pull it off at least once in your life. When you sense that your opponent is pre-moving g6 and bishop g7 to start the game, you can play d4 and bishop h6 to try to win the bishop on g7. Shakes, guys. No one is watching. Oh, they all missed that. I see the tilt. I can feel the tilt. <laughs> it is a high risk and high reward strategy because you are hanging your own bishop if you don't catch them in a pre-move but it is certainly hilarious when you do pull it off like one of my friends uh, Asios he made a um, bot the report chart was ba partly based on hyperbolic games so then you can see a lot of the Lafong, some Queen C2 takes H7 and so on. <laughs> yeah. so.
It doesn't look like much, but neither would a Sicilian defense to the untrained eye. This is a performance enhancer. You don't see it. How about now? Manage your air quality, sharpen your performance, change the game with air things. A new opening for your wall is here. Capture new major pieces on unique metal posters from Displate. Now with the official collection from chess.com. Mount them in seconds with a tool-free magnet kit and swap them whenever you like. Make your move. Get an exclusive discount on all metal posters. Shop now with the code CHESS at displate.com. I am beyond excited to announce on February 23rd through 25th, we will be hosting the first ever chess.com invitational presented by Discraft at the famed course in Brooksville, Florida. We will be kicking off this year's Disc Golf Pro Tour in style with not only incredible disc golf, but many more activities. There will be a one-of-a-kind chess disc golf crossover you won't want to miss, as well as an exclusive chess.com fan zone. I personally couldn't be more pumped to bring epic disc golf competition and fun. Hope to see you all there. on Twitch drops during the CCT finals. Watch four cumulative hours of chess on Chess24 or Chess Channels and unlock a free 14 days of diamond membership on chess.com. Connect your accounts at go.chess.com slash connect to redeem and enjoy two weeks of premium features. And right now, it's time to enjoy the over the board action coming in from Toronto as we are about to kick off game two of round four in just a few moments. It's already been an incredibly dramatic day of chess. Can we expect some more Armageddon's coming in? Oh, I definitely think so. And we had a decisive game there at the end between Nodir Beckup, Dusatar, and Fabian Caruana. But Magnus Carlsen, Ikara Nakamura, I think that one is definitely going to Armageddon. <gasps> We'd love to see that one go all the way, David, into the Armageddon. Yeah, I want to see a fight in the game first, but I wouldn't complain about Armageddon. It's going to get faster, more furious, and yeah, whoever gets black in that one, I think, would be the favourite. They're just looking solid right now, and Hikaru is really perked up today. He's looked so much better than he did yesterday, uh, that first day blues, and yeah, I'm, it's hard to predict that one suddenly. I think Dennis Lazvik, he gets the white pieces against Maxime Vachelagrave. And in that first game, a solid draw with Black. Mm. White in game two, I don't think he's taking too much risk. He's a very solid repertoire. I think we'll see him in Armageddon once more. Oh, that's going to be amazing as well. And Dennis, he's been having these great games against the very best in the world. He hasn't managed to get up on the leaderboard, but that hasn't been reflective of his quality of chess here. Yeah, the zero doesn't tell the full story. He's been very accurate. He's that type of player. And he could beat Maxime if Maxime gives him the chance. The action is about to get started and we're going to go into our playing arena as we see the players are ready to go and to start some more chess. Wow, no handshakes there. Yeah, I think they must have <laughs> shaken hands beforehand uh, just uh, before the game started when they sat down. Uh, no animosity here, a lot of mutual respect of course, but D4 and Magnus thinking. He does play his knight out to f6, uh, his trademark move. And bishop to g5 for Trompovsky, just as Nakamura was displaying yesterday. He ventured this on several turns. Magnus must have prepared. What's so interesting about this is the openings that Hikaru have been playing, they're usually for surprise value. But when you play them over and over again, there's no longer the surprise. <laughs> Yeah, shows his faith, shows his confidence in these openings. And Magnus does play something slightly un uh, unorthodox there. Usually in the, that exact position, Black recaptures with the G-pawn towards the center. I think usually in chess, the default setting is towards the center, uh, unless you're kind of aiming to open up pieces, trying to accelerate your development. Now Black's D5 pawn is going to be eternally a target. So Magnus has to compensate with active pieces. and. I must say, bizarre that Magnus is the first one to really think, especially as you say, Robert, that uh, this is no longer a surprise weapon from Hikaru. And Magnus just made the big choice. He is the one who captured away from the center. This kind of resembles uh, some lines in the Dutch defense. He does defend that d5 pawn. His knight on b8 can develop next. The dark score bishop is already protecting the c5 pawn. And perhaps Magnus wanted to avoid the territory that Maxime Vacher Le Grave got himself into because Hikaru showed he has very deep preparation in some of these lines. And Hikaru had some deep preparation in game one of this match as well as Magnus himself admitted that he was taken by surprise and felt the pressure. 
can Hikaru continue with that? Uh, he takes out the knight in front of the king. It will eventually land on f4, trying to put more pressure on that d5 pawn. The development continues. Uh, are we expecting white's knight to land on f4? Quite possibly, if not now, then in the near future. First, he might decide to fear and keto his bishop. White's light squared bishop is stuck. There we go, who pushes the pawn, creating a nice, beautiful home for it on the g2 square. Again, peering at that weakness, the target, the d5 pawn for black. And uh, Hikaru, if he gets two more moves, if he gets his bishop there uh, on g2, gets castled, I think he's going to be loving his position long term. Strategically, very strong for white. Better pawn structure and targets. Especially if the center is closed, knights will thrive rather than bishops. So Magnus needs to play energetically and uh, creatively here to hold the balance. And once again, it is uh, Magnus who goes into a bit of a think in this position. How can he try to play energetically in this position? Does he start attacking Hikaru's center, take out the queen to b6, target the b2 pawn, not give white the enough time and tempo uh, to put pressure on the d5 pawn? I can tell you what I wouldn't do if I were Magnus. I wouldn't close the center by pushing the c5 pawn because that feels like it leaves the d5 pawn as a long-term weakness. He starts by taking on d4. That makes a lot of sense to me. It opens up his bishop on f8, gives it full scope of the diagonal, maybe out to b4 to pin that knight. His queen can go out to b6. That's one of the benefits of pushing pushing your C-pawn so early in a Sicilian or in this type of game, the queen can venture out, putting pressure on B2 and the white central pawn on D4. So I like the way that both players are handling it thus far. Uh, I think it's early stages, but for Hikaru, he's the one now taking a think here. Clearly, both players are on their own. Yeah, if he takes with the knight, it does look nice for white long term, but short term, I think uh, black has enough counterplay. This is a big, big weakness in the center, of course. Isolated pawn, IQP uh, here, but bishop to b4, as Robert also mentioned, uh, you hinted at this one. And unfortunately, white isn't quite in time. Okay, he's actually played this, but white isn't in time here to put enough pressure on this isolated queen's pawn and Magnus blitzing down this road. It does feel that Magnus maybe was in preparation, just took a while to uh, kind of familiarize himself, remind himself of what he had planned. And Bishop takes knight is actually a big strategic threat. Long term, white would be suffering with a broken structure there. So maybe you need to defend this knight with your queen. Maybe you step back with your fellow knight, but you're losing time. Uh, you're not playing happy moves here. You need your king to get to safety. But Magnus, energetic. Mm. Really nicely handled by Magnus Carlsen and a non-standard pawn structure out of the opening, but he doesn't give Hikaru the chance to get the ideal development structure. He does move ahead with the queen, so keeping the pawn structure intact. In any reality, does white go alongside castle? Mm, <laughs> maybe. Only if you're feeling super brave, <laughs> maybe reckless. Um, I've the got to say, file. yeah, the C file. It just looks too dangerous right now. And... Uh, yeah, just while this position settles down, I do like the quality of uh, Black's pieces. I don't like the quality of the deep pawn, though, the pawn structure, uh, but the air quality there, looking fair, looking fair. And uh, I think this position is fairly balanced right now, uh, just level chances. And it is about who uh, feels more comfortable uh, out there in Toronto in this arena. Uh, feels like both players just, again, probing, testing each other. And I like the fact that we're guaranteed a fight in this game. Uh, no peace treaty. Uh, in, in sight anytime soon. Yeah, because Hikaru, when he wants to draw, he forces it. He plays openings that require repetition. We've seen these two have uh, various repetitions, like uh, in the Berlin is what Hikaru usually does against um, Wesley and some D4 lines against Magnus. But here we have a fight. We have a pin along the B4 bishop down to the king on E1 with the queen in between them. So I like the position that we have. It seems like we could get quite some rich play but will Hikaru learn a lesson that Fabiano might have taught him, that Fabiano played on maybe a little bit too far, and then Magnus was able to seek control of that position? Yeah, talking of trying to kind of just maintain control, trying to uh, kind of kill the fun for Black here, how do we achieve that? Do we test uh, Magnus's intentions with the dark squared bishop? Do we just rush to get castled with the white king? Probably on the king side. I think, Tanya, at this point, it's probably uh, just a distant dream castling uh, on the long side, castling queen side right now. Uh, we were talking about the sea file. The rook has already landed on that. The long castle would uh, be hard to imagine as a possibility. But black, he's already threatening. Magnus is already threatening to jump ahead with the knight uh, targeting white's queen side. While Hikaru takes a think about how he wants to get those pieces developed and how he wants to get his king to safety, uh, let's head over to another juicy matchup, Wesley So with the black pieces, the man in form, the man to beat, is playing against Ali Reza Firuja. 
And regardless of how the tournament goes, we know Ali Reza, he always plays aggressive, dynamic chess. And what is that rook doing on e4? <laughs> yeah, wow, this is juicy. Ali Reza has already sacrificed a pawn. He's fighting against the Berlin Wall, the Berlin defense, normally one of the most rock-solid openings for black. But he's thrown a pawn away and he's saying, I've got active pieces. You mentioned that rook on e4, Tanya. It looks weird. It has just landed there. Uh, the white rook has, uh, yeah, maybe aggressive intentions in mind, but I don't really see the, the uh, compensation right now. Maybe it's just in the fact that black cannot quite fight for the center yet. Looks dynamic, right? That this pawn on d4 was threatened. That's why the rook came up to e4. That knight on c3 for white will jump forward into the position, putting pressure on that bishop on f6. So all of a sudden we see where white's pieces are going. Uh, should black just develop with that bishop on c8 to b7? It will stare through the knight towards that rook on e4. The b5 pawn is loose. Can that be captured? They're difficult questions to answer. And you know both players, they are trying to evaluate this position. Yeah, how to evaluate it. It's the hardest thing, Tanya. And I'm trying to evaluate how we even got here. Uh, David, you've got to do an action replay of how this opening went because, to me, I'm, I'm struggling. I get that this is perhaps coming out of uh, Spanish. What happened in the opening here? Yeah, so I mentioned it's the Berlin defence. So uh, after e4, e5, the knight's coming out, bishop to b5. This is the Spanish, the Roy Lopez. White puts pressure on this knight. The black knight comes out. White just castles, allowing a pawn to be grabbed. And here, after pawn to d4, knight back, we normally see the Berlin endgame after a trade on c6. Pawns coming off and queens coming off as well. This is well known, well explored. It's actually happened in this tournament already in the uh, last game between Maxim Vashilagrav and Denis Lazovic. But uh, here, Faruja surprised his opponent, Wesley So, by dropping back, simply saying, I'm going to be a pawn down. I don't care. Uh, White is ahead in development and the Black King is slightly vulnerable. But uh, here, White simply pu pushing forward with c3, and this is crazy stuff, Robert. He Ambitious offered stuff. another pawn, right? He could have captured on c3, but that would give White such a rapid lead in development. And Ali Reza Faruja, during the candidates, he played against Daniel Naroditsky in this really long bullet marathon when maybe some said he should have been preparing for his game. Daniel plays this style from the White side, so maybe he's picked something up from Daniel Naroditsky. Learning from the best, Alarisa Faruja there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the second pawn should not be captured. It was not captured. Black prioritized development. And if we catch up with the current position, b5 is a very clever move. Uh, this is recommended in various sources. Uh, you need to activate your pieces. The black knight's in the way of the d pawn, so you need to activate your bishop on the long diagonal. And wow, after bishop to b7 uh, in the game position, we were talking about some x ray vision here on the white rook. The white rook simply sidestepped Robert attacking this knight. Ambitious play. Do you think this is preparation for Malareza? It feels like it, because who puts their rook on f4 rather than, say, a bishop, if not uh, being well prepared in this line? But I like this for white. I think that Wesley right now can bring his c6 knight back to e7 to open up the scope of his bishop on b7. But we're getting into territory that uh, is about to get very complicated. Knight e7 has just been played. White is down a pawn. So do you think, David, that he's got enough compensation for it? The evaluation bar says yes, so I'll say yes, but uh, this is not what I would be risking, as you say. I mean, who puts a rook on f4? Uh, definitely not me. I would never dream of such a creative idea, but this is why Alariza is such a strong, dynamic, attacking player. I have a feeling, uh, just kind of trying to get into his mind right now, he wants to play the move pawn to d5, blocking out this bishop. You need to play against your opponent's pieces here. Who cares if you're a pawn down? Actually, the lack of a pawn on c2 means you do have a nice square for your bishop to retreat to later on. A beautiful diagonal if you can line up the bishop on c2, the queen on d3 along this diagonal later on. But first, it makes sense to block out this bishop. And maybe actually this comes with a threat of knight to e4. And this black bishop is slightly trapped. If you can take it, you would wreck black's pawn structure. So I'm going to say it's growing on me, white's position. The compensation is there, certainly. I'm really liking what Ali Reza has done here, playing for the initiative down a pawn. But a critical moment right now. The idea that David pointed out will uh, put big questions to Wesley to handle the threats on the pieces that are uh, quite clamped on the king side for black right now. We will check in with Ali Reza how he proves his compensation. Another very uh, interesting game that is developing is... Fabiano Caruana against Nordebeck. Now, Fabi has the white pieces. He needs to win this to force it to Armageddon. Nordebeck is leading the match with that first round marathon victory that he had. And the position up front, I see that Valbar says it's level. White does have the bishop pair. But to me, it just feels like black's pieces are more active. The queen and the bishop lined up on the diagonal, the knight on g4, all of them eyeing f2. The knight on d4 doesn't look very stable. There is a threat to actually pick up that pawn on the next move. I see the bishop pair, 
but I'm liking Black's piece activity here. Agreed. Uh, I couldn't have put it better myself, Tanya. Just every piece is active for Black. Who cares about the bishop pair, even if it's an open position, as long as the rest of your pieces are playing a part. And yeah, it's difficult. Fabi, it's going to be in the back of his mind. He needs a win, so he will be taking risks. And OK, he does kick the knight back out. I'm assuming it drops back into the centre uh, to e5, but yeah, no issues here for Abdi Storov. But considering how quickly Nordera plays in more complicated positions, that knight, if I'm not mistaken, has no other moves, right? Mm -hmm. That knight is under attack. It can't go forward, so knight e5 is the only option. So what is he thinking about here? Very good question. OK, eventually he dropped <laughs> his knight back. Maybe he was trying to peer into the future and uh, work out whether now he can go for that idea Tanya mentioned of taking a pawn, taking this knight. I was going to say, rook takes pawn now does look fraught with danger. You would be walking into a pin, trying to do some quick calculation. I don't think you should. I don't think you can get away with taking this pawn. And if that's the case, then now I like the bishop pair because it's two <laughs> bishops against two knights. The d4 pawn can be blockaded. So what Aaron Nimzovich always taught everybody is that if there's an IQP, and I said queen pawn, you want to blockade it with a knight so it can never push forward. And that is what he has available to him. He goes the other direction, knight to g6. Similar idea, just get the knight out of danger, block with uh, the piece on d5. But as David, you were pointing out, the brook takes d4 a move ago. That was not a free pawn. In fact, it handed white a free advantage. Yeah, this would have been disastrous for black. Two pieces vulnerable on the diagonal. So uh, very level position, but bishops versus knights is about who maneuvers uh, those minor pieces better in this ensuing middle game. And speaking of maneuvering, perhaps Nordebeck's knight can also maneuver from f8 to e6, putting more pressure on the weak d4 pawn that we're looking at right now. This one is going to be uh, quite a long, long fight, and we will check back in with it. Uh, meanwhile, also developments happening on our marquee matchup. Hikaru Nakamura with the white pieces against Magnus Carlsen. The first game did end in a draw. Speaking of the bishop pair, it looks like Magnus is the one who's got the bishop pair. The pawn structure, as we see, uh, was, uh, was shattered out of the opening. But in compensation, there we see the bishop pair. How much does that count right now? It counts for a lot. I also think we don't want to read too much into body language, at least in a typical game. This is not a typical game. It's Magnus versus Hikaru. And Magnus before, he looked like he was upright, just hunched over the board, thinking, yeah, my position looks good. And Hikaru's deep in thought. I like Black's position. You have this bishop pair in the center. You have great files for your rooks. The queen on b6 is on a, a nice square as well. I don't see how white builds up the pressure. And Black, Magnus, he plays a5. He may even throw away that pawn. Jettison it with a4 to try to get his pawns uh, into territory where they can't be counted on the c and d files. Yeah, I fully agree. Certain positions, uh, like the one we mentioned earlier, it's unclear where how strong the bishop pair can be. But right now, the bishops are complemented by some very strong pawns in the center uh, for Black. And there was a small trap in the position that we can maybe highlight. Uh, and wow, Magnus going for it right now, trying to open lines for his bishops. Uh, he, first, he pushed this pawn to a5. And I just want to mention, this pawn was poisoned. Do not take it. You walk into a horrible, horrible uh, double attack here after Queen takes, uh, recaptures the bishop. Suddenly a hit on this rook in the corner and a hit on the queen. This is why Hikaru actually preemptively shifted his rook from the corner over to b1 instead of taking on d5. And there was suddenly potentially a threat against this pawn. Magnus says, OK, take me if you dare. Pawn to d4, and this relies on the fact that after an exchange, suddenly white is again caught in two minds. Suddenly, this bishop hits the a pawn. Suddenly, black's rook is unleashed against the backward c2 pawn. And if you take with the queen, again, a skewer, a double attack, whatever you call it, disaster for white. This diagonal is just too vulnerable, and I think this would be disastrous. Suddenly, the bishop's really dominating the whole board. Uh, so the question is, can you take with a knight? Um, that's one I haven't figured out yet. I think that's one Hikaru's trying to figure out in the current position. Can he take twice? Feels like Magnus has something in mind here. This looks so, so dangerous with the pin. Maybe you move your bishop to attack this knight, and it's just hanging by a thread right now for Hikaru. With the bishop pair, seeing all the files on diagonal open up, uh, one gets the feeling that d4 might have been also an intuitive sacrifice rather than Magnus having calculated all the lines and how he's going to win the pawn back or take advantage of it. It's really so tempting. And you have a feeling that with the bishops and the rooks lined up, something has to work for black here. Yeah, for sure. All the pieces are on optimal squares. And even if white can grab the pawn on d4, the worst thing that happens for black is you grab the a3 pawn. So you're like, it's just a pawn trade. That's not a big deal. I didn't blunder anything. So that's the good news for Magnus. As you said, Tanya, it might be an intuition decision there. Like, let me just go for it. 
at the very least, I'm equal material, but he may even have more. Yeah, I'm looking at ideas like bishop to e5, maybe bishop to g4, kick away this rook before taking back on this square. But Hikaru goes for it. He's uh, maybe obliged to go for this, otherwise he's just suffering for nothing. Often in chess, if you're worse, if you realize you have a disadvantage, you might as well grab some material, you might as well get some long-term advantages and hope to survive, suffer uh, for a reason. But right now, it's up to Magnus Carlsen. I'll let him make the decision rather than myself because it's calculation time. He needs to justify uh, this sacrifice. If he takes that pawn, uh, as you mentioned, Robert, on a3, he's probably still slightly better, but um, he might be looking for more, first of all. So many options here for yeah, Black. And that so can be difficult for a player. In fact, it can backfire. Like, oh, I have so many options. My position is great. But then you burn clock trying to figure out the best path forward. I liked this move, bishop e5 or bishop c5, to induce c3. That's an option. I'm wondering in those lines, can Black also go after the b3 pawn? But there are pins galore. It's not easy to calculate. So Magnus, he's investing time wisely. And as uh, Magnus does just that, uh, trying to figure out the way forward after giving up that pawn, we will check in with this game. Meanwhile, action is really heating up as Ali Reza Firuja has sacrificed an exchange for once again to get that attack and initiative against Wesley So. We are going to jump into that as it is a critical moment between these two players. Their first game ended in a draw and this one looks like draw is perhaps the least likely of the results is there enough compensation for white here Oof, i'm surprised i've got to say the evaluation bar if i were black i would be tempted to resign it looks like <laughs> checkmate but uh, with cold-blooded defense which wesley so is capable of uh, it looks like black should be able to survive this onslaught look at that white queen though look at the white knight the two white bishops both pointing towards the king's side the black structure is totally shattered I mean, it looks so, so dangerous right now. But uh, this is where engines <laughs> kill the joy, kill the fun. I love it, though. Ferruja playing to his strengths. But he's also maybe playing into a trap because Wesley So, he may not bring the heat. He doesn't always initiate the complications. But when they're brought to him, he says, let's do this thing. And Wesley has been in great form thus far. I think he was fortunate to survive the first game between these two. He ended up sacrificing his queen for a couple of rooks rather than stealing a pawn. But in this position, I mean, Wesley, he's shown that he can defend. He did it against Maxime Vachelagrave in their Armageddon game. And in this current position we see that black has a rook for just a bishop and black also still has an extra pawn so it's one of these things where if white is not quick if white doesn't seize the initiative right here and right now you're down a whole lot of material and black has a basic but an extremely strong threat on the board right now let's show it tanya <laughs> <laughs> big threats uh, should not be missed and i don't think alareza ferruja will miss that there's actually a checkmate in one threat back rank uh, checkmate here queen to e1 uh, but he does need to therefore cover this square on e1 or at least cover the first rank. It makes sense as well to try and activate this white rook eventually. So that uh, does beg the question where to move this bishop. Uh, therefore, you would cover the e1 square. You can choose d2, e3, h6, multiple options. Uh, but what to do here? Um, I mean, the first one I would look at, create a threat. Why not? But the problem is you might want to use that square for your queen. Mm -hmm. And after the black rook simply moves, same threat persists. Uh, again, queen to e1 would be a back rank checkmate within two moves, even at the cost of a queen. He does play bishop to d2 instead. And uh, wow, Wesley bringing the other rook into the game. I was going to say this is a bit odd to trap your rook on f8, but <laughs> um, yeah, he's activating all his pieces. Still needs a breakthrough, Feruja here. Something we've yet to speak about, though, is look at Feruja's clock. I feel like usually it's Ali Reza putting pressure on someone on the clock. Now it's Wesley do that. He's nearly eight minutes. Now Ali Reza's down to three and a half minutes in this position where Feruja's down in exchange, has to deal with some back rank threats constantly, doesn't have a clear path to delivering any sort of checkmating attack of his own. I have to like Wesley's chances here, just the way he's playing overall. And given this current situation, Wesley so looks like he might go four to four. Yeah, and that last move, rook to e8, uh, it does have a deep idea as well. Not only are you blocking white's bishop from stepping onto h8-6 because of the mate on e1, if it's black to play here, let's say white makes the natural move h3, creating a lift for the king, black is threatened to actually push out that knight from c3 with advancing that b-pawn, and then black's queen would have landed on e2, which is why I think Ali Reza, he's played a really nice prophylactic move here. With putting that bishop on d3, it might look like he's just attacking the b5-pawn, but he's also controlled a very key e2 square from where a queen trade could have been offered. Yeah, and here we see a helping hand from uh, the engine, from Stockfish, suggesting three moves that give black a, quite a significant advantage. So 
It uh, basically proves that Black's material, the extra material, the extra exchange and pawn that Robert mentioned, I mean, it's the most important factor right now. White's attack is an illusion. Black's knight on g6, knights are a king's best friend, is holding the fort, covering everything. And, OK, he plays pawn to b4. Not one of the moves suggested by the engine, uh, but still looks very natural. And White apparently only has one move to minimize the damage. That's wow. the knight to b5. That is not an intuitive move, because knight goes away from where most of the action is taking place. But you're trying to distract the black knight, and he, he finds, finds it. it. He understands the knight on d6 is the critical defender of this position. And if you take this knight on b5, in comes that white knight to f5. Mm. Queen h6 to follow. Queen g7 checkmate. Thank you very much. Wow. What a trick. What a trap. So vigilant there. Just full board awareness. Like and, and this is Ali Reza's strength, right? He finds these creative ideas on the board, just voluntarily sacrifices the exchange for a long-term initiative and now finds the defender. He's getting rid of it. Wesley, so he needs to be precise in this uh, position. He's got a lot to think about. And meanwhile, big update coming in. Uh, Danis Lazovic has drawn his second game against Maxime Vacher Legrave. The 17 year old should be very proud right now. Maxime Vacher Legrave, he has been on fire. He's had some tremendous games, one of the best in the world. And the youngster for whom this is the platform that he's been waiting for, the opportunities that he's been waiting for, he's been showing amazing class himself. That one goes into Armageddon. And here, anything can happen. This was a position that I thought Wesley had the obvious upper hand. Now I'm looking at it, that F5 square is juicy, and a knight might plop right on it and try to help deliver a checkmate. So Dennis Lazvik, Maxime Vachelagrov, they'll go to Armageddon for Dennis Lazvik, 0 out of 3 thus far in match play. But he's really been just a couple moves away in every single match from being on the scoreboard. We'll see if he can get that done. But right now we're going to have to see if Ali Reza can turn this disadvantage into a win. Yeah, Wesley just missed this one. I think it was that simple. Wesley assumed that he had full control, and he nearly did. But just one careless slip, and suddenly tactics again. Uh, knight and f5 will thrive, that's the rhyme. Uh, knight f and f5, we're live, as James uh, Canty would say. And uh, yeah, suddenly big, big threats. Actually a narrow path, potentially, for Wesley to save this game. I think it's just that powerful. The white knight, if it does land on f5, would just spell the end. So uh, this is a narrow window of opportunity to kill white's attack, but... I'm struggling to find it. Why? I mean, Wesley's so struggling to find it as well. He's tanked now for a couple of minutes. He, find, he finds the move bishop to a6. Wow, clever, clever defense there. Lovely move by Wesley. So he's realizing that I've had a material advantage. If I have to give some of it away to save my king, that is the best decision. And he may be saying, OK, if the knight takes the knight on d6, then the bishop on d3 uh, can be captured here. And you just don't have enough firepower. Knight f5 still looks really scary. I don't even want your rook. I'm going to go for checkmate. But once I take your knight on f5 and you take back with your knight, I can make this move queen to e4. And the point is queen h6. Still checkmate and one is the threat, but I get to take your knight away on f5. You don't have another defender. Yeah, just in time. It's all hanging by a thread, but it is surviving for Wesley So. And the critical line, therefore, is after knight takes knight to take this black rook. But as you said, Robert, you're no longer the exchange up. You still have an extra pawn, though. As long as you survive this attack, only black can be better with the queen coming into e2. It's all of these ideas we've mentioned. Uh, Tanya's queen e2. And uh, yeah, right now, I think Alareza a bit disappointed that Wesley did find the best defense. Just precise uh, play by Wesley. He's so resourceful and just so hard to crack or beat, even in these positions. Knight b5 arrives on the board, and Mayor Mottles would just collapse at that moment. But he finds the right path, and it is on the board. Will Alareza now grab the rook? And more exciting news coming in as we will have another Armageddon as Ikaru Nakamura and Magnus Carlsen have drawn their. Second game. I knew I recognized that shirt blocking Alarese's <laughs> camera for a while there. It was Magnus Carlsen. He did finish. And uh, we have more chess uh, to look forward to from him a bit later on. But uh, Magnus is out of there. And uh, let's focus back on this one where Alarese retreats. Not a good sign usually, but that knight was no longer playing a purpose on the edge of the board. I'm still looking at the clock and Alarese down nearly to a minute and a half, whereas Wesley has nearly five minutes on his clock. So knight goes back to f3. The black king is no longer in harm's way. Uh, perhaps at this point, Alarese just wants to say rookie ones are trading pieces and going for a draw. But I don't see an advantage for either side at the moment. One does feel, though, that white has to have enough compensation with black's destroyed pawn structure as well. Bishop e2 played. Uh, it's also against the idea of the queen sliding onto a5. White's rook. You've got to be a little careful. Do you want to make a move like rookie one, allowing tactics like bishop takes knight and... 
perhaps Bishop takes knight, he plans to take on e e7 and things are still under control. So while these players work out the tactics, we will uh, keep an eye out and uh, come back to this. But... Fabiano Caruana against uh, Nordebeck Abdusatrov. Also very, very critical as Fabi's got about a minute on the clock. And it is his move right now. Nordebeck ahead on the clock. Nordebeck needs only a draw. And we were quite happy with his position last when we left it. And I think we still should be. Fabiano needs a miracle. It's as simple as that, Robert. So he needs to turn into Wesley So and then thrive in Toronto. But that's not happening here. This is dominance on display from Nordebeck Abdusatarov. He's kind of a kryptonite for Fabiano. He beat him over the boy classical chess in the Olympiad. He beat him to win the Chess Kid Cup. Here he won game one, and he might even just win game two. I don't even think he'll offer a courtesy draw. He's not that type of player. Sometimes when you're at one nothing, all you need is a draw to win the match. We saw Wesley do this against uh, Hikaru. Gave him a draw, kind of a, a sympathy draw. That's not happening when Nordebeck Abutsutaro is playing because there are also FIDE rapid points on the line. He wants to increase his rating. Yeah, and look at that. The computer says there are two winning moves for Black right now. White has just snapped off a pawn. Fabiano decided to suffer for something, and this is a material advantage, but the Black Rook coming into F3 being the top move, that's the most natural move in the position as well. And uh, I think he will play it. It's more about the follow-up. It looks like the White King is just devoid of any defenders right now. Black has a Queen coming in, a Knight coming in, a Rook coming in. Everything's gathering. The storm clouds are just hovering above there. And he's going to move his Rook. Look at that body language. It's on the board. And now Nothing you're thinking... Too. About, yes, all the sacrifices, but he first picks up the pawn. You're hitting the d2 bishop, you're attacking the g3 pawn, the f2 pawn is pinned, uh, and uh, Fabiano Carmona has only 40 seconds to solve all these problems. Can he do it? No, there's no way. It's even material. So it's not even like Nordebeck had to sacrifice anything to get to this position. And he does attack that rook on f3, did Fabi? The rook goes to d3. So b3 is loose. There's some checks on the first rank that are about to happen. I see the evaluation bar going up for Fabi, but I see his time going down. And it just doesn't give me much hope for him. Yeah, I just want to highlight one moment where actually he could have wrapped it up in style, Abdus Sotorov. After rook to f3, the queen dropped back. Guess what black's best move is? Uh, this isn't me. This is the computer that suggested it. Or Rook E3, Robert. <laughs> this would have been the, I'm going to say it, sexiest move uh, <laughs> of the tournament so far. Um, just overwhelming white defences. There's a threat of a sacrifice here going for checkmate, and a knight coming in would have been disastrous for white. But if we catch up with the current game, is he surviving Fabiano? That's the question. The answer is no. He's the exchange down. Uh, we saw a tactical uh, kind of sequence there, and... Simply nothing to be done. Let's just show that in slow motion. Queen to b2, an attack, a double attack against this bishop. He did try to defend by taking, giving up his queen with the idea of bishop to c3 check. But Fabiano played, uh, no, sorry, Abdus Satorov played queen takes c1 check. Intermediate move, uh, in between move there. And now it's just a lost endgame. Yeah, this is easy at this stage because there are pawns on both sides of the board. If you could sweep off the queenside pawns, if none remain, then maybe there would be some chances for Fabiano to hold the draw. And he's going for this technique. He really would like to trade B-pawn for A-pawn, but why in the world would Nordirbeck allow that? He can instead bring his rook to D3. He does just that. Try, try to take the B-pawn uh, for himself, and there's nothing Fabiano can do. It's been a tough day in the office for Fabi. He lost his uh, round three to Magnus Carlsen. It looks like he will be losing round four to uh, Nordebeck Abdu Satrov. He's got so much time on the clock as well, Fabi, under 30 seconds. And I like that Nordebeck has slowed down because this got him a little bit into trouble in their first game, in their first encounter. So it's a good idea. You're up in exchange. You want to just, you just want to draw. You want to try and wrap it up as quickly as possible. Nordebeck, he keeps playing fast. Yeah, he saw the Stop. frustration on his face. He was trying to force himself to slow down. He's so <laughs> excited right now, and rightly so, because he's about to wrap up a win. I think this last maneuver was the clincher, putting the black rook behind white's Oh, but there's tactics. Yeah, that was actually really nicely done by Fabi. He what? trades off the queenside pawns, and yet it's still losing, according to the engines. And it's probably just because the black king will infiltrate. Uh, the rook is in a perfect position, and here comes king f5, pawn g5. He may be able to spring for an outside pass pawn as well. Yeah, this is, sti is still winning, but uh, I was about to praise him yeah. for pinning and winning. Uh, instead, it's far less simple. Uh, sometimes you can hold a fortress here, but unfortunately, rook and three versus bishop and three usually is a win, and white just cannot hold the light squares long term. And Nadebeck, Nadebeck's question is, will he just 
get a draw and uh, wrap up the match? Or is he going to try for more? Because points do count here, Robert. Points are important in those top eight standings. I see you shaking your head. But you know, these youngsters, I have a feeling he's going to try to push this one. There could be nothing on the line and Abdul Zatar would still be playing. Like he could be in his backyard playing against his favorite person in the world and a draw is still good enough. He says, no, he's that much of a fighter. And I think that's what people love about his style. He should get invited to all the tournaments where it's, you know, the organizer has to pick some people because he always fights. There's never a game where he takes it off. And why should he give Fabian a draw? He's got no risk in this position. Yeah, I even forgot that a draw was sufficient for him because he's been playing such aggressive chess. Uh, he's not been backing down. And this is good wisdom for anyone at home as well. Even if you're happy with a draw, play objectively correct chess. Play for the win. That's the best way of securing that result later on. If you play too passively, negatively, tentatively, it will backfire. Your opponents will punish you. And uh, he's being rewarded for his courage here. Abdu Satorov, he's trying to break through. White's holding the fortress, Fabiano, still tenacious defense, but it shouldn't be enough long term. Although the eval bar going right back towards the middle. So just as you said that, he pushed F5, which was apparently the wrong idea. And now it seems that Fabi may hold this draw, but without time on the clock, what should happen doesn't usually happen. Yeah, this last move, putting pawns all on light squares, a bit strange, but uh, yeah, we'll see how this one plays out. Yes, um, Modebeck undoubtedly will go for uh, as long as he can and uh, Fabiano Caruana will have to earn this draw. Meanwhile, we've earned ourselves a lot of fun because we're already guaranteed three Armageddons as Ali Reza Perugia and Wesley So also ends in a draw. Ali Reza sacrificing the exchange, finding his counterplay, this amazing play and Wesley with his resistance, impossible to crack. But in the end, there will be a sudden death in each of these games. And this one continues. Fabi doing all that he can to hold on. Is this now closer to draw territory? I think yes. Um, I mean, I was just singing his praises, Abdul Satorov, but he's kind of allowed Fabiano to get a fortress. I, he probably was thinking, can I sacrifice my rook for this bishop? You can tell that the wheels are turning in Nordebrecht's head. His king is coming around. I don't know where to, but king can go to d1, e1, f1, g1, h2. I don't know what to do with it, but the king can just wrap itself around and actually probably block them. But there may allow an f4 at some moment. Fabi does need to be very careful because if that pawn structure is shattered and the h4 pawn is loose, that could once again give Nordebrecht some winning chances. And the thing about these end games is you can play accurately for 20 moves, for 30 moves, but very often the pressure just keeps accumulating till uh, eventually you allow a break like f4 or a winning king pawn ending. And has that happened? Well, the king has found its way to e1. Things are getting nasty for white already. Yeah, the king has infiltrated. It's found its way behind enemy lines. And yeah, I think holding this one now is going to be, well, it's going to need a miracle. It's going to be super tough and... What's the winning plan here for Black? Something to do with Robert's F4. I'm not <laughs> sure when, where, <laughs> why, but uh, it is F4. You need to break White's pawn structure. Everything's defended right now. You need to ensure that that won't be the case long term. F2 is the base of White's pawn chain as well. So if you attack that one, um, you do tie down White's remaining pieces. Fabi playing under 10 seconds. Nordebeck still enough time. He's putting the pressure on the board and on the clock and making progress slowly but steadily. Yeah, he wants the. Now he gets f4. So he finally, at long last, has been able to push the pawn. He's shattering White's pawn structure. And Fabi takes it, but that can't be good. The pawns are split, and you're probably just losing one on the spot. Look at that body language. He shifts. He knows he's got the job done. That is big progress. Once he split the pawns, he's going to go for them. Uh, now the king can also go up to f3. You start threatening. Rook takes f2 pawn at the right moment. Ooh, yeah, rook g2. And our rook f2 is rook f2 winning in these positions. Yes, it is. And that is it. Fabi resigns. A king pawn ending would be lost. And look at Nadebeck. He's happy of course he is he beat fabiano caruana who's had the best year in classical chess of anybody 2-0 in a must-win match so norbeck entered the day with zero match points now he's won two in a row and he has found his form and fabi immediately leaves without setting up the pieces it has been a disappointing day for world number two he lost to magnus now goes down to norbeck abdusatrov who after a tough start on uh, day one where he lost both his games. He's made a comeback on the leaderboard. And these are the results of round four. We've got three big Armageddons coming up. Igaru Nakamura, Magnus Carlsen, Firuja, Wesley, Lazovic, Maxim Vashelagrav all go down to the buyer.
And David, what was the highlight for you? And once again, tough to choose. Yeah. Tough to choose, but it will be that uh, only decisive game uh, from that last round. And uh, it was Nodebek Abdusatorov's attack. In the end, he did find a way to convert his advantage. Oh, it took a while, though, and uh, after Rook to F3, it was this little sequence. The Queen dropping back, and there might have been stronger moves. He found something strong and simple. Queen takes D4, double threat, attacking this bishop, and due to the pin along this diagonal, threatening this G3 pawn. After Queen to G3, he wrapped it up with this nice tactic. Queen to B2, and a slow action replay of this trick. Queen takes Knight was not a defence. Do not take the queen, it is poisoned. After bishop to c3, check. White would save the game by winning the black queen back. Instead, the black queen is doomed anyway, so why not give it away for the highest price? Queen takes rook, check. And only then, winning the material exchange up, he converted it smoothly. Breath taking play there, and hold your breath, everyone, as we are going straight to Toronto, as Kaya is with Hikaru and Magnus and their Armageddon bids. At the moment, everyone is waiting for Armageddon bids between Hikaru and Magnus. You guys, turn your boards. Let's see it. Magnus. Oh, 15 minutes. I guess that means you win it. Nine minutes, 40 seconds was your reaction, Hikaru. Well, it's funny because I actually thought about bidding 15 minutes just to get white uh, in between these two games. But yeah, that's what it is. You just play the game. Can you reveal your tactics with bidding 15 minutes, Magnus? Yeah, I wanted to, to play white, but... I thought he would be at a little bit lower. So uh, I, I mean, knowing that I could have bid uh, nine thirty nine and one, mm, not so happy with that. But that's okay. Well, you guys go for fair. Thank you for uh, placing your bids here. Back to you. Wow, fifteen minutes uh, by Magnus making his intentions very clear that he wants the white pieces at any cost. Yeah, I think he doesn't trust Hikaru's repertoire at the moment because he keeps playing these odd lines. But when it comes down to one game against Magnus Carlsen with a time deficit, I think that's when Hikaru, he won't be as adventurous. He'll stick to his main repertoire. Yeah, I mentioned earlier, Magnus is traditionally the king of Armageddon. So many Armageddon wins, but... You saw the doubt in his voice there. He wasn't sure. Hikaru still has enough time. And uh, if Hikaru gets out the opening in good shape, it's going to be a race on the clock. Well, this is uh, going to be a lot of fun, the Armageddon that is coming up. We've got three of them. Uh, and Magnus there with his bid against Hikaru Nakamura. They are ready to go. Magnus will start with the white pieces. Hikaru takes on black. Hikaru needs only a draw to win this match. And we will be back with this Armageddon that you don't want to miss. Do not go anywhere. We're here in Toronto for the Global Championship. I got Fabiano Caruana with me. You don't need to talk yet. I got James Cantu. We We're going to see who recognizes these guys out of the uh, out of the random passerbys. And we're going to ask them some fun questions about chess. For five bucks, do you know who this is? No? Okay. Actor. An actor. Well, you see this guy. Any idea who he is? Somebody very famous. Mm -hmm. He is. Rob. Um, this is actually 50 Cent's brother. His name is Daryl. Yeah. That's right. Goes by 75. Yeah. You want to play chess? Yeah. Okay. So what is he a player or something of chess? He is a chess player. I'm not, I, but I, he I, is. I play on the side. Yeah. I've been taking some coaching lessons from yeah. Grandmaster Canty over here recently. Guy over here. Calculation over everything. What's your name again, sir? Uh, my name is Jamie. What's your name? I already know it. It's, uh, it's Daniel. Yeah, Daniel Naroditsky. <laughs> okay. There it is. Come on. Don't on the attack, that. baby. On the attack. If he wins, I know the guys at chess.com will get him a diamond membership. Okay. Do you know what that is? Yes. Okay. Is that something you want? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Look at you. Is this a London? He playing a Yo, we got a pro here with the London. Full on London. How'd it go? I won. You won. The game. won. Okay. You won. That's you great. Won. Hey. Good, good game. All right. I should have said youtube.com slash CSQ pod. What is the URL? Just YouTube. I actually don't remember. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just look, at, look at the pod. Chess again? No, this is spell chess. Do I dare read the instructions or should I go in without reading them? I didn't read the rules. This man is just blundering. What? Basically, it's normal chess, but there are two spells, jump and freeze. The freeze is applied to a three by three area. Man, this game is hard. What? Freeze here, knight check. Boom, that's me. Oh, that's, that's, that's incredible stuff. 
Oh, oh. Freeze. Wait. Ah! a jump spell, which allows you to jump over a piece. And I'm setting up a win. Oh! Then Black would just freeze me. Then I make a double threat. You don't have any freezes left. So if here, this is too hard. Wait, once I get the hang of this, we're gonna be winning so many games though. I can't block with any of those pieces, but I can use this, this, and then this. <laughs> freeze this, and then go here. Yay, I won! Let's go! He cannot take my bishop. He cannot take my bishop. <laughs> it's a nice feeling when you start understanding the game and you win. Oh, they resign! I'm not even lying. I think I'm one of the greatest spell chess players to ever play spell chess. That was fun. I'm enjoying this. It doesn't look like much, but neither would a Sicilian defense to the untrained eye. This is a performance enhancer. You don't see it. How about now? Manage your air quality, sharpen your performance, change the game with air things. Registration is now open for the CCL Spring 2024 season. Represent your school in the Premier University League for Team Chess. Compete against top talents like GM Wanda Liang, Benjamin Bach, and Oparin. Stake your claim for the $25,000 price fund. Use the command CCL in chat to learn how to register. And uh, the chess doesn't stop even on day two of the Champions Chess Tour Finals as we have not just one, but three Armageddons coming up. And uh, we're also going to be revealing the bids as Kaya caught up with Westy So and Ali Reza Farooja. This guy is so sneaky. He has been peeking. Wesley, no peeking. No peeking. I All right. Some, yeah, I thought a little bit. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> let's not keep the tension. Yeah, you guys, yeah. turn your boards and let's see what your Armageddon bids are. Let's see it. Show it to the camera. So we do have 929, 853. That means you will be playing with the black pieces. Ali Reza, what was the thought behind this bid? That's low. Yeah, I mean, um, I think I have better chances if, uh, if I have two results in my favor. So. <laughs> but yeah, it's always double edged and anything could happen. He's incredible with speed, this guy. So how do you feel yeah. about playing with the white pieces now, uh, Wesley? Well, I need Danny Wrench to help. He need to like predict who's going to win <laughs> in, in the playing hole. Yeah, yeah, in the One minute hole. before the game. Yeah, yeah. We, I, need, I need his help now. Yeah. You guys, best of luck in your game. Thank you so much Thank for you. placing your bids here. Armageddon is coming up. Back to you guys. Kaya, we are so excited. Three amazing fights coming up. Ali Reza gets the black pieces. Was that a cat that Wesley so just drew on his Armageddon bid? I think it was his cat. We know how much Wesley loves his cat. Brings him some good luck, so why not? <sighs> Yeah, they've both uh, been playing chess worthy of works of art. That was Wesley's work of art. I mean, I admire it. I admire it. That picture alone could be worth a lot of money, especially if he wins this Armageddon game. This is going to be really exciting. And speaking of Armageddon, we've got one more. Let's take a look at the bids between these two. And this was a close one. Maxime Vachel Legrave takes it with his 9 minute 24 second bid and will be starting with the black pieces. Dennis Lazovic with white will have to win on demand. Robert, what do you make of that? Maxime happy with his bid and getting black? 
It's quite low. I mean, all these players are bidding in that territory with the exception of Magnus at 15 full minutes. But I think for Dennis Lazovic, you have to use the time as a weapon. The problem is you're playing one of the best prepared, deepest prepared players on the planet. And someone, he looks cozy in that T-shirt. Yeah, Maxime, I think he's made a good bet just based on the stats. Dennis is yet to win a single game in the finals so far. But on uh, Dennis's side, what speaks for him is that He's been upping it day by day. Day one, he drew a couple of games but lost both matches. Now it's his second Armageddon of day two. It feels like he's moving in the right direction. He just needs to make that breakthrough. He just needs a stroke of fortune or that killer instinct. He needs to make use of those extra minutes. Danis Lasovic has to forget the match score. He has to look within himself and find the strength in the amazing chess that he has been playing against the very best in the world. He starts with White. It's no easy task for the 17-year-old, but one win is all that he needs right now. I feel like he must play something different than he normally does because he has such a solid repertoire. He can draw any of these players in the field with the white pieces, and he drew Maxime with black as well. But he, to win on demand, he, I think, is going to have to choose a new opening, mm -hmm. something that has more fight to it. These two did draw their uh, rapid games and will fight it out in the Armageddon. And Hikaru Nakamura also drew his two rapid games against Magnus Carlsen. He starts with the black pieces. Magnus, with that 15-minute bid, do you think he kind of got a little bit into Hikaru's head there? I'm not sure. Maybe he got into his own head because 15 minutes, that is brave. But if the opening doesn't go Magnus's way, he will regret choosing white. And uh, Hikaru does have enough time. Uh, Hikaru has plenty of time by his standards, at least. You make that bid of 15 minutes and you're just saying I'm going to crush you. Well, Magnus also said yesterday that it's good to switch up your bid so you're not predictable when it comes to the next Armageddon. That said, as you're suggesting, Tanya, he wants the white pieces. He feels confident he can win the game. And the big question is, what will Hikaru play with black? Because in most of his games, he's playing offbeat stuff. But the line that he chose earlier with pushing his DNC pawn forward, he managed to survive out of the opening and neutralize it really quickly. But Magnus will not let that happen this time. Uh, he has to win. Uh, black needs only a draw in the Armageddon. Magnus Carlsen starts with 15 minutes. Hikaru Nakamura starts with result odds. And this isn't the only exciting matchup. It is also Ali Reza Firuja against Wesley. So guys, this is going to be a hard, hard Armageddon uh, to call. We'll have to do a lot of jumping around. Yeah, it's going to be tough. We'll have to follow the action where it lands. But I mean, one thing that's going to be tough is avoiding being distracted by that shirt during the Armageddon. <laughs> I mean, that could be mind games with the clock ticking. Just kind of look at my shirt. <laughs> well, Levon Aronian called. He wants his style back. <laughs> but I feel like Levon will be cheering on Ali Reza just because of that shirt. And his play has also been stylish mm. in this event. Even his match against Wesley. I mean, the way he's just sacrificing material. First a pawn, then an exchange. In the first game, I think he had Wesley on the rope. So Ali Reza now gets the black pieces. I I think he'll tone it back, though. You don't want to continue playing so aggressively when all you need is a draw. Ali Reza Firuja playing the chess that he's best known for. And there we see Wesley So has arrived. Handshakes have happened. The three Armageddon games are ready to be underway. Uhin, the world's best players. And uh, now we go. Handshake and we're off. Magnus Carlsen. He starts with the king's pawn instead. So veering away from that double queen's gambit. And we see Nakamura employ the Petrov defense. Solid stuff. And it, <laughs> again, the Damiano variation that we saw yesterday. He employed this with success. What do you think, Robert? It's one of these decisions where either Magnus looked at Hikaru's games because he played this yesterday, or he didn't look at it because it's so ridiculous that he would play this at the highest level. And Hikaru, well, what risk does he have right now? That being said, it's an equal position on move four, move five. Who cares? It's Magnus Carlsen. He's proven time and time again he can somehow squeeze water out of a stone. Will he be able to in this Armageddon game? That's the big question. Yeah, and interesting that Magnus doesn't go for any forcing lines, any direct lines. We saw complicated battles in this variation yesterday. Magnus says, my approach in this Armageddon is to slowly outplay you later and uh, maybe hustle you on the clock. It's very strategic, very slow right now. Actually, this is a well-known position with colors reversed. And uh, it's odd to see the white knight stay on e5 in the Petrov defense. Um, looks like Nakamura's prepared, though, playing super quick up to this point, only spending a few seconds. Magnus brings his bishop out. Slight advantage because he has that centralized knight. He has the first move in uh, these types of symmetrical positions. 
And it is about fighting that night on E5 uh, with your own pieces as Black here, expecting Hikaru to line up his rook on the E file, develop his own knight to C6, try to trade off that very strong piece that is posted on E5. The task is clear for both these players. Magnus has no choice but to keep the game going. He has to try and keep as many pieces on the board. But one more set of minor, pie one more, one set of minor pieces will come off uh, in the center of the board. Very it's very easy. likely, but it's hard to know when to capture it because if Black captures the 95 at some moment, a pawn will replace the knight, and then there will be attacking chances for White, namely with that bishop on d3. So I think Magnus, he needs to play a little bit quickly here. Hikaru with nine minutes remaining on his clock, I think he's off to the best start imaginable. Yeah, Hikaru will be thrilled. He might not look it. I'm not sure what face number that is of Hikaru's right now. Shielding. <laughs> oh, Danny might tell you off for that one. <laughs> but shielding uh, the glare of Magnus, but he's solid, and that's all he can ask for. Solid uh, is the name of the game right now with the Petrov defense. Rook has lined up. We are expecting a knight development. And meanwhile, Magnus takes his time, but he's got to be careful because he has to keep the pressure on the clock as well. If the clocks level out, then it's just result odds for White. And uh, Hikaru does not develop the knight, but strikes immediately in the center, targeting the main defense of that e5 knight. Huge decision, though, because if Magnus just captures the pawn that was placed on c5, there will be an isolated queen pawn for Hikaru. That's not a bad thing necessarily, but when you don't have so much time, I think players tend to struggle protecting that pawn. You operate around it, that's true, but defending it, that's a different story. Yeah, big uh, big decision, as you mentioned, Robert, to change the pawn structure. <clears throat> I just don't know whether Hikaru is playing for the results yeah. or... Sorry, I'll let you take it away there. Yeah. You're absolutely right here. C5 is a very committal move by Hikaru. And we will come back to this and see what Magnus decides. How does he respond to these questions being asked at the center of the board? Remember, it's all about the fight for that E5 post. Meanwhile, action is heating up on the other Armageddons as well. And uh, big fights all around right now. Magnus really taking his time. 12 minutes on the clock, He's and we will come back to this, but let's jump over to Wesley So and Ali Reza Firuja. That one, I am expecting not to be such a strategic fight, the kind of chess that we've been seeing from Ali Reza. I think we're going to see some fireworks already on the board. You don't wear that shirt and then just play for a boring draw. And we have a position where White has these double pawns in the C file. That may seem like a bad thing, but inherent to having double pawns is an open file. You see the queen and the rook for White are more active than Black's pieces. The queen on D8 doing not so much at the moment. But will there be an attack? That's the big question. White will need to storm up the king side, try to open up some lines. And uh, yeah, sorry everyone about that. It's been a long day of chess, a long day of uh, action. And uh, yeah, I've got to say, I really like White's position here. But my question is, is it Wesley So style? Uh, if the only way to break through is to throw pawns forward towards the Black King, I don't know. It feels risky somehow. It feels like you might have to sacrifice something at some point. And the time advantage is now down to three minutes. It's not going to be easy. And uh, Wesley So needs to take action now or in the next few moves if he really wants to motor forward and attack, win this game. And one way to do that is to start pushing the G pawn, right? You want to get that pawn rolling. You want to try and open up the G line, get G4, get G5 in. Perhaps even look at sacrificing the G pawn to open up uh, the G file. And Wesley is trying to find his way forward. While White's plan is clear, you either prepare it with the line that David's pointing out, F3, G4, maybe Bishop E2, G4, maybe Rook, G1, G4. But what is Black's way of getting counterplay against White's king on the other side of the board? Well, if White's going to pawn storm on the king side, why not pawn storm on the queen side? And uh, I'm not sure how exactly you do this. Uh, sometimes you can throw this pawn forward. That might not get you anywhere. You can throw a pawn to a6. Maybe then you hint at a move like c5 at the right moment. But yeah, every pawn push comes with consequences. Maybe a6, b5, and then throw a knight into c4. Um, various options. But I think because he has draw odds for Ruzia, he can sit. The pressure is on white, the onus is on white, and maybe he doesn't even need to attack. Maybe just to move like queen to e7, just uh, kind of centralize your pieces, connect the rooks, and look at this. Uh, okay, he's pausing now, but Wesley's a time advantage down to two minutes only. I was going to say something similar, that because Alreza only needs a draw, instead of pushing pawns forward, maybe he'll bring his knight backwards because he might want to offer a knight trade. Then he can, might bring his bishop that's on f6 over one square to g5, offer a trade of bishops. So trades, I think they're good for black in this position when all you need is a draw. 
Yeah, just so solid. This Petrov defence, it's been the bane of so many uh, 1E4 players' careers. And uh, it's just rock solid, so trustworthy. Even if it goes wrong, you end up in a position like uh, this one. And actually, uh, unless White can attack, nothing to complain about. So Ferruja, he needs to speed up though. One minute on this move is a bit too long. Maybe just centralize the queen. Queen e7, just keep the status quo. And uh, okay, he does play one of the ideas we suggested, pawn to a6. This one will heat up, but it's on Wesley to heat it up at the right moment. Mm. All right, so both players eyeing that flank attack, pushing uh, their own pawns towards uh, enemy lines. And meanwhile, our third Armageddon also well underway with quite a crazy position. We have been talking about Danis Lazovic having a slow strategic style. But take a look at what has come out of the opening. Maxime's king is in the center. White's knight on e4, eyeing those dark square weaknesses. I am loving Dennis's position here if white is able to trade off those dark squared bishop with a move like bishop g5 and land a knight on either d6 or f6 this could be big trouble for maxime and maxime is the one who's got six minutes on the clock i don't need an evaluation bar <laughs> to tell me that this is a great opportunity for dennis lasvik in a must-win position you want chances that's really all you can ask for and not only does he have chances he's got space that pawn on e5 is a thorn in black side it's covering some really important squares and look at that f7 pawn that's a backwards pawn that may be targeted so how to actually convert this advantage into something that is instead of aesthetically pleasing where tactic will land in white's favor that's a different story and he moves his bishop all the way out to h6 i like it bishop g7 maybe the h7 pawn will be picked up dennis this is the style that i've wanted to see from him and he's taking it right to maxime yeah whatever he's done <laughs> just uh, you mentioned switching it up whatever he's done he needs to keep doing this you need to attack the top players that's why he hasn't had that breakthrough yet but finally he gets a dream position and it's horrible for Maxime. This black king is stranded in no man's land. It can never now castle on the king side. That would be illegal. Castling queen side as well, fraught with danger, especially once the A file opens up. So I love this last move. Keeping his options open. Maxime, well, five minutes now. How does he defend? He can plant a knight on a nice square, but one good piece is not enough. Rook to g8. Wow. Just stopping bishop to g7. And Dennis immediately just drops back. Big threat on the board. And uh, knight jumping into d6 on the cards as well. This looks almost terminal now for Black. Deeply unpleasant. As you're saying, numerous threats with every single turn played. I don't even care if the evaluation bar is going down slightly. What is Maxime's plan? I don't see an easy one. Taking the knight on e4, that looks terrible. The bishop will replace the knight, attack the rook in the corner. That is probably just losing on the spot. So what Maxime can accomplish here is unclear. He's only on move 20. He's about to get five minutes left. He pushes his h-pawn, but knight d6 check, as you mentioned, David, that looks very appealing. You don't need to do it but you get the bishop pair and you start opening up more lines. Yeah, you also can open up uh, on the queen side at will. You can maybe repurpose this white queen first and move like queen to g3. Save this one for later, no rush. It's not running away anytime soon. Keep the tension maybe would be my advice because you do have the added time on the clock and you have an attack. You force your opponent to kind of suffer, defend, defend, defend and only pounce later. Um, Dennis, he's spoiled for choice and dream start to this game for him. I like what you just said, though. Instead of just going to quickly, maybe rook f1 to b1, just continue to apply pressure on that black queen side. There's no rush over there. Black doesn't want to take on a4 anyway, so rook f1 to b1 instead of knight d6 check. I like your idea, David. I think actually that will be a better choice. The question, will Danis Lazovic be able to keep the tension? Undoubtedly, he knows that he's uh, managed to get big advantage out of the opening. But we know just how resistant and resourceful Maxime can be, how tricky he can be. Danis instead goes for a more direct approach. He gets that bishop pair and Maxime blitzes out his moves, putting pressure on that g2 pawn, tying down white's queen to defend it. But it looks like Danis had calculated his way forward. The bishop lands on e5, black's king not feeling safe, but you might be forced to put it on the queen side. Yeah, still very good, but I'm slightly afraid Lazovic is playing positionally in a position that kind of de demands dynamism at some point. That being said, white does have a dream position. Look at the clock as well. Maxime is not comfortable at all. We're used to seeing Maxime blitz, even in uh, kind of the most dubious of positions. But here Maxime is in the tank. That clock is ticking ever further down and still glorious for white. That bishop controls everything on e5. You see a move at a time for black. You castle queen side, good for you. That 
F1 rook does slide over to B1. That side of the board will open up sooner rather than later. And G5 played. Look at that desperation from Magnus. But the evaluation bar went all the way up. Do not take that pot on H5. Queen takes G2 would be checkmate. So that's what Maxime is relying on right now, is that there are threats on the diagonal. And look at how simply Dennis Lazvik plays. F3, Bishop E4 next. H5 is truly hanging. This might just be over in the youngster's favor. Yeah, I think Maxime was banking on the fact he could play pawn to g4, but now white can just slide forward, remind black that there's a checkmate threat in this side of the board as well. And this would simply be terminal. Look at this black king, stranded and uh, soon to be mated. This one is almost over. He just needs a few more accurate moves. h4 aims to trap this white queen, but we said it, bishop to e4 just looks so strong right now. And he does play it. This is looking <laughs> just fantastic for the youngster. He might get his first match win of the finals. And what a win it would be against Maxime Vasha Legrave. Can Denis Lazovic finish off this job? He's so close. The queen moves back. Now, big questions. Do you trade off the bishop? Do you go for black stroke? Because bishop 8-7, you don't have so many squares yourself. First, Denis decides to liquidate the queen side. Uh, he wants to trade off the rooks. There are a lot of pleasant choices already upon up. Wow, this is going to be a huge breakthrough in his career, in the tournament for Denis Lazovic. This will fill him with confidence. This is... I mean, look at the control, the calmness. He's done the hard work. He realizes he doesn't even need to do much anymore. He's won a pawn, one material. He's just sneaking in now with the white queen, blocking black's counterplay. Black is stranded. Black is helpless. And Maxime didn't take the pawn back because he wanted to keep files closed. He thinks that if the second rook would appear on the queen side for white, that would have been disastrous. But this is no better. We see Dennis Lazvik pouncing, first establishing his bishop in the center, then taking a pawn, then slithering his queen forward up to g4. Maybe it goes to h5 and further into black's camp. But Maxime, he is trying desperately to close down the queen side, to close down that front so his king maybe can escape. But even if the king escapes, he's positionally in huge danger. And Black has to watch out of that uh, bishop from e4 moving to h7. And it has happened. Bishop oh. h7, is he about to win big material now? The rook, it's got no squares. You go to f8, the other bishop can jump on to uh, g7. g5 pawn is hanging. And Maxine gives up more pieces. Oof, this is just too much material. And uh, now white is up the exchange and a pawn. And look at the white d6 pawn. Just beautifully entrenched in Black's position. I don't see any counterplay. The white queen isn't trapped. She has squares. The only good thing for Maxime Vashelagrav is the black king for now is safe. The black knight is the glue holding everything oh, together. And what this a is... move. D5. Oh, so good. He just gave his pawn away. That square is covered by three different black pieces. And he says, take me with any of your pieces. The queen, it can slide in D4 all of a sudden, and it's going for checkmate. If the knight moves, A4 drops. More of an attack. So that was a wonderful decision. You see the eval bar approved of it. D5, that was sick. So classy. Those invisible moves, as we call them, on squares that are protected so many times by enemy pieces. They break the enemy's co coordination. They open up lines. And bishop to d4 back, lining up with the white queen, would have been a terminal threat there. OK, Maxime, he's fending things off move by move. But long term, he's busted. He's down material. And the black king is a target. He simply slides back. And uh, sooner or later, that white bishop will drop back, kick away the black knight, and everything will fall apart. And that's all you need to do. The knight on b6 holds black's position just for now. And Dennis Lazovic finding the right squares for his pieces. He needs to put pressure on that knight. Bishop d4 will be the final touch to this. Dennis has to be feeling confident. Look at that clock. He's kept it under control on the clock as well. And this in no way is against uh, Maxime, but this will be a phenomenal, phenomenal win for Danis Lazovic. You have to feel happy for him if he gets the job done here. And Maxime now in time trouble. His king is being hunted. He's down material. And as you said, it's nothing against Maxime. We're all friends with him. He's a 2021 World Blitz champion. So for Dennis to just bring it to him, I think it will give him some serious confidence boost because instead of playing a quieter positional style, which we know he loves, he just said, let's go. And he went for an aggressive attacking game. And right now he's completely winning. But will he be able to convert yeah. this. I'm sure every, a lot of the chat is perhaps rooting for Dennis right now, but we know how tricky Maxime can be. We've seen him trick his opponents with even in positions which look even more hopeless than this one. So it's really not over. That's the thing about these top players. It's so hard to beat them even in positions that you're completely winning. And finally that bishop does arrive on d4. Bishop takes knight is the big threat. Dennis is up in exchange. What does he need to watch out for in these positions? Well, uh, it's hard to imagine too much going wrong for white, but now the d6 pawn has dropped. Watch out, your rook on a3 is hanging. 
Uh, Dennis blocks that threat. I guess he has, just, has to just cash in at the right time. You just want to make sure you don't kind of transition too early into an endgame where Black keeps the A4 pawn alive, for example. Black keeps the D5 bishop on an outpost because there might be no way through later. So don't trade off everything. Don't take that Black Knight yet. That endgame might be holdable for Black. Uh, so you just need to keep calm. You need to keep patient. And okay, he's building rook to B4. I was wondering if the knight can drop back to D7 here because if the bishop slides back to D4, E5... That almost traps the bishop, so he goes up instead of back. He saw this all. That was really brilliant by Dennis there, because now a4 is falling. The bishop on e7, you can go take that for black. As long as the rooks crash through the a-file, white will be winning. And because this has been so much action, we've just forgotten about some of the other Armageddon. Already one has been decided as Wesley So takes the win against Ali Reza Feruja. We've got our eye out on the Hikaru Magnus match. We will go to that. But for now, let's stick to this as it's about to reach its uh, final critical moments. Yeah, H3 is a randomizer. It's a desperate attempt, but he's just collapsing now on the queenside. Maxim Vashilagrov, big threat of rook to a7 check there. So that was blocked, but Black's knight is not going to hold this one together for long. No, it's not. Take a pawn G2, leave it there. That's an umbrella pawn. Bring that bishop back to C5. Kick the knight out of there. It feels like white is just doming this game. He doesn't even go for the knight. He just takes pawns. Why not? There is no attack for black. And that bishop will come on D4 with the same idea that you were pointing out, but he's picked up a key pawn along the way. Yeah, and the Black Knight desperately trying to defend squares now. Still no checks. Black's King is miraculously still surviving. You still need to land the killer blow. But look at the clock as well. We're at move 43. Maxime only has one minute left. You can even play for time right now. Okay, Queen H7, there is a hint of counterplay coming down to B1. Watch out for the White King. But it's just one check. It's just a ghost right now. Protect it, though. Cover it. And Maxime... Chances of counterplay should slip away. And you don't win the World Blitz Championship by accident. Maxime has done just that. And Queen H7 is one of those moves that you scare your opponent. But this isn't Blitz for both sides. Maxime is playing Bullet. And right now, Dennis is the one with five plus minutes on his clock. So Queen B1 check. Is it actually a threat? I would just avoid it altogether. But I think it is only a single check down there. And the king can pick up the G2 pawn. There is no checkmating attack. Yeah, just when in doubt, though, protect, guard, kill the counterplay. White's rook could, at the very least, come back to the first rank, back to A1, just stop any checks. No checks ever there, and uh, you can slowly but surely go about your business. Uh, Dennis, he's doing the right thing. He's so professional at such a young age. Slowing down, he's almost five minutes still, and uh, he just has to battle his own nerves. That's the only thing that can stop him now. Yeah, maturity there by Adonis Lazovic, as in this critical moment, he knows he's got it in his hand, but he has to wrap it up as quickly as he can without giving any chance to Maxime Vashir Legrave. For MVL, you give him one opportunity, and you know that it will be uh, it will be back to being a level game, but it looks like he's calculated his way through. He grabs a pawn, loses two pawns, but he keeps majority of his advantage. But I think Maxime should be pleased with this. I was surprised by that decision from Dennis to take a pawn uh, on g5. It looked like it was away from the action, but now black doesn't have very much material remaining. It's a rook and a pawn for just a knight. That knight is stuck defending. The black king is wide open. Uh, this would be a miracle for Maxime to survive. Oh, look at that check. Black is just immobilized now. Black can barely move. White's h-pawn could just motor down the board. That's a potential future queen. Uh, maybe he's looking for checkmate here, Dennis Lazovic. Maybe there's something more. Queen... You Got ideas like queen d6, but I think you have to watch out for threats here because knight into bishop, queen into bishop, and then suddenly bishop takes pawn could be a big tactic. So queen d6 might look like you're threatening checkmate, but you could just walk into some danger territory there. I think you just back that bishop up all the way towards your king, then bring your rook next to your king so there's no <laughs> attack whatsoever, and then that h-pawn goes off the board. So Dennis has everything under control, especially his time management. Uh, he started with a huge lead in the clock. That's the nature of Armageddon. But he's been taking it to Maxime, and he's only slowing down when he knows he needs to be precise. So cynical, Robert. I can tell you've done this before. That would be the most professional way of doing it, just uh, killing all risk in the position. But uh, still under control. Black's king coming out to c6. Surely it's time sooner rather than later to push that white h-pawn. Maybe he wants to uh, repurpose the white queen, which is a bit offside right now. He's still in control. What to do next? Where's the killer blow? All right, uh, well, uh, Dennis Lazowick looks like he knows exactly what he's doing. The rook might jump into a7. The h-pawn might start advancing. We will keep an eye out on this one, but let's uh, check in with uh, the dust settled 
in that and Dennis in driver's seat. Hikaru against uh, Magnus and what expression number was that? Oh, look at the position. Hikaru is losing as we tune in because of the weak dark squares around his king. You see the board on the bottom right hand side of your screen. A rook trade just happened and Hikaru, his dark squares, he doesn't have a Fionketo bishop over there. The bishop for white just going one square forward in the diagonal. I think the black kings is getting checkmated. Yeah, and uh, Hikaru, he did such a good job on the clock, but unfortunately one slip just as we joined the game. And there we go, Robert, uh, you mentioned it, the white bishop landing on e5, and black's knight simply stuck. It cannot cover enough squares. G7 is a potential checkmate square. The corner square on h8, all the dark squares, potential uh, landing spots for the white queen, and it's sneaking in. No way to stop it now. How is he going to try and cling on? He drops the knight all the way back, but there we go, the queen's coming in. Ooh, he's allowing some checks. At the very least, White can grab the a7 pawn because the bishop on e5 dominates the knight. There are no moves without giving a check. And if White can force the queens and the knight off the board, it's a winning king and pawn endgame. But be careful in positions like this because just trading the queens, if those disappeared, maybe Black would have some chances because White doesn't have the easiest path towards a pass pawn. Still some work to do. He doesn't trade off immediately, and my question was going to be if he did take bishop takes knight, were there some threats of perhaps landing into a perpetual? But Magnus doesn't even want to calculate that. That bishop on e5 is dominating the pawn on f3, dominates that knight on f6, uh, and it's uh, Magnus's pieces that are playing all over. He's up a pawn, but at some point you have to start making progress. He sidesteps any checks, and now he's threatening to grab that knight and perhaps go into a winning king pawn endgame. Definitely. He wants to transition. He wants to transform his advantage, uh, make things easier, simplify the equation. Also, that white king can start walking its way forward now on the dark squares. Black is just really stuck. Hikaru needs to avoid this trade, bishop for knight. But if he drops his knight back, still no threats, nothing to do. He's stuck. And look at the clock suddenly. Under 20 seconds, increment is still a distant dream. It only kicks in at move 60. It's physically going to be impossible, surely. 14 seconds left. And here's the big question, and you can see that Magnus is thinking about, can I take this knight on f6? And if the queen takes that, can I then put my queen on e5 with check and trade queens? Now, sometimes you try to liquidate too soon, and it's actually the black king that will march quickly up the board and start stealing some of white's pawn. So it's a big moment here for Magnus Carlsen. I do not think he should take the knight and trade queens. That could easily backfire as black will shut down the protection of that pawn and go and win it. Moral, ethical decision here. Do you just try and play quick moves, flag the opponent, or do you actually slow down and try to find objectively the best moves? Because uh, 12 seconds for Nakamura, physically so tough. And Queen's off the board now. Queen's off the Bishop board. Hikaru needs only a draw somehow, but he needs a big miracle right now to convert this into a draw. At least he can feel safe that he's not getting checkmated anytime soon. But he's going to lose his rook pawn. That's on a dark square. Only one side is a dark square bishop. And here it goes. Magnus breaks that little pawn chain there, steals the rook pawn. So now he'll have a pass pawn on opposite sides of the board. That's going to be too much for the black's pieces to deal with. And four seconds for Hikaru. He has to make a move. Whoa. Magnus is playing surprisingly slowly, but Hikaru... <laughs> she look at that speed! He's trying to pre-move. But he's running out of time. <laughs> There's no mouse. There's no mouse and, okay, Hikaru oh. resigns. Handshakes and Magnus Carlsen does it, takes it in the Armageddon. Wow, some uh, fantastic technique there by Magnus. And big news coming in. Danis Lazovic takes his Armageddon against Maxime Varshelagraf. He gets his first win against the 2021 World Blitz champion. On fire. Dennis the Menace. We all knew what he was capable of. He himself said this was going to be his toughest challenge to date, and he's able to beat Maxime in Armageddon. In fact, all three players with the white pieces won their Armageddon matches. And we saw Fabi when he lost to Nodebeck. He immediately got up, left, did not put the pieces back. Hikaru with uh, the same reaction. Definitely upset. The game was level for the most part of it. And then Magnus doing Magnus things. Strikes. And there we see the world. Number one, after his win, walking off. What a day he's had, and that was the end of it. As Nodebeck took it against Fabiano Caruana in the two rapid games, the rest of the three went into Armageddon. Wesley Sol, Danis Lazovic, the man of the moment with his win against Maxime Varsha-Lagrad. And Magnus against Hikaru ends in Magnus's favor. Brilliant chess. David, what stood out to you? I just want to break down the critical moments of that mammoth clash, that uh, monster clash between Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura. Hikaru was on the back foot slightly just as we joined in. 
but then one move let it all slip and Magnus was able to break through the defences. Here, White has a small advantage, mainly due to the activity of the pieces, the Queen, the Bishop, the Rook, but uh, here, Hikaru helped White out by weakening the dark squares further. Pawn to g6 was simply mistaken. He should have just waited a move such as king to h7, maybe pawn to a5. Just maintaining the tension would have given him great drawing chances. Instead, g6 allowed a transformation of the advantage, a simple rook trade, and this move that Robert mentioned earlier. Bishop to e5, the killer blow, because simply the black king is in too much trouble. The knight has to move. If, for example, it drops back this way, then a check would have been deadly on the back rank, potential checkmates in the air. If black isn't careful, Careful. Instead, it dropped back to e8, but the white queen snuck in anyway, and the threat of this checkmate was deadly. Black was forced to push a pawn forward, but after a couple of checks, white simply pocketed this pawn on a7, and the dominance of this bishop ensured a winning endgame. What a turnaround in that game because it looked very solid for Black and we understand why he pushed his pawn to G6. He realized I don't really have too many options. I need to defend my pawn that sticks out like a sore thumb, but unfortunately he defended a pawn but lost his king. That was an uh, amazing play there with the queen and bishop combining together to finish off the game in what would look like a level, uh, level position, but Magnus doing Magnus things. But I'm just thinking about Dennis Lazarek. I mean, the guy is 17 years old. He is an underdog in this tournament, the lowest rated player. He's got the X on his back. He's the big target. And he's been showing his spark here. You know, he's been holding those draws. Finally, he gets that win in. Uh, and once again, Maxime, of course, you've got to be a fan of Maxime. But I feel like we were all at some point rooting for Dennis to get that win with the position he had out of the opening. Well, Dennis may be a teenager, but he's not kidding around. He's here <laughs> to play, and he just showed a dominant display of chess from start to finish. That was all Dennis Lazarek, and he's proven over the years he's capable of winning in big events. He started in Title Tuesday when he was 15 years old, the FIDE Master. I was like, who is this kid? Then he goes to the World Rapid and Blitz. He becomes a Grand Master. His good showings pretty much everywhere, gaining rating if you can look online and see it but Dennis Lazvik to this point hadn't won a single match now he gets on the scoreboard and I think everyone's looking at it like that's no longer a free point we got to be careful at Dennis yeah and this should be inspirational for everyone at home just uh, when you play these higher rated players first you need to learn how to draw against them how to survive Dennis has done that day one we saw a couple of draws then you need to start taking your chances start learning how to attack them kind of being brave against these high-rated opponents. And we see Dennis growing, learning in front of our eyes, and everyone at home should be doing the same. You will take hits, you will take defeats, but as long as you improve and keep the confidence, which he has done, you will get your results in the end. And he did get his uh, result in the end. What a day of chess it has been. We had mind games. We had dramatic Armageddons. We had some brilliancies. We had turnarounds. We had all of it. And it was so much fun calling uh, the moves and the action here from Oslo. But the action continues in Toronto. While we're signing off, we're sending you over to the playing arena with Danny and James. Guys, what a day of chess. Take it away. What a day of chess. Unbelievable chess. I honestly don't even know where to begin. Wow. I think we have to go back to the marquee matchup. Obviously, Magnus Carlsen gets the job done in right. Armageddon fashion. What right. an incredible game. Yeah. A grinded out Magnus fashion. I mean, uh, it's incredible how he does every end game. Everything goes to an end game. No really crushing atta attacks here. Doesn't care about the opening advantage. Doesn't care about what opening you play. We get to an end game. I do my thing. He does it every single time. It's funny because in the critical moment, Magnus didn't have an advantage, right. and the clocks were almost even up until that fateful G6 by Hikaru. So yeah. your heart goes out nice. to Hikaru there, losing that Armageddon, but he did get one win today. Let's remind everybody real quick what the standings are after the play is done here. The uh, four rounds are in the books. Where does it put everybody after that? We also had another Armageddon victory, of course. I think Dennis Lazovic getting his big win is... Uh, is huge for the standings as we bring them up. If people thought it was a sure thing that the youngster would go home, I guess think again, can't he? Think again. Like Hess said, Robert was like, yeah, you're free point, walking free point, try again. In fact, I'm walking around with my chest out, not because I lift weights. It's because my name is Dennis Lazovic, and I got my first dub today. I'm feeling great. The other person who not only got his first dub today, but got two dubs today, Noterbeck of Dusaturov, up there in third place now. It, what, what a tale of two days. Fabiano Man. Cart won and wins two 
matches in Armageddon fashion. Today he loses both matches. Yeah. I guess I jinxed him. I picked Fabi to win both of his matches. Dang, dang, man. That didn't go very well. Dang, Danny, you're always doing that. Man. I'm all, the commentator's curse is real, but Noterbeck of Dusaturov's chess is real, and he caught up with Kaya just moments ago after his huge day two. I'm here with the man of the moment beating Fabiano Cariano. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. You were high on energy after that first game. How are you feeling right now after winning the match? Yeah, I'm um, I'm relieved. So, you know, uh, it's been a very good match. And uh, yeah, I, I really um, I really played well, I think, in the second game without a mistake. So, yeah, um, looking good for me. What was your plan heading into this match with Fabiano, who's just been so good lately? Yeah, um, but... Today I think uh, he, um, you know, he was n maybe a little bit um, in, not, in not shape, but uh, um, I think uh, it's partly okay because also he played Magnus and um, and after losing to to him, it's maybe he he was a little bit <clears throat> frustrated. So yeah, I, I'm I'm I think after beating Lazovic, I was I, I was very confident and. No, I was, I was really, uh, really in, in good shape. <clears throat> and uh, with three rounds to go, how do you see your chances now to go through from the round robin? Um, it's still looking very tough right now because a lot, there are a lot of players who is on two points. So yeah, we'll do my best and just just looking forward to 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 get to play some interesting games. And you mentioned that confidence you got from winning against Lazovic heading into this match with Fabiano. For us who don't play chess at the, the yeah. level that you do, how important is momentum, confidence when you do play these big guys like Fabiano? Yeah, it's really important because, you know, then everything goes well for you. Um, and uh, yeah, it's but it's also very, very hard to, to, to keep that momentum. You know, it's not a... Not every day you you, you can beat it, uh, Fabiano. So yeah, it's really 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 tough. So uh, the other matches will be going to Armageddon. You are done for the day. What will you do now, the rest of the night, to celebrate this great day? So who's going to be? Who's going to play Armageddon? The other three matches are all going to Armageddon. Yeah. Oh okay. Th th then it's really interesting to watch. Yeah. You'll be enjoying that. Yeah, of course. All right. Well, congratulations on the great day, Norderbeck. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Wow, the man of uh, the moment, you guys. Nordebeck of the Sator. Back to you. Thank you. Bro was so focused on his own dominance, he didn't even <laughs> know the other three matches were going to yeah, Armageddon. Right, you gotta right. love it. There you see, he took down Fabiano Caruana, despite a big age gap there. You look at the accuracy, just fantastic chest day. I mean, really good. In fact, uh, Robert said that it's in a way, this is kryptonite. We've seen yeah. Norderbeck do this before in different yeah. matches, OTB as well. So, you know, Norderbeck is just feeling good after that. I mean, He's good feeling job. good, and you're right. For some reason, yeah. maybe he likes his matchup against it's Fabiano. Fabi. Yeah. Maybe he uh, also didn't like our prediction to take <laughs> Fabi, and he used it as fuel. Who knows? Whatever right. it is, Norderbeck of Dusaturov is right there in the thick of things behind yeah. the only two guys who remain 4-0. Of course, we already talked about Carlson. Mm -hmm. Got it done in Armageddon fashion against Nakamura. But Wesley So. Also, still 4 0. Still 4. I mean, Wesley So is an absolute beast right now. He's walking around, he's feeling good. I'm like, yeah, I'll do the interview. Yeah, oh, talking, doing puzzles. He's having the time of his life. It's like, you know, uh, Wesley Soranto because it, it, Toronto is his place right now. Wesley So loves Toronto. He is 4 0. I can't think of any more ways to rhyme with that. So instead, we're going to throw to Kaya, who caught up with Wesley after his second perfect day. It's a perfect start for Wesley. So another match win. How are you feeling, Wesley? Yeah, very happy. Uh, like the glorified Lord Jesus for all those wins. My goal before the start of the tournament was like to finish in the top six. Like at least mm, not to go home so early. So It's looking good. Yeah, it's looking good so far. Yeah. Uh, things are going well so far. Couldn't have asked for a better start. It's crazy. And how are you feeling about your play in Armageddon as well here? Pretty good, pretty good. Yeah, I think against Maxim, I played really well. And against Alireza, I did. I wasn't familiar at all with the opening. Like, he had a very comfortable position. But uh, he, hesit he hesitated, I believe, with a6 when he could play d5, maybe. Uh, like, he hesitated a little bit. And then 
next thing I knew I had a very good position. Like I knew I had to play G4. If I don't play G4, I'm just gonna lose. And <laughs> he, used, he used so much time. Like I didn't even have to win the position. You're walking around here in the player lounge, uh, Wesley, with just a big smile on your face. You seem relaxed. How important is that? And how big of a factor is that in your perfect score here so far? Yeah, well, I won all my games, yeah, which... So does, does the results come first or does the, you know, the great mood come first? Well, they go both hand in hand. Yeah. Like, uh, becoming the tournament, I was just putting no pressure on myself. If I win, I win. If I if I lose, then it's just you know go home and then prepare for the next one. So it's my it's my mindset. Like I love the game. I know this tournament has a huge, humongous prize money, but I'm not really playing for money. You know, I'm just trying to enjoy, have a good career, and uh, live life. And uh, tomorrow, on day three in the finals, you will face Magnus Carlsen, among others. Uh, <laughs> well, thanks for letting me know. I, I, I didn't know who my pairing was. Like, I was taking it one round at a time. So, thanks for letting me know. Do you prefer not knowing until, like, the same day? Uh, well, for, for speed tournaments, preparation is not that important. So, like, I tend to check the pairings in the morning. What can we expect when you do play Magnus Carlsen tomorrow? Both of you looking extremely good here. Ah, uh, what can I expect? Well, it's it's up to him. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's up to him which Magnus shows up. I hope I hope the best Magnus doesn't show up, but if it does, it will be an uphill battle, obviously. But the best Wesley so will turn up. Like I remember, he beat me so convincingly in San Francisco last year, and he just won the tournament like he had six match wins out of seven something crazy like that so when he's in good form he's uh just crazy crazy strong uh so um yeah we'll see he's an amazing incredible player what what can i do yeah so are you wesley so yeah. congratulations on a great day yes thank you yes good, good luck tomorrow as well wesley so you guys perfect start to the tour finals Well, we saw Wesley So say that he hopes the best Magnus Carlsen doesn't show up tomorrow because the result is in Magnus's hands. And there you know what the round five pairings are. Wesley So will be taking on Magnus Carlsen first thing in the morning. And that is the matchup of two players who've been perfect so far. Of course, we have a ton of other matchups to talk about, Lazovic, Caruana, and the many others. But right now we have Magnus at the desk. So I'm just going to jump right in, Magnus. Wesley said that the result tomorrow depends on which Magnus Carlsen shows up. <laughs> if the best Magnus shows up, he says you win. But what do you think about that? Um, well, I usually, I usually do, but uh, um, I, I don't know. He, he, he's generally playing quite, quite well here, yeah. but um, no, generally I agree. Like, if I play at my best, I, I usually, usually do pretty well. So I, I, I hope for this. <laughs> you go to agree with him. What, what do you think? Talk a little more about Wesley's play here. He seems to like Toronto. He's obviously had a couple of Armageddon matches to get there. But your thoughts just on, on how difficult he'll be to beat tomorrow? Um, he hasn't been like extremely solid recently in, in Rapid. But um, I don't think he's played like too differently from, from what he has recently here. Um, I mean, he's a very, very strong player, but uh, I, I wouldn't say he's done anything too too special. Uh, but obviously, his score, is, his score is great. And if he plays the way that he used to play back in 2020, 2021 online, then he's, he's very tough to, to beat for sure. Yeah. Physical fitness is, of course, very important. This is something you do and follow as well. Are you doing any type of exercise while you're here in Toronto? Not so far. Not so far? <laughs> we got to take yeah, it to the probably, gym. Yeah, probably should. But I mean, at yeah. least I had a couple of weeks of relaxation before yeah. I got here. So I still, I don't feel particularly energetic, but I feel fairly calm. And I think that's that's uh, helped me in uh, some critical moments. Very nice. Shifting away from Soap to the match you just had with Hikaru, obviously that was huge for all the fans. You did get it done in Armageddon. But take us into the final moments of that game. You were getting under time pressure. You guys were about dead even on the clock, even with him having drawing chances right before Hikaru played G6. So were you nervous at that moment? What were your, what were your feelings at that point in the game? 
I wouldn't say I was nervous, uh, but I, I wasn't 100% confident either. Um, at that point, um, well, I did have some structural edge, and I do know that he's very strong when he gets his knights going, but <laughs> it felt to me that um, it was not so easy and that he would have to jettison a pawn to get any sort of activity. And clearly he just blundered yeah. there, um, yeah. which was good for me. But to be honest, like he'd been under a pressure for a long time there. So I'm, I'm not shocked that he, uh, that he, he blundered. You beat Noterbeck with white mm -hmm. in Armageddon, and you wanted that you wanted that color, and then you bid 15 minutes against Takaro. I know you already gave some thoughts on it with Kaya, but take us back into that. What is the is, is it really based on the opponent? Because we're all talking about right. the meta. It's fascinating to understand right. that sometimes you want black, sometimes you want white. Is it based on the style, the opponent? Take us in, into that a little bit. Yeah, I, I think you should have sort of a balanced strategy while bidding for Armageddon, but. Uh, that was like one of the extremes of, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. um, I thought also I thought psychologically it would be um, it would be fun like if he if he's uh, thought yeah. long and hard about his <laughs> bid and right. he about thinks 50. he got it just on the second and then I just bid. <laughs> um, and I was yeah I, I was happy to play play white. Um, I mean considering the the fact that he bid that his bid was so high, yep. uh, I probably gave away a little bit of equity there, uh, but still I didn't feel, uh, didn't feel too bad going into, uh, going into the Armageddon. Because even though I hadn't defeated did him in Armageddon as white before, and I, I also think like he hadn't defeated me either, so I think mm. black has won every time. Mm. I've won loads of games against him on demand as, as white, so I, right. I knew that I could do that. So I was just trying to play as normally as um, as possible. And, uh, you know, with his Mimi opening, then right. uh, it's not bad, but it just means that we get a game. Right. Nice. Uh, with strategy, you mentioned staying calm. So is there any strategy or preparation that keeps you, of course, in these high-level matches every day? Of course, they're coming at you. They're trying to beat you. Strategy and preparation on staying calm. Um, no, I haven't done anything. Not nothing too much. Just I just, the, the, the I just feel, feel relatively calm. Yeah, that's nice. Your mind, your mindset just, is strong. So you play Wesley. Nice. So tomorrow, uh, you played Lazovic. I think after. No, you've already played Lazovic. I've already played Lazovic. So time, I've yeah. got the, uh, I've got so, Wesley and the Frenchman. Wesley okay. and the Frenchman. Your thoughts on. You're just focused on Wesley for now, or do you do prep for both players the night before? I'm really not focused on anybody right yeah. now. I'm happy with the score the way it is, and then I'll start thinking about the, the matches um, tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Well, appreciate you joining us, and uh, congrats again on a... I don't think we're quite done. Okay, what do you got? Because, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I get here early sometimes okay. is mm. that I really like... Oh, you like hearing the predictions. I like hearing the predictions. Okay. okay. And you guys had some interesting ones today. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, appreciate that. Thank I you. did take Thank Fabi you. against you. Of um, yeah. but, I, but I took you against... And you've bet against me twice, right? Yeah, it's, just con <laughs> it's content. <laughs> Thank you. you know, my, no. It's content. Well, no, what yeah, are you gonna I, mean? I, I, but, I mean, I you also have to, like... It's, I understand. You know understand. what I mean? Right. It's definitely yeah. hard to, to pick you every time. I, I you don't, know, I don't take time. offense, but I notice it. Yeah, That's yeah, what yeah, I'm saying. Okay, well, you know, we might as well dive into that. I'm glad you brought it up, because we've already chatted about it. Obviously, there was the interaction with Ali Reza. He didn't... Yeah, he didn't like the prediction. I think that... I think most of the players are okay with it. I think we will continue to do it, but maybe try to get it done earlier so it doesn't feel like it's right before the game. What do you right. think? I, if it's up to me, do it as the players are hitting. I think that's <laughs> you like it. You like concept. that. <laughs> okay, well, maybe that's a good lesson in the, in the, the mental And remember, thing. like, every time you bet against me, I get, like... Yeah. Couple of percent better. Well, maybe, Ooh, maybe that was secretly see, why we were doing you know it. But anyway, man. No, I appreciate that. It yeah, is. No, well, it's good. interesting because this is different than other sports. Football players don't hear the pundits saying things right before the game, right? right. So, you have this mental toughness. Do you think that? What would be your message on that? Because you want us to keep doing the predictions. You like it. Obviously, one player didn't like it today. What What are your thoughts on on the difference in your mindset there? I think it's very easy. Like if it's if it's going well, then yeah. Then you just enjoy it. If you're, right. if it's not going so so well, then I can see why it would be annoying. Right, hundred yeah. yeah. percent. Yeah, yeah. Definitely.
Well, appreciate appreciate that. I'll Gotta think long and hard about yeah, whether you know, I'm going to predict you or Wesley to keep tomorrow. The, pick the best I'm not trying to take you know. three steps ahead in the meta, whether I'm picking Magnus or Wesley I'm tomorrow. Magnus, 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 <laughs> Magnus, Magnus, Magnus. <laughs> well, thanks, man. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. your time. All right, buddy. And we'll, we'll let you balance. That's Magnus Carlson. Loving the candid thoughts there. This has been quite the day from Toronto. Can we just say that? 100%. Ups and downs all day. Everywhere. We've, we've had we've had amazing fashion by Gucci Reza. Ali Ali didn't take too kindly to some predictions. Fresh. We yeah. had some real-time discussion about yeah. the content with Magnus with Carlson. Magnus himself. The GOAT, the GOAT bringing his thoughts about it. And obviously you got a huge match of tomorrow between Wesley So and Magnus, and Magnus Carlson. That's going to be amazing. Can't wait for it. Two players undefeated. We will be back tomorrow for everyone. Thank you to the crew in Oslo. The crew here in Toronto will see you for the championships, Champions Chess Tour in Toronto tomorrow. The queen goes all the way back to the corner. Blunder from Ferruja. This will end in checkmate. Hikaru Nakamura relieved after his first win. Can go, oh, oh, oh queen b one instead. That is stunning. Magnus Carlson, he plays. He wins. Oh my goodness! Oh, that would have blundered and lost. Blocking black counterplay. Black is stranded. Black is helpless. Oh, what misses. a move! Magnus Carlson does it. Takes it in the Armageddon.